we have the um, Southeast Quadrant Plan. We have a briefing. And then we'll continue with the um, comp plan um, briefings and uh, follow up um, a, our work agenda. So we have PSD project follow up. And then we have housing displacement. Uh, then we'll have a residential density discussion and then we'll wrap up hopefully by five o'clock. Items of interest from commissioners? Yeah, we'll just, Teresa. Oh, there's a tiny house conference this weekend in Portland. And so on Friday, they're gonna do a little open house that you can kind of walk through some of them and some stuff. So I know that um, we had some interest in tiny houses and it'd be kind of fun. So it just Google tiny house conference and it'll show up. Oh, okay, great. Karen. Uh, yes, and speaking of tiny houses, uh, I think that the Park Row School District Charter School for Architecture, Construction, and Engineering built two of them. Um, and I think that um, we'll be on display, so I'm pretty excited. Um, Chair Baugh, I just wanted to say uh, Tuesday afternoons I chair the ACE Charter School Board, mm -hmm. and so I'll need to leave about 345. I just wanted to say that. Okay. And um, you have an item on here about upzoning in Park Rose, and I'm aware of that upzoning. Um, yeah. Didn't know if, anyway, probably no way to sneak in a bit of that before I leave, but yeah. um, I, I'm just going to end up missing it. But okay. Well, we'll anyway, check and see, see if what we happens. Can Thank you. Maybe switch that around with the housing displacement. Other items? Um, I would just like to say thank you for everybody. Um, we recently had an item um, come before us in terms of the PDC changes with their uh, TIF zones. And um, we, as a commission, um, talked about housing. And when it came before us, there was zero housing discussion. And when it left, there was somewhere in the neighborhood of about $42 million of housing. Um, that went to um, city council. And uh, two, two, about two weeks ago, I was there uh, when they voted on it. And um, actually, Commissioner Fish was able to get a friendly amendment um, to the uh, motion before them that um, up that 42 to 47 million put two parcels in play immediately. And um, so a council really did hear us on that. And um, I received uh, a lot of kind of pats on the back and thank yous. And we got a tip of the hat from Amanda Fritt, Fritz um, at council saying thank you from the commission. We enabled and really brought out of uh, the woodwork, I think the old guard, um, in terms of, uh, as they called themselves, the old housing advocates, many of the old bureau directors and, and budget directors came to testify um, in previous meetings. And at that meeting again, at that hearing again, um, testified. And some of the new people that are in housing, uh, I believe we enabled their voice to be heard by council to hear um, the need for affordable housing in the South Waterfront specifically and, and, and in Portland. And uh, council listened and we received, I, I received a lot of thanks and I wanna pass on that thanks to you because without your voice and without us putting out that principle of uh, the need for affordable housing, um, I doubt that would have been uh, heard at council. And so thank you. I have a, I'd like to add something to that. Just, just to point out uh, what came out in the hearing, in fact, Julian Detweiler brought this up, that in fact, just as we all know, what that's gonna result in is less funding for parks. And there's a big trade-off there, and I just think people need to be clear about that. I mean, I supported the increased housing funding, but uh, there's a limited amount of money out there, and I. We need to do whatever we can to have it not be a zero sum game. The park advocates also supported the 30% set aside as I noted um, at that hearing. So 
not an insignificant issue. And, but I, I will say it also opened that discussion for parks to get more funding and, and I think we, we, um, we still need to advocate for parks funding. At the end of the day, the people that are getting less funding is really the infrastructure folks and they're, they're fighting back, but I think we, Mike, you're right. We, it can't be one or the other. And I made that point to council that it had to be both housing and parks. And um, I think we still got more work to do on the park side. And there's an FTC there as well. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you. Joe? Yes, um, so for the uh, director's report today, um, there's a number of items at City Council uh, next or coming up um, on Wednesday, this Wednesday at 3.30, time certain, uh, there'll be a report on the building energy performance um, uh, uh, initiative that the Bureau is proposing. Um, on Wednesday, April 22nd at 9.30 a.m., uh, we're presenting uh, the sustainable city government principles and green building policy at City Council. Uh, and uh, tentatively, I think, on April 30th at 2 p.m. Uh, is the next of the um, Terminal 6 Pembina meetings at City Council. I have April 30th, Chris, at 2 p.m. time certain, and both have the question mark by them, but I think that's the tentative placeholder. Is that okay? Correct. There's, it's it's uh, the notes that were given me here make it look tentative, but it's the placeholder for now. Um, and then second, um, uh, what, uh, we noted that we're still working on getting the PSC members uh, to have city email addresses while you're on the commission uh, so that you use those for any uh, commission or PSC related mem uh, messages. Um, that we hope to have those up in the next few weeks, but I wanted to invite uh, Catherine Beaumont from the City Attorney's Office up here for a brief reminder uh, to PSC members of the purpose of this whole change. I'll keep this brief. Um, as most of you know, or should know, um, the Commission is a public body, and your communications with each other, with members of uh, BPS staff or other city staff or members of the public that pertain to your work as a PSC member are public records. And under the public records law, um, we, we are required to retain them. And if someone requests copies of those records to produce them. Um, what is covered by the public records law are communications in any form, including a writing and writing is very broadly defined to include electronic communications, email messages, text messages, tweets, um, voicemail messages. Uh, recognizing that in responding to a public records request, we don't want to have to search or have you search your personal computers for every piece of email or other communication you've had regarding PSC business. That's that's the reason for the move to setting up city emails for you. In the interim, one way to avoid having to retain those records on your computers is if when you're communicating with staff or communicating with each other about PSC business, make sure you copy Julie. Um, it will then become uh, BPS's job. They'll have a copy here. It will be their job to retain them and to produce them in response to a public records request. So I just, um, I believe each of you, you were all sent within the last few weeks sort of a, a reminder or a cheat sheet on public records and public meetings. If you didn't receive a copy or if you don't know where it is, let Julie know and we can have another copy sent to you. But I just wanted to offer this reminder on public records and um, your responsibility to retain those records and what is considered to be a record for purposes of the public records law. Chris. So I think I heard you say voicemail. Yes. A list of things that are records. So um, I don't believe that my phone provider has an infinite retention of voicemail, although it seems to go back a ways. Um, does the city have some mechanism for retaining voicemails? And would you care to issue me a city-owned cell phone? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I, 
I, the, the, pub, the Attorney General's Public Records Manual says two things. On the one hand, it says that voicemail messages are public records. On the other hand, it says public bodies are under no, no duty to retain voicemail messages. So those that are retained or those that involve Julie are public records. If they, have, if they are gone, they are gone. Um, and again, obviously, you are free to communicate with each other about whatever you want. Um, it is simply those communications that pertain to PSC business that are public records. So, any any other questions? Yes. Question. yes. Um, <clears throat> going forward, it's very easy to do the routine of, of copying Julie, but um, I have hundreds and hundreds of past communications on my computer. Um, should I just retain those, or should they be downloaded and transferred to the city, or? Um, you can forward them to Julie. You can download them and send them to Julie as a batch. You can hang on to them. Um, it's your your choice, whatever uh, works best for you. It's probably easiest if they get into Julie's hands because then you are free to delete them and Julie has them. And they will be available for production if requested. I don't see Julie smiling. <laughs> <laughs> and she will become the public records queen. Any other questions? Well, we'll find out. I'm just curious how, our, how these email sites are going to work. We're going to be assigned. Thank you. Thank you. Is that it? Um, next, we have the Central City 2035 Southeast Quadrant Plan. Troy? Don, did you want to make some? Yeah, I'm not going to make a big speech. <laughs> there, now I can give, make a small speech. Um, just a few comments since this is the briefing. We've uh, had 13 advisory committee meetings. 14. Uh, so we've been at this a while. We have a, we've had an excellent advisory committee, which I was really happy to chair. And uh, Troy took, and his team took us through a very, very good process to create a plan that uh, uh, I think has a lot of consensus among our committee members. We had our last uh, uh, meeting last week, uh, and so I think this is ready to move forward. Uh, you know, it was a great process. I think we've come up with a well, really well-balanced plan. Uh, we had a very diverse interests at the beginning of the process, and those diverse interests uh, mm -hmm. came together on almost all the items. So I feel real good about the process, and congratulations to, to uh, Troy and his hard-working team. So, Troy? Nope, no, it's not. All right. Um, so Troy Doss, senior planner. Um, I want to point out the team because I always get my name thrown out there and they don't. So Rachel Hoy and Derek Dolphin are back here somewhere. Thank you. And I believe Laura Lillard has just stepped up as well. So that's a bulk of our team. Also, Tyler Bump's been on the team uh, for um, free economic development. Um, we've also had assistance uh, in team members from PBOT, uh, most notably Grant Moorhead, and then Geraldine Moyle from PDC. We've worked with other bureaus as well, but that's been the core team for the last two years. So um, let's jump ahead. I think we've seen this one over and over again, so I probably don't need to spend too much time on it, but this is the last of the three uh, major quadrant plans leading up to the development of Central City 2035. So um, the um, the central east side is the focus of this. This is one. This is a one district quadrant plan. So, central east side is a big district. It's bigger than any other district in the central city. It's approximately 600 acres, um, majority of which is zoned for employment or industrial uses. However, there is a good chunk of uh, EX mixed use zoning that occurs in the district that is pretty underutilized as all things come, as go. So we'll come back and talk about that a little bit later in the plan. But the majority of the district really is either zoned for mixed use or it's zoned for industrial. There's not a lot of middle ground there. Um, there's a, just a small percentage of five acres of residential pure zoning that occurs and it's really down near Lads Edition, right on the border of Lads Edition. Excuse me, Troy, can you bring your mic in yeah. just a little bit more? <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. 
So um, one thing we'll point out, this district is, uh, being primarily an employment district, it is pretty successful at that. It has almost uh, 18,000 jobs today, and it's been growing uh, considerably over the last decade, uh, growing approximately 7% during the recession. So uh, why are we focusing on this plan as, as well as the other quadrants? Well, this one is probably in greater need than a lot of them in that uh, since the adoption of the 1988 plan, this district really has largely been left alone. Um, there's been a lot of uh, urban renewal studies that have looked at here. There's been transportation plans. Um, but really, in terms of land use, the only thing that's really gone forward here is the employment opportunity subarea that was adopted by the commission and city council back in 2007. So for the most part, really the policy framework and the zoning tools that implement it were basically created in 88. Um, as Don mentioned, uh, we've had a pretty robust uh, public involvement process. This actually was two plans because we started off with the inner southeast station area concept plan, which looked at the, the four first stations on the Portland-Milwaukee line. So looking at OMSI, Clinton, Rhine, and Holgate. So OMSI, Ryan, I'm uh, sorry, OMSI, Clinton, Ryan, and Holgate are the four stations there. And that was, that effort was funded as well as parts of this effort have been funded by a CET grant looking at uh, employment transit oriented development from Metro. Um, that's really been the focus of these station areas, I should mention. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, but it's really trying to figure out is there a new kind of model that you can apply to, to do station area development that activate it? And this is a, the idea of doing an employment as opposed to just uh, mixed use residential. So the project goals on this were pre pretty much uh, these four. Um, what we were really looking, trying to do is figure out how to expand employment opportunities. Um, as I mentioned, there's 18,000 jobs in the district. We have projections of about another 9,000 through 2035. Um, but the zoning we have in place is not gonna get us there. Uh, the mixed use corridors will help out, but the IG1 zone, which is the predominant zone through the district, is just not capable um, as a purely a base zone to get us to the job densities that we're trying to uh, achieve. Um, the other thing we're trying to do is as the district grows and expands, uh, we want to make sure that we are protecting the existing industrial businesses that are there and trying to make sure that um, what would, could be viewed as incompatible uses, residential, um, are buffered or at least developed when they're adjacent to industrial uses in a way that maybe um, it has less of an impact on the industrial uh, integrity of those uses. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute too. And then uh, station area development, uh, we have a you know, $1.4 billion light rail project going in there. Um, there's high expectation these station areas will be safe, attractive, vibrant, uh, a place where we'll see some new opportunities for employment and visitor attractions. Um, so we wanna make sure we, we could capitalize on that. And then lastly, we just kind of came to realize that there's really only about three places on the east side of the Willamette that you can get down to the river pretty easily. And this is one of them. And so uh, we wanna make sure that we can really make the most of that and try to create an even um, more attractive waterfront destination that is already kind of occurring there. I think OMSI's done a good job with that, but there's a lot of other opportunities really from OMSI down to Ross Island Sand and Gravel. The big idea is that we started fleshing this plan out uh, last year. We're again expanding opportunities uh, for employment, looking at the station areas, um, really maximizing the potential in these mixed use corridors. There is a uh, probably a, upwards of 5,000 housing units that could be developed as well as a number of jobs that could be created in the existing mixed use zoning that's in the district. As I mentioned, it's very underutilized. It's been in place for 25 years, really hasn't been used that much. Um, and then um, looking at the waterfront as a destination and then uh, trying to figure out how to work with the multimodal transportation network that's there. I'll talk more about this in a bit, but um, this is a freight district, but it also has um, the benefit of and, and probably problem of being adjacent to inner southeast neighborhoods that have a 23% bike commute mode split. So you have a lot of conflicts between modes. We want to figure out if there's a way to rationalize some of that through this process. Um, before we jump into what we're doing, it's probably good to kind of talk about where we've been. This is a district that has been an industrial district since it was founded. It predates the city of Portland and East Portland as an industrial area. Um, and early in its tenure, it was developed as, uh, at least it was plotted the same way as the west side of the city. So it has uh, the ubiquitous 200 by 200 block structure that we've known so well for this side of the river. Uh, but it really dominates that side as well. Uh, really, there's only a few parcels. Uh, you get down to the southern area where you have very large parcels 
Uh, those are areas that at one time had either large shipping or uh, logging, mill operations. So um, the pattern wasn't extended there. But um, it's not how you would typically lay out a freight dependent district in, in modern times, but at the time it worked fine. Um, the early industries, again, you had a lot of logging, you had um, uh, produce was a big, and, and warehouse and distribution was a big uh, factor over there. Um, part of that was access to the river, access to rail. Um, at the time, if you were shipping products over land, uh, you would have used train, um, though if you had a waterfront destination, you certainly would be using the waterfront. This, is, this lower image here is actually one of the larger mill operations that's uh, approximately where OMSI is today. Um, but if you were moving product on land locally, you would have moved it by horse and carriage. Um, part of the reason for that was truck use in terms of freight really didn't come along until after World War I. This district really started as an industrial district somewhere around 1860. So um, you had a long period of time where horse and buggy worked just fine for moving freight. And then when the post-war era happened, you really were starting off with smaller trucks. So um, you know the big uh, semi-trucks and the really super-sized uh, trucks you see today yeah, or they were a long way from coming along. Um, what we find is in 1960, uh, we start to really kind of abandon how we're moving freight. So you see the rail yard here and some of the old docks. Um, this is where I-5 is today. So for those of you who know the East Bank uh, Commerce Center, or East Bank Exchange, that's the East Bank Exchange uh, as it existed back at the time, it was really fronting a rail yard. All of this is torn up, removed, <coughs> Now rail bypasses this district. Um, it, you know, it goes through it, but it doesn't really stop and serve businesses here directly. And for that matter, you're not really loading ships anymore. What you're really doing is putting everything on truck. So at this point, uh, we see some of the larger operations, maybe like Franz Bakery, who's been there really since the 1900s, shift from horse and buggy over to, uh, to trucks in the you know, post-World War I era. Then they really kind of start maximizing their loads or in this era where they have better connection to highways and freeways. But we also see prod, uh, uses like Pacific Coast fruit come in. So if you were standing on what is I believe Second Avenue to, or Third Avenue today, what you'd find is right here is where Pacific Coast Fruit's located. So it's a very large, uh, multi-acre building that's basically moving produce. Um, it was attracted to the district in part because of the easy access to the freeway system. Um, here's an example of some of those uses. Now today we don't find that these types of uses are locating in districts like this. They're not gonna locate in a 200 by 200 grid pattern because it's really hard to move a truck through that area. Um, they don't wanna have to compete with loading in the right of way. They wanna be able to have a right of way that um, you know, is easier to move trucks through. They also wanna be closer to um, more um, trans-regional port facilities. So um, notwithstanding the current problems facing the Port of Portland, the, the fact is, is the marine terminals, the access they have to, uh, to rail, and the access they have to PDX in terms of being able to move uh, air, air freight is substantial. So that's where these industries are gonna locate today. Um, and they largely are, one, they are not locating in as new development in the Central East Side, but some of the existing operations are also leaving for some of these um, um, more efficient locations. Uh, we have the advantage, though, of not seeing abandonment of the area as an industrial district in their place. Some of these multi-story structures that have been serving industry for almost 100 years are now starting to, and maybe one industrial use, I should note. Now they're starting to serve multiple industrial uses. So you'll find uh, a space, maybe Simple Bikes is, is listed up here. They use a space that's about 1,500 square feet. Um, ruckus composites, they grew from a small basement, uh, windowless basement room in the um, uh, rancher and gardeners building to a, uh, a larger uh, facility. Um, you have um, distilleries coming in, breweries coming in, but we also have these newer industries that are also attracted to the area. So viewpoint construction software, they manage and develop software for the construction industry. Many of their clients are located in the central east side. Um, and then you have other companies that are basically doing everything but the manufacturing. They're doing prototype design. Um, they're doing some of their marketing, some of their uh, sales. Um, and it's all happening with Bog Shoes is one of those examples. So um, the, the, one of the things that's interesting to note have too is that whereas maybe a manufacturing use would have occupied a much larger single story, uh, flexible industrial space, we're finding that increasingly some of these businesses are occupying a much smaller space. 
and they're doing a lot of different functions that may have been done off offsite. So um, when we were touring the building where Bog Shoes is in, for instance, um, Leatherman had an operation there. And they were basically doing research and development, uh, prototyping, um, but they were also doing a lot of work in terms of the manufacturing they were doing on 3D printers. So there was actually more space being dedicated to the design of the, of the uh, products they were making as opposed to the production, because it was actually being able to be produced on a much smaller area. So trying to keep up with this, in 2006, 2007, there was the adoption of the Employment Opportunity Sub-Area. And what this did is it looked at an area uh, west of 3rd Avenue, extending down to Water Avenue. And in this area, we said there's a lot of multi-story multi structures, largely that are not being fully occupied. Um, these are structures that once were used for produce or cold storage. Um, they have a very attractive uh, urban form, but they really aren't efficient for the uses they were once designed for. Um, we started seeing that there was a lot of demand for these spaces to be used by design firms, industrial design, graphic design, architecture, engineering, uh, software design and maintenance. Um, research and development, um, just a, a really whole, whole new series of industries, some of which we should note didn't even exist when the industrial sanctuary policy was adopted in 1980. So we thought we'd kind of give it a test drive here. For the last decade, this has been in place and has been incredibly successful. The zone allows for what we call industrial office uses, um, but it doesn't preclude the existing industrial uses that are there. So manufacturing, production, warehouse distribution, industrial service, all those uses are still in the area. And in fact, most of them have stayed. There hasn't really been um, any um, uh, loss of those businesses as a result of this tool. So we're seeing tremendous growth in these newer industries uh, while still retaining the existing businesses that are there. Can you talk about how compatible those uses are, how they actually interact on the ground with each other? Well, they act pretty fine with each other. Now, we're going to hear a lot as we get into the next um, phase in terms of reviewing this plan that uh, well, those people bring in more cars, mm -hmm. although we find that there's a pretty high mode split for these things. But um, the, maybe the biggest complaint would be that there's a, a more of a parking problem in the district because there's higher density employment. Uh, that's a problem for some. Others have noted that it's a kind of a market success. So, um, it, but in terms of how are those uses uh, working with each other, they're not conflicting per se. And in fact, what we're finding is that a lot of them are, there's kind of a, a synergy of businesses that are occurring. So. Uh, one person might be designing for somebody who's building down the street, who's uh, also working with an industrial service, who's now working with a different um, um, you know, software designer over here. It's an interesting kind of web of things that are happening. So the more we talk to people over there, the more we find that their customer base is actually within the central east side or within the central city. So compared to, say, the goat blocks, where we're hearing a lot of concern that the residential and mixed-use development is going to conflict with the freight movements of the folks across the street, we're not experiencing that in this part of the district? No, and you know, that that was a projection. I mean, the, the goat blocks <laughs> is an anomaly, and I don't want to get into the aspects of that one, but yeah. I mean, the reality is, is we're learning from that one only in that, that kind of mixed use development, and that's a very different situation, right? You're talking about large scale ground floor retail mm -hmm. with uh, residential above. What we're talking about here is really uh, jobs in a more of an office type component that basically is using an industrial building that's been there for a century. But you, you didn't mention bicycles as one of the modes here. And when you put up those examples, every one of them qualifies people who ride bikes to work. Yes, yeah, so we, we, if you talk to Brad Molson, he'll tell you that in some of the buildings he's recently completed, 25% of his, the workforce going there is basically getting there by bike. So we, we are aware of that. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that because one of the things that's down in this area here is we were going through the plan uh, last week. And you know, one of the big endorsements we have for the plan was um, our representative from Pacific Coast Fruits. They're arguably one of the largest freight users in the district. Um, they fully endorsed the plan. Um, another freight user came in, uh, which was interesting because he, a uh, smaller scale operation, but all freight delivery, and they said that their entire workforce gets there by bike. They would encourage more of it because the less cars they see in the right of way, the less uh, conflicts they have in terms of getting their trucks out of the district. Just to um, <clears throat> the Pacific Fruit, they're adjusting their deliveries, though, correct? Well, to, yeah. I mean, they're bringing the trucks in earlier and maybe later versus they used to bring them in more during the day. To, so there's not as much conflict. 
is my understanding. Is that correct? That's true of a lot of freight operations. So one of the things that we've noticed, and we've been doing a lot of on the ground re reconnaissance over here is get a sense of when is freight delivery occurring. You see a lot of freight movement in the middle of the day. You don't see as much during peak hour, AM or PM peak hour, which is probably wise because it's not so much people trying to get to the district, it's people going through the district from um, maybe the east side to try to get to jobs in the, on the west side of the central city. Um, but I wouldn't say that that has something that Pacific Coast Fruits has noted. I know there was a point in an Oregonian article where they was noted that they were basically doing more um, inner city delivery. Um, and that was the biggest shift that I've seen from them. So let's kind of get to the proposals that we're getting at here with the plan. There was general agreement on the four goals that I mentioned earlier, but to get there, and to implement a plan that would meet those goals, we heard from our stakeholder group that you're gonna to need to expand the industrial protections. And we, what we're seeing now is a lot of residential development starting to come into the district where it didn't really ever occur before. The area has been zoned for industrial along MLK, Grand, Broadway, um, or Burnside, sorry, um, and, um, and Morrison for 25 years. Um, in 2010, there was approximately 960 units in the, in the entire district. There's about 1,400 proposed right now. So the area has been discovered. A lot of it's occurring up near the Broadway Bridgehead, but it's, gonna, it's, a, it's a trend that's gonna continue, we're pretty sure. Um, so as that development comes in, the Goat Block's being a great example, you're starting to see residential development now proposed right across from existing industrial operations in a way that didn't happen before. So we're trying to get a sense of how to make sure that that development's done in a way that's com compatible and sustainable for the people who live in the residential development, but is not going to um, erode the ability for those industrial businesses to exist and be successful. Uh, the other thing is prop, prop, uh, parking management. The area has a very limited uh, finite supply of on-street parking. And because it's a lower density kind of an environment, you don't see a lot of structured parking in the district, nor are you likely to. So uh, we have to get a better idea of how to manage our off-street supply. I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. Um, enhancing freight mobility, um, even though the district is maybe shifting from uh, some of the more freight dependent type uses to some of these more newer industries that are maybe used more of an office format. Uh, freight's still gonna be a big factor in this district for years to come. And so we wanna make sure that we can uh, protect the ability for freight to get around and enhance the ability for it to get around. Uh, we wanna figure out how to balance this with how we're handling uh, cyclists, pedestrians, transit users, and we wanna look at our opportunities to touch on the innovation quadrant, which is really build on how does this district serve the innovation that's starting to occur at OHSU and PSU, especially with the night challenge. Um, and then lastly, we wanna look at how we can activate our mixed use corridors, get the most out of them, because we have a tremendous amount of mixed use zoning already in the district. Um, and then overall enhanced livability, environmental quality of the district. So I'm not gonna hit on each of these things, but I'm gonna hit the big ones, because these are the ones that we're gonna probably be getting the most testimony on when this plan comes back before you, which is on May 26th of next month. So um, expand industrial protections. As we talk about expanding uh, industrial flexibility through the zone, or through, the, through the zoning of the district, one of the big concerns is what happens on that interface between existing industrials and mixed use zoning. So that dark line you see is basically where you have on one side of the street, um, IG zoning, light industrial zoning, and on the other side you have mixed use zoning. Now this is an area where we're gonna see continued conflict unless we kind of get ahead of this. Uh, one of the things we can do is make some code changes so we can talk about updating the design guidelines and development standards, because right now um, you have completely different guidance going on for buildings that are basically looking across the street from each other. And that's not really working so well, and Goat Blocks was a good example of that. So we're gonna come back and make some changes to that. But one of the big things we heard was what happens when the new residents move in or the new industrial business moves in and they're in an office and format. And they don't like the fact that the guy across the street is banging or soldering or doing whatever um, at different times of the week, different times of the day. Um, we want to adopt a new basically industrial disclosure statement that's a covenant that would protect the interests of the industrial use by making the new tenants aware that they're moving into an environment where this is just part of the character of it. And it's something that they're gonna need to adjust to. And that as long as those operations are occurring within a lawful manner, the city is not going to take any uh, complaint against that seriously. So, um, I, I, my office is down in this district, and um, I've been down there at 12 midnight, and um, you'll have, well, Second Street lined up with uh, trucks sitting there idling, and they will 
idle all night long because they're produce, and they keep they want to keep their refrigerators cool, and it, I mean they'll line all all over the street because they're waiting to get in to either change out their produce or whatever fill. And so are we looking at policies around that idling? Um, Where because I, I see the conflict coming that people are going to complain that there's diesel emissions and they're sitting there idling all night. And, and I mean, they, and they, even if the truck's not idling, they've got a um, compressor on the um, trailer that, well, that's a refrigerated trailer. Do you want me to take this? Well, no, just, you know, it didn't come up. Did it come up? It didn't come up. Then well, I, it's I, not going to come up because no one's down there at midnight right now <laughs> unless you're working late. Well, okay. Uh, so. <laughs> but if I, uh, <laughs> I don't care about it. I mean, it doesn't bother me. I go home. <laughs> For one thing, I would say that Second Avenue is an area where we're not proposing any, one thing, we're not proposing any additional or not a lot of additional mixed use zoning here. Yeah. So the idea that new residents would be in that area, that there won't. Um, in but terms they're building of, just up the street, they are Burnside, and those trucks line up all the way down, was it Third Street, oh. that turned down. The, the short answer is you're moving into an industrial area, and if that's, a, if that's an issue you can't deal with, then you've probably moved into the wrong area, and we're going to continue to protect the interests of those industrial uses as long as they're operating within a lawful manner. So is there a, a overlay or something or something that we can put in place that people actively know about it versus find out about it and then, and then complain. That's why we would have the disclosure statement. So what the disclosure okay. statement is doing is it's making you aware of as you come in as a tenant or a successor of interest in a property that these conditions exist. You've been made aware of it before you've closed on the property. Um, as long as these businesses are operating within their lawful limits, we are not going to take action against them. Catherine and, uh, well, um, Gary, I should note, I, this is, I just want to annoy one thing, too, because I want to be perfectly clear. This is an existing condition that has occurred for 25 years in this district. So this is not something because of, or this is actually addressing the existing, existing condition in the district, not a, trying to mitigate a proposal of the plan. Yeah, so yeah, just to be yeah, clear. Yeah. Gary? He thinks I'm going to answer his question. I'm not oh, sure okay. I will. <laughs> um, <laughs> Isn't there a more sustainable solution, though, to a bunch of trucks idling down in Central East Side? And perhaps that could be encouraged, not necessarily discouraging the activity, but in other words, can they plug in? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure they could. But, I, you know, I'm trying to look at the, and I think that's something we can do is follow up working with PBOT, working with others, working with owners. But in the end, when we're talking about a comprehensive and zoning code change, which is really a land use plan, I'm not positive how every one of those elements gets addressed. Um, I think if we want to look at some additional policy language that talks are trying to work at that and try and look at some of the more sustainable aspects of this, we're totally open to that. So, so let us take it back and talk with PBOT. This is sort of use of the right of way kind of question. Uh, also, we did address this uh, or touch on an issue related to this when we did West Hayden Island, if you recall, yeah. right? Yeah. That was part of yeah. that. So. <laughs> Right, plug them in there. That was part of the, remember that? But that was, right, really. Uh, that was part of the um, IGA, remember, not the zoning. So, uh, I, you know, we haven't looked into this issue. It's good to know it now. I want to see what Peabody knows about it and how, what kind of, how they've addressed it in other places. Um, so rather than conjecture about it, we'll let us pursue that. What's not? Okay. Gary? Yeah, uh, different question. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm very supportive of these steps to maintain the industrial capacity um, in the district. Um, my question is about the uh, disclosure statement, and I would turn to my real estate colleagues on the commission here. Um, that's just what I thought maybe you were going to address, um, about whether that is going to be effectively implemented by realtors um, with their clients. Uh, non-disclosure does pop up in a lot of ways in the market, and so I, I, mean, I think it's fine that you have it between the between the owner. But the question is, you know, who's who's the, who's the who's the landlord and what's their behavior, or who's the seller and their behavior? So, if there is a requirement for disclosure, that could be included in any commercial lease and any uh, commercial or residential transaction, sale or purchase transaction. 
as a requirement either by the state of Oregon, because uh, we have a real estate commission that does law, or by the um, local constituencies. They can say, okay, we, we need to do this disclosure. It's required to close a transaction. So, so failure, failure on the part of a, a seller or a landlord to disclose that then puts the seller or landlord at liability? Right, because they're failing to c disclose a material fact about the property, and uh, we do have lots of different series of disclosures that are required. Thanks. W one thing I'll point out, and I should probably move on, is we have done a fair amount of analysis of the situation as it, it stands, and we've talked to Bureau Development Services. Uh, we asked the enforcement group how many complaints they've actually had about this. They said zero. And there are a number of people who are already there who are living across the street from op operations that do generate truck noise, do generate uh, late weekend type activities. Um, it, it's in some ways it could be a solution looking for a problem, but we want to get ahead of this just in case. Um, we come down. So parking management. Parking's a big issue, as I mentioned. Uh, one of the things we can do right now, the actually the transportation, um, the Management Association for the Central East Side Industrial Council is managing their parking permit. And they have the discretion to manage that program how they want um, with, with some guidance from the city. So they're basically issuing permits. Right now we think there's some w room for improvement because they're issuing about 150% of capacity. So we need to kind of rein that in. They're proposing to change that to about 80% of capacity in the next couple months. That will help um, make sure that people who are buying a permit can find a parking space when they get there. Um, I'd say we are trying to increase mode splits significantly. I think our projection is around 60% or greater in this district. Um, but one thing we want to note is that this is a district where, although it does have transit access, um, they do work in shifts a lot. So you'll have some people who are coming at hours where transit's not so readily available or when it's not as quite, people aren't quite as comfortable getting on a bike. Um, that could be a, a late night or midnight shift. So we want to make sure that we do have some, some on-street supply. But we also want to have off-street supply because right now, uh, recent studies have shown that the district has about three to 4,000 parking spaces that are not being used at peak hour, peak hour being noon. Um, so there's at noon you can drive through that district and you can find three to four thousand parking spaces that are sitting empty uh, So rather than getting in there and changing the management structure too significantly or proposing that we do a lot of structured parking We really want to better utilize that existing supply um, The reason it's not being used is there's a code prohibition to that because in the 1980s We were seeing a lot of people were doing park and ride They would park in the district and they would hop on a frailless square bus and come to the west side that's not quite the problem anymore, but the code is, because it's still saying that um, a guy could have 20 parking spaces across the street from someone who desperately needs them. He is prohibited by the code of making them accessible. So we would change the code to allow those parking spaces to be used by employees and customers of those businesses. Freight mobility is another just, big... Yeah. If I could just point out that that same need is showing up in the centers and corridors parking strategy conversation. So I think it's more than the district conversation, but the sooner we can start it, the better. Uh, freight mobility, uh, a big issue. Um, you have a situation where you have a very long district over a mile north to south. Um, you have MLK Grand, where they only have three areas in which you can cross it at a signal. So in terms of trying to get uh, bikes, cars, pedestrians, and trucks through that corridor safely, they basically queue up at the same three places. Um, it's a nightmare, especially when you combine that with the truck or train traffic that's occurring on First Avenue through the uh, Northern Pacific uh, Railroad. So what you have is, or Burlington Northern Railroad, so what you have is um, a situation where we can really enhance the, the ability to get east-west through the district by putting in a couple new signals, as well as creating a couple key one-way streets. Uh, four have been identified at this point, um, and what we'll do is combine that with signaling so that we can give the trucks some better options, as well as the active transportation modes some better options to get through the corridor safely and more efficiently. Um, freight counts are going to be something you'll probably be hearing quite a bit is what's the potential impact on freight in this district from these proposals we have. Um, the, the freight is still a big issue. Now, we're, our analysis will show you that basically some of the highest volumes might be 12% of the trips on a day might be freight 
Um, a lot of times it's six, but it's still a lot. We're talking like, if you look down at Southeast Stevens, you'll find that Southeast Stevens and 11th, you have only 6% of the trips may be freight, but that's still 474 freight trucks going through that, that intersection on a daily basis. So um, we still need to find a way to manage this. But one of the things we're also mindful of is we have a tremendous amount of bike commute going through this, this district as well. And there's a lot of concerns about conflicts between freight and bike. It's not as if we're really doing so much to address, again, what the plan's proposing because we're not, we are trying to increase our mode split, but we're really trying to address an existing condition because as I mentioned, 23% of the commute trips from some of these neighborhoods, Buckman, Hand, Kearns, uh, they're, they're being done by bike and they're going through this district. And that condition's probably only going to escalate. So one of the things we want to figure out is how do we get those bike commutes through here um, without conflicting with freight operations? One of the areas where we see the biggest conflicts is when you come down out of Southeast Salmon, you have a, basically a bike boulevard that extends all the way up to Mount Tabor, and it's fairly heavily used. But once they hit Southeast 12th, there really isn't a clear idea of where you're supposed to go. Your infrastructure starts to drop off, your wayfinding's not there, your signalizations and stop signs aren't in the same kind of configuration as they might be on better bike streets. So cyclists are dispersing throughout the area, and that's where we're seeing some of the greatest conflicts with freight and trucks. So we would put some proposals together to rectify that. This kind of shows, this was a map we developed in an open house where we asked people, how do, you, how do you get to or through the district by bike? And they were all over the place. So um, what we found is through a couple minor enhancements to some of the existing routes, as well as adding uh, some new infrastructure on Salmon and on Harrison, we can greatly improve the uh, safety of cyclists through here and reduce the number of conflicts with freight. And this gives you a little bit of idea how those two systems start to overlay and, uh, and separate through this proposal. And this is all highlighted in detail in the plan. Um, a couple of the priorities real fast we're um, looking at, and we'll, the plan has a lot more about this, and we can talk more about it when we bring the full plan back, but really is how do we support the innovation quadrant um, that's really developing over in South Waterfront and here in the University District. Um, we think that there is a tremendous amount of opportunity in the southern part of the district, and really district-wide, to create manufacturing and industrial service uses that benefit um, and spin off from that, that innovation quadrant. Now, there's also the ability to use the station areas, especially the OMSI area, um, as a place for our commercial office, as well as research and development space that also is associated with what's happening across the river. Uh, we want to activate the mixed-use corridors. We want to enhance the livability of the district by bringing in more uh, publicly accessible open space and more open space options than currently exist. Um, we also want to really green the district up quite a bit. It's a big heat island, has some air quality issues. There's a lot we can do um, in terms of green roofs, living walls, um, and then swales and canopies that are more um, freight compatible than what we've done in the past. Um, and then there's a big focus on really how to restore habitat and enhance habitat along the uh, southern section there at uh, the waterfront, but also create a visitor attractor facility that really benefits from the light rail station there as well as its connection with OMSI and the Oregon Heritage Braille Museum, as well as PCC and Portland Opera. So the big mix moves here in terms of land use is going to be how do we expand mixed use zoning. Um, in terms of the... Um, potential for residential, the only thing inside the existing district where we're proposing new residential are these light purple areas. So if you see along 3rd Avenue and along 6th Avenue, these light purple areas are actually have a comp plan designation of EX, but they're zoned IG. Um, more often than not, those are split zone lots. So um, we're proposing to just up zone them as part of this project so that it defers the cost from the landowner and starts to put this in play a little bit sooner. Uh, we'll rationalize it with some of the development standards and guidelines we talked about along the interface. But in terms of the um, station areas, what we're proposing is that the Clinton station, which is outside the central city today, but would be brought in by this plan, we would do additional residential uh, mixed use commercial zoning there. Uh, but at the OMSI station, and then in this area here between Powell and Woodward, we would be proposing EX no housing. Now, part of the reason for that is to uh, really try to promote this more transit em employment, transit-oriented development. But we're also very concerned about bringing in housing in an area we feel is not compatible uh, with the existing uses that are around it. We're also concerned that we wouldn't be able to create enough residential capacity at those station areas um, to create any kind of sense of place in the long term. Is that the flap we're having with OMSI now? Yes. Around their intention? Yes. 
Can you lay out the two sides of that? Would you try so I can understand? So, and I would note that this is a position that I think is largely held by OMSI, although I think there is some concern by uh, Portland Opera that maybe there should be some greater activation at the station area. That might be a fair way of saying that. Don can correct me on this. But largely, they believe that they need the flexibility of all the uses that would be allowed typically in the EX zone. Uh, we're putting out an EX zone pattern that would allow for visitor attractors, uh, lodging, so hotel, um, large scale entertainment, uh, institutional development, commercial office, industrial uses, virtually every use that's allowed in the code except for housing. Um, we think that that is going to create a very active station area. A lot of that is, um, I think the play we've heard is that, um, or concern we've heard is that if you don't have residential development, you can't activate a space. Um, but what we've really said is, you know, you could walk through this district that we're in today at 10 o'clock at night, and you'll find it's not the most inviting, not the most active space, and it has thousands of units in it. It's really more about how you activate the ground floor and the kind of uses that you're putting in there. Um, it's really an urban design exercise in many respects. We think with the flexibility that the EX zone uh, entails, as well in terms of the amount of uses, as well as the kind of density that would be um, allowed in this site, you can easily create a place that's active 18 hours out of the day. Joe? Yeah. If, if I could add to this, um, the, um, uh, the, lib the uh, additional uses that we're proposing to allow through this um, rezoning of that whole area, that big purple area down labeled OMSI station there to EX is, is significant compared to what it is today. Because today it's industrial other than the OMSI blocks themselves, which can be their uh, office kind of spaces. Um, when you look at the future of the, that land down there, the big driver uh, seems to be um, not just the, the transit station, but also proximity to uh, South Waterfront and the Knight Center and, and everything that's happening across the way. So this opening up of that whole area to this more flexible, but still in its heart employment kind of zoning, we think it got a lot of potential to both spark development and um, uh, bring activity. The so that that's that's in, in um, it's part of um, um, a sense of to the protecting uh, employment lands. That's part of our goal nine uh, dilemma across the entire comp plan. Also, when you look at the land that's actually there and who owns it, uh, the parcels that OMSI owns are there's there's one that could be a really um, that that's a could be an attractive residential project or building, but it's one building. And so then you end up with uh, a few hundred at most apartments over at the end of, uh, uh, at the other of the place, and it doesn't add up enough to make the kind of uh, successful residential area, you, you know, we've been looking for in other parts of the central city that now you're starting to see emerge in the Lloyd District because they're getting to a certain number of units that we've watched actually take some time to emerge in South Waterfront because of the same thing. Once it gets to a certain number of units, uh, it's more self-sustaining. This does not have that kind of potential, at least in the near term. Uh, and has these other conflicts with industrial land and access. So that's why we're not supportive of it at this time. So I have to ask the question, I'm, from, based on what you said and what I'm hearing, is that you want some housing down there to activate it and potentially have folks that are living there and working there, because the question in my mind is why any housing? We well, don't, we're, we're, we're not, not allowing housing, Mike. Uh, the, in the, uh, the purple? Oh, yeah. in the uh, OMSI station. I mean, in the purple. Oh, in the in in the uh, area that's purple already. EDX, yeah. Uh, it's already EX. It's sort of way that the district has been designed, right. and uh, um, so we. Um, we're rezoning. No, maybe we're not clear. So just to be clear, the the dark purple here, Mike. All of that is existing EX zoning. The only places, this very light purple here, those are areas that already have an ES, EX designation right. 
they're being just zoned up to that designation. They're basically making lots that are otherwise split zone whole is what they're doing. In terms of, in bringing that, and that's nine acres. So out of the entire plan area of almost 600 acres, there's nine acres that are being up zoned to their comp plan designation that would allow housing. The reason that we have not brought in additional acreage inside the district, so this area here at OMSI or down here on Woodward and Powell is because we feel, for one, there's already a tremendous amount of mixed use and housing capacity in the district. You could develop upwards of 5,000 units in that land mass alone. Flipping industrial and employment lands to then compete with the cost and, uh, and the kind of the competitive nature of, of residential properties is something that we really didn't think was going to be the right move. I have a lot more on this actually in, in a couple of slides. So can we come back to this in a minute just because just I can give you a little better definition and a little better example of what we're talking about down there. Can I ask one question? Yeah. Um, we had TriMet come before us relative to Clinton Station zoning change. Does this include that? It does, and they're they are on board with our proposals. So for these they're exercises. on board with the housing component at Clinton, not at, at OMSI. At Clinton, correct? Yes. So now we just need to do because the part of the question was affordable housing. So that's just left up to us. Sure. Okay. Yes. Can I ask one thing, and maybe your address is coming up, is the islands, kind of, yes. in, especially in that corridor, are you going to address why there's islands left? Yes. Perfect, thanks. Okay, can I ask my questions and if they're going to be dealt with later? So on the OMSI purple, is the northern boundary the boathouse parking lot? The what parking the lot? The northern, the boathouse is to the north oh, Yes, yeah. so the northern boundary is actually Clay Street. That's what so, I'm trying to figure so out. Clay Street is the northern boundary. The parking lot you're talking about is approximately right there. Okay. And then I've seen a lot of more bars and restaurants going in along water. What is that zoned? It's zone E. Um, it's IG1, and it has uh, the employment opportunity overlay on it, which does allow, does allow for retail, but so does the IG1. So, And more often than not, those uses are actually accessory to what's going on. So uh, Hair of the Dog Brewery, uh, what appears to be a restaurant is really a tasting facility that's accessory to the use. Uh, Bunk Bar is a um, retail space that actually is more of accessory use to the overall food production aspect of that. Like those the are, wine bar? The I mean, wine bar would be the wine bar would be getting used. likely <laughs> the wine bar are. would likely pro I don't know every use the, the wine bar is probably a retail use that's allowed in the zone as well. So like once again, IG1 allows you to do 3000 square feet of retail per site. These blocks are heavily parcelized, so a lot of times you'll find that it's not one site, it's maybe upwards of five sites on there. Each one is entitled to 3000 square feet of retail. That's based on the IG1 industrial sanctuary zoning. Okay. And then one last question. With the existing parking lots for off-site parking lots, sometimes those get taken for event events and they aren't available for parking. I'm just curious, is that does that go through a temporary use process or are you just the city's not involved in it at all? They just get used I'm, in I'm not aware of the specific situation, okay. so I read not the best person to answer that. Okay, um, the other move here in terms of outside of the mixed use zoning would be the employment opportunity sub area. Again, it was fairly constrained to uh, the areas west of Third Avenue when it was adopted in 2007. Uh, it's been a pretty successful tool. Uh, through this process, we looked at expanding it to these areas and the hatch marks. Um, this might start to get at, uh, at Commissioner Schultz's question. Why are these all these areas not either EX or EOS, which is the Employment Opportunity Sub Area. Um, this approach allows us to meet the employment projections. There was a lot of concerns from uh, certain aspects of the uh, Central East Side Industrial Council that these areas that are kind of left islands of gray, so here, 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 and here, that they have, uh, because they have a, a, um, a combination of, of various industrial uses there, we should leave it as IG1 zoning and we should not allow for uh, just pure employment opportunity sub area on it. As a compromise to that, one of the things that is being proposed is in those areas, you could do industrial office, but it would have to be on the upper stories of buildings that have their ground floor preserved for industrial use. The industrial use being manufacturing and production, warehouse and distribution, industrial service, or wholesale sales. Those are the typical uses that are in, allowed in the IG1 zone. 
Um, I would say that there's not 100% agreement on that, but that is what our SAC decided to put forward. And um, I think what you'll find is when we come in uh, next month with the plan, you'll probably be hearing a number of people testifying that they would also like to have the EOS uh, properties up here, here, and here. We're hearing a fair amount of zone uh, requests start to happen on those areas. So if I could add to that, um, this is um, the reason that uh, the slide on the, uh, on the, the uh, left, the existing EOS is sort of restricted to that size was the desire to experiment with the kind of uses that can be in an industrial area, but this concern that somehow you're gonna take it to a tipping point and it'll never be back. So this strategy or this approach that we've got in the right-hand slide continues with that kind of very conservative approach uh, and that's what was supported by our stakeholder advisory committee. You know, another, but that area too that is shown with the hatch where we would propose to change the zoning is more than enough, gets us, um, uh, has more development capacity for um, um, job infill than the forecast of jobs that we are making for the district. So the demand, there's still an excess supply to demand in that hatched area. Uh, so we think we're, you know, it's um, a compromise to uh, approach this more uh, conservatively. However, you know, the other way it works is that uh, the more supply you create, the, long, the, the more different choices there are for that same limited amount of demand, so it's not likely to show up so intensely in any one given place anyway. You're spreading it out over more of the district. The Stakeholder Advisory Committee in general, I think, felt um, the best and most fair approach was the one that was more geographically conservative rather than just opening it up more. So Joe, I'm sorry, I, I just missed um, the, the round cross hatching is where you have reduced the area for, um, you're not, because this document on the left That's where it is. That, has all that gray. And then you've got this uh, a significant amount of brown cross hatching that you've added. Right, so um, and the one on the left is where this employment opportunity subarea, that's what EOS stands for, right. exists today. And within that boundary, within under that crosshassing, a building can have a wider range of types of businesses in there legally in the industrial zone. So you don't have to really make uh, something physical. You can be intellectual property and, and the like. What we're showing on the right is the desire to expand that flexibility to more of the central east side. It's still the IG zone underneath it as and, well. And where do the islands reside in the resolution of all this? The light, the light purples? So the, the, the stakeholder advisory committee put out a, a support a recommendation that you could still do industrial office in those areas, but it could only occur on the upper stories of buildings. The ground floor would have to be preserved for one of those four more traditional and, and industrial type uses. Yeah. Um, and it, it, just to be real clear, because this might answer some of the different questions. So you, you, what are the things you're going to hear about a lot next, next month when this plan comes forward? Well, you're going to hear a lot about whether we're doing too much or too little of that expansion. Uh, and then you're also going to hear about OMSI. So let's kind of tackle this one first, the EOS expansion. Um, I would say that um, there's not a unanimous decision right now within the Central East Side Industrial Council. They're actually working on this right now, trying to figure out as a board whether they can fully support the plan or not. The two stakeholders who represented the council um, on our advisory committee uh, are voted to basically kind of abstain from voting at this point on the plan because they wanted to be able to see if the full board could come to some resolution on this. So one of the things they're looking at is, do we vote to go ahead and expand it the way it is? Is it going too far? Or is there maybe a different zoning tool they might want to recommend? So they're still working on that. Um, we expect to see that come out sometime in the next two weeks. But for now, um, if you really were to kind of a, a distill what their, their main concerns might be, would be that, this expansion could have an impact on the limited amount of parking that's already in the district. We feel we're addressing that by changing how the permit program works with them, as well as expanding access to off-street parking facilities. We're going to open up three to 4,000 parking spaces by the zoning amendments we're, we're proposing, so we think that's going to more than adequately address this. Um, we're also concerned about impacts on freight. 
Um, our transportation analysis doesn't support that conclusion. In fact, it seems to show that the, the TRIPS generation is really more of a regional phenomenon, that the TRIPS generated by this proposal aren't going to really have that much of an impact. And I'll show you a little bit about why in a second. Um, there's a, a concern about the effects of affordability of space. This is a fairly affordable place to locate. Um, and that's particularly true if you're renting a small space. But you will still be leasing space at a fairly high rate. In fact, we find that companies here are paying uh, rates for floor area that is, exceeds what they're paying for in Chinatown. Um, the district is being affected in terms of affordability because of its centrality, not because of its flexibility. And that's something that we have consistently found. Um, and then the other is that they would be proposed too much retail use because the EOS basically allows you to do 5,000 square feet of retail by right per site, uh, whereas the IG-1 allows you to do 3,000 square feet by right per site. However, the, um, the provisions in the IG-1 zone would also allow you to go through a conditional use permit to get upwards of 20,000 square feet of retail if you want to go through that process. Our proposal is to get rid of that conditional use limitation, so we're effectively reducing the amount of retail that could be developed in the district by 75%, not increasing it. So can you speak to the affordability? Um, because I think there's a two-pronged affordability. One is the office space. Because of, um, I would say, small businesses like myself, they're seeing the pressure uh, of just not only rent, but also of availability of buildings. Because I know talking to some building owners, they're looking at do they rent to small businesses or do they convert their building to get out 10 tenants and get one or 20 and get one and they can probably make more money with just the one so I'm um, how, what's your analysis of that and is that I mean this has been a great spot for a lot of really small people to come in one two three five employees and have well for a while at least reasonable rents and kind of get a business started and it appears that that's starting to change fairly rapidly. And, and so I know it seems that we're putting more office space availability in, but at the same time, it's the affordability and, and the building owners seeing more profit, which I'm, I don't want to stop, but how do, how do we, where do we send them, I guess? Where do you send me for my next affordability in, in office space? Right, so ideally your office is either located in the EX or in the EOS because it wouldn't be allowed in the IG, correct? 3,000 square feet per 3, site. 3,000 square feet. You yeah. could be part of that 3,000 square feet. Um, and um, so a part of what's going on, I think, is the market is tightening up because of, of, uh, of, some, of some of that. I think uh, the market is tightening up uh, because of um, development or just tenancy is sort of being realized in the EX parts of the district, the purple, mm -hmm. uh, along MLK Grand and Burnside. Um, one of the reasons to expand the EOS is to bring more sites into the mix that can legally establish multi-tenant office uses and, and uh, thereby not keep the supply of potential places for businesses to go limited. So it, fattens up the supply, and that should help moderate you know, uh, price increases. It doesn't prevent them, but it helps moderate it. That's another reason to think about expanding the EOS even more broadly. You're just trying to dilute that market pressure that could drive up uh, prices if there's only a few sites that could actually legally be used for that use. Um, uh, we're starting to see speculative multi-story industrial building built, uh, opening that up with this EOS overlay to a B for a wider range of business types uh, is a good thing for the price point too. You know, new always costs more than um, class B, class C, but um, in the big picture, right, is supply and demand. So a greater supply is gonna keep uh, a business that might outbid uh, one business uh, from uh, giving them more choices of places to go bid the higher rent and leave some opportunities for the other sort of lower cost tenants. Can I, can I add one thing too? The, the EOS provisions, the way they currently are applied, say that you can only have 60,000 square feet of that industrial office use per site. It doesn't care how big your site is. So you could have a 10,000 square foot site or a 40 or four acre site, 
you're limited to 60,000 square feet. So we're proposing to change that and say, you can do three to one FAR. Let's just regulate it that way. That's more of an equitable approach across sites. The other is to say 60,000 square feet for the building rehabs is somewhat limiting. Some of those buildings are less than 60,000 square feet, but a number of those buildings actually have an, are in excess of that. So it makes it somewhat unaffordable or challenging for the people to only really rehab portions of that building through the industrial office and then they're really constrained to credit keep it as a more traditional office even though that space may or sorry traditional industrial use even though that building really may not be appropriate for that anymore so the other thing we would change is to say you can do full rehab of existing structures and it's worth noting that the eos was in part adopted to help preserve some of that historic industrial fabric that's in the district some of those older multi-story buildings we figure this is a better way of doing that than saying you can only have so much of your building set aside for that use. So that should also increase the amount of space available to these uses considerably. Um, and just quickly, I know we're wrapping up here. Um, the, the amount of change that we're really talking about in this district should be noted is it's really focused down along the station areas. So then Southern Triangle, the Clinton Station, the OMSI Station, and MLK Grand. Um, I know there's a lot of concern from some, some industrial folks that the amount of change that's being proposed over here with the expansion of EOS would really have a, a significant and detrimental effect. Our analysis doesn't support that. And one thing I would point out is that even with full build out, that's build out of the existing areas with EOS, as well as the IG1 properties with industrial ground floor and three to one FAR industrial office above. If you were to do that, we're talking about 1700 jobs over 20 years it's a pretty low amount of growth, uh, considering all things considered. Really, the majority of the growth is occurring where we already have mixed use on our high transit corridor. So that's really what this plan's trying to get at. Um, lastly, uh, let's just talk real quickly about OMSI. As Joe noted earlier, um, OMSI had a district plan they put out last year. It looked at really everything from Clay Street down to Ross Island sand and gravel. Uh, the thing is, is that the areas that OMSI controls are really limited to this about 20, 21 acre area here. So when we started doing more market analysis to figure out, okay, who's interested in this plan? Although some of the adjacent property owners are supportive of OMSI's ambitions, they did not want to share in the development plan. So Portland Opera is shown as having housing on their site. They've told us they're not interested. Portland Community College has housing shown on their site. They're not interested. So it really started to reduce the amount of housing that would be developed from about 900 that was proposed by OMSI to really about 300 that could be built on one site. We were concerned that that was really creating a small island of residential uses that would not be well supported by infrastructure, services, uh, or amenities. Um, and so that's really the, the thing here is to try to figure out without housing, can you create a, you know, a really significant sense of place? Our sense is yes. So building off of what OMSI showed is how do you start to incorporate open space features and embrace the river? How do you have a better circulation pattern that links you with the light rail station? We completely concur with this. And so our proposal is to say, let's go forward with that. Let's allow for that full range of uses you want with the exception of the one housing project. And let's go ahead and see how we can really orient towards the river and the station area with this, with this zoning pattern. So um, not dwelling on that too much, uh, one thing I would show you is an example of a place where you have a very vibrant uh, former industrial area that's a waterfront district that has absolutely no housing. This is Granville Island in Vancouver, BC. It has a colleges, it has a maker space, it has a hotel, it has some retail, it has water transit. It is one of the most successful projects in the Pacific Northwest. It's been that way for 30 years. We believe we could have this version of it over on the central east side. And it's also worth noting that just across the way from it, much like our central east side, is their south waterfront, South Falls Creek. So our next steps will be to release a plan here um, next week, uh, or two weeks. Uh, that's a public review draft that will go out on the 28th. Um, then we will have our first public hearing with you all on May 26th with a follow-up work session on the 9th. And then we have a tentative uh, date with the city council on July 1st, hoping to wrap up this plan by mid-July. So, thank you. Questions? Oh, Gary? Yeah. Um, the EXD zone, the, the, uh, the darker purple stuff, am I understanding that correctly, that housing, housing is currently allowed in that zoning pattern? So, the, there was some articles over the weekend you may have seen where there's, um, some insinuation that you can do housing in that zone today. It's currently zoned EG, so it's general employment. You can only do housing as a conditional use. 
Um, and it's a pretty tough bar to clear to be able to do it. You can apply for it, it doesn't mean it would be granted. Um, our proposal is to say you can do EX and you can't do housing. However, uh, another thing to note is that office and retail uses that are basically also conditional use and pretty heavily regulated in the EG zone would be allowed in much greater densities uh, through the EX pattern we're putting here. So can you do housing there today? Only if you were to get it approved as a conditional use. The zoning pattern we're putting out there expands the full range of use you could do, but does preclude housing. So effectively, it expands the amount, it greatly expands the ease with which that purple area can be converted to housing? No. It would, housing would not be allowed under I, that proposal. I think you guys might be asking about two different spots on the map. So the purple areas that were along MLK and Grand and Burnside mm -hmm. and Sandy, all of that, uh, is EX and does allow residential today. Um, that big blob that was uh, shown around OMSI uh, is... Um, Can you flip in, back the picture? Yeah, will you go back to the map? I, I just got the impression both of them are purple, in my eye at least. Um, so the... Um, okay, the one, that, uh, the one that Eric... Yeah. That uh, today is an, sort of an employment zone and an industrial zone. Uh, no, the employment I'm speaking of the um, the large purple area with the purple that one with white island Gary so that is that EX thing? allows residential allows it allows everything actually part of what we discovered when they created EX in the in the uh, west quadrant plan right this was supposed to be this district that allowed industrial sort of uh, to exist with residential and allow this transition right and um, that worked fine because, uh, in terms of making a mixed-use employment district, because the Pearl District, or the, that part of the central city, actually has a great deal of employment in it, but it's not industrial anymore, and that's part of what I think we learned from that particular experiment. And so, with this one, we're just being, you know, that same Pearl-like zoning is what's in the area that you were asking about around OMSI. We're proposing a version of that zoning, but just not the residential part. Howard, and then Don. Well, I think you make a pretty good case of why the the land at OMSI isn't workable, and that should be hard and fast. This is kind of a black and white plan, uh, and generally speaking, I do think housing and employment are compatible and should be encouraged. And and so, where there's opportunities to make alterations, I hope we do that. It troubles me that we're making this a hard and fast no housing at all because there may be opportunities in the future to do that. But I understand the rationale. I'm just saying the black and white of it kind of bothers me. Okay. Don? Uh, maybe, Troy, this is a good map to explain or time to explain the white parcel squares and rectangles that Catherine asked about sure. and why they're there. So again, um, the well, these areas here, so let's just start with these ones. We'll start with the easy ones. These. Two parcels here are actually uh, zoned open space, and they would remain that. And those are largely how you get on and off the uh, Burnside and the Morrison and Hawthorne bridges. Um, these parcels here are, remain white, no change, because they're currently zoned for multifamily zoning, have been for almost 30 years, and so there's no interest in changing that. Um, the question starts to come into is, what was the zoning pattern that would be adequate for this location, these two islands here? and this corridor here. Um, now, you'll note when you get to the next level, one of the things that we really started to talk about was, well, let's use Hawthorne and more Madison as an example. That was an area where some people said, why not do EX mixed use zoning there? Overall, the idea was, well, it feels kind of like a main street already. Do you really need to have EX to accomplish that? Maybe just expanding this employment opportunity sub area and the little bit of uh, retail that comes with it would more than adequately do that. It would allow for higher density office use around there. Maybe that's the right play as opposed to doing more EX. It also would be more compatible with the industrial service uses that are located to the north and south of that corridor. The question starts to come into is, is there enough industrial capacity in these two islands, in this island, in this area, uh, to justify not expanding the employment opportunity sub area there, meaning um, if you were to expand that there, would it really erode the existing industrial businesses that are there? And I think that's where the question is going to come into play from different landowners. There are, there are shifts occurring between properties there. Some people are selling and redeveloping. 
um, with, with uh, industrial uses that are, appear almost more like the EOS anyway, but they're, they're constrained in terms of how far they can go in terms of the office component. This was a real hot issue, I mean, for the SAC. I would say this is, I, it's interesting to me that the, the OMSI question has become a big issue again uh, because it was largely resolved during the SAC issue. Uh, we knew it would come back in at the back end of the prop, uh, project. That said, this, this particular map probably demonstrates the biggest uh, conversations that we had over the last year with the stakeholder advisory group is to, are we going too far or are we not going far enough with EOS zoning? So this area is a TIF district, right? Yes. Yes. And so um, I, I guess my concern, and, and Joe, I, I, I get that we're trying to create more supply for small businesses, but it, it it has been, I've been down in there for 10 years, and it has been a place where very small businesses, people come with their ideas, and kind of a lot of entrepreneurs, and and the creative class came in, and, and um, but now there's new opportunities for the building owners, and we're, we're creating those and, and in the future. And my concern long-term is that, um, it is to kind of Howard's, we have this very black and white look at this, but the very small businesses that kind of came in that class C space um, are, are not going to be able to survive. I mean, they're going to have to find a new place to go. And part of the growth that this area was able to experience during that time frame of um, the Great Recession or whatever you want to call it was those small businesses growing. They, they went from one to five people, ten people, the guy with the bike that moved in and, and grew, um, those were growth businesses in this area because of that type of I, I really climate for um, cheap office space and availability. Um, taking that away and not really having a plan to how does maybe PDC help make that transition for some of these businesses in the future because a lot of people come down into this neighborhood because their friends came down here and, and or their spinoffs of these little businesses. So one thing I would point out though is this is expanding the ability to do those types of operations. It's not decreasing it. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 it's we have support from those very yeah. property owners that you're talking about that this allows them to have greater access, one, to a, a bigger pool of, of smaller affordable spaces than they currently have because right now yeah. we're constraining it. We're the, If for anything, we're juicing the market to make the square footage more expensive because we're not allowing the flexibility throughout the district. So those limited areas where you can do that, they can charge whatever people are willing to pay. Yeah. But if we start to expand that to the significant other parts of the district, it's really going to allow for a greater pool of that the resource to exist. And one of the things they've also told us is, I started off with my business, I had five people, I outgrew my space. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now I need a, and well, here's an interesting one. It's a whole star architects, and I'm sure they're going to come mm -hmm. and testify because they've been testifying in front of our SAC. Mm -hmm. They started off 23 years ago in the IG1 zone. They're using a 3,000 square foot office space. It's allowed by the zone. They've outgrown that space. They now have 23 employees. They need about 10,000 square feet. They can either move to a far more expensive piece of land over on the EX corridor, or they can try to uh, find space inside the EOS. They're they're, they, they are supporting expansion of EOS for that purpose so that they can see that there will be other spaces they might be able to go and, and keep their business in the district but not be penalized because they've been successful. So that would be their, their, their play on this. I, I'm, not, I'm not questioning that it puts more supply on the market, and I, I, I understand that component of it. It's the affordability. It, it really is the issue, and it's because you have – Property owners it is very affordable now, and it has been for ten plus years. Um, it's because it's popular, and, and part of the thing that um, is good for the industry and f good for really the um, property owners, they're able to see the hosts. And I, I mean, um, a, a number of small architecture firms are moving into the area. Um, they can because they can get a better rent than for the very small businesses. And, and that's the affordability, that's the concern I have. It's not, it's not that there's greater supply out there, but even across MOK and up sixth in, in that, when you talk to those folks and you talk to some of those people, 
It's affordability, and, and that's the concern. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying that it's not good to put that out there, but this is a TIF district, and we should look at how we can preserve some of that affordability for some of those new businesses that we don't know about to come in and grow, like a host or some of the other businesses that have grown. Roger? Yeah, Don. Yeah, Andre, I'm glad you put a spotlight on this issue of affordability because it's interesting. Uh, a couple of the members of our advisory committee have businesses there, and they've grown there. Mm -hmm. And they want to stay there. And it, it's not, I don't know if the, the affordability thing is high on their radar screen. They like the vibe down there. Yeah. They're able to attract employees that are appropriate for their businesses. And those employees can get to the district easily on bikes and now on transit. It's become a real transit-rich mm -hmm. district. So it's got a lot going for it. I would definitely support your suggestion that if there's programs that we can endorse, whether it be through PDC or whoever, to kind of stabilize some of the rents for these incubator businesses, I might call them, uh, that would be a good thing. And then, Howard, one comment on the OMSI, no housing and OMSI. We talked about that a lot. And I think not showing, I'll just say this. This might be too candid, but I'll say it anyway, because I've reached the age of candor. The, uh, part of our recommendation to not have housing at OMSI was really to address the compatibility issue with freight movers and people that, that have a lot of truck requirements and circulation requirements to their businesses. If we let a lot of housing in there, they think the volume on complaints and, and the compatibility would go way up. Okay, so there's a social side to this, yeah. which I'll, I'll, I'll tactfully call it the social side of it, and then there's also the physical side. And I think with this new east side line going out towards Milwaukee, it's time to test the kind of TOD that has an employment focus. And I, would, I think that's going to happen, happen at, uh, at Clinton. It's going to happen at OMSI. It's going to happen at the next station to the South Chris Holgate, right, uh, which we didn't look at. That's going to be a major factor in all those areas. So time to get started on it. And what better location to, to emphasize jobs than right at that key nexus between uh, transit routes. Okay? Great. I, I have one other question. Trains. There's. Did you guys talk about trains at all? Yeah. Sure, sure <laughs> the big did. train, but not the, not the, uh, not the streetcar. But I'm talking about the UP. We didn't talk a lot about it, other than you know we know that UP is not going to go anywhere. Um, but we did talk about quiet zone. So there was a conversation, and there's an, there is a action in the plan that 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 looks at pursuing potential quiet zone through the district at some point. Um, I'd say there's a little bit of concern from some of the more um, uh, very stringent industrial users that they consider that somewhat of a protect protection of not having a quiet zone because it makes it a less appealing place for those who I, might complain I about it to show agree. up. Um, but one of the things that the SAC had a very interesting conversation one night about that, and what they concluded was, look, nobody likes the noise. It's loud, regardless of what you do for a living there. And if there was a way to make that quiet without taking money away from the district, who would, who would lose from that? So I think that was kind of where we concluded. Right. Thank you. How are, um, how are we coming with quiet zones in general? I live in one that uh, is hardly a quiet zone. Is there any <laughs> kind of an arrangement to work with the railroads to tone it down at midnight? I really don't know how to answer that question. Yeah. <laughs> There, there are. There's. I mean, you're probably referring to the one over in the North Pearl area. There's also one proposed down here near the Clinton Station. Um, you know, uh, my limited knowledge of it is that they are supposed to be quiet. Whether they're not, I don't know how that is enforced. But I know that the uh, the, the key to get them to be able to do it at all and, and comply with federal regulations is to imply is to Im, um, implement one of those quiet zones. It's a tough, Howard. It's just such a tough behavioral thing to deal with in all parts of our city. Making it work is really difficult. It varies with engineers, you know that? Exactly. Yeah, it does, it yes, really it does. Some really want to take it easy and others say, wake them up, man. I'm up, you gotta be up. <laughs> Any last questions? Thank you, Troy. Oh, yes, a quick question. What? So, do you guys have an estimate of how much you expect in terms of population increase for residents? 
Yeah, our projection is about uh, 3,500 units total, um, although I'd say we're probably getting close to 2,500 through current proposals. We'll have to see how many of those actually get built. Those are proposals that are going through the review process or have had a pre-app, but um, most of them are also for rental apartments, so we'll have to see how much capacity there is going forward. But in the long run, we're looking at about 3,000, although there is potential to get upwards of five uh, and where total. And where would those kids, if there were kids, where would they go to school? Um, if they were to school here, um, probably the Buckman or down near Hosford. But, um, you know, this is an area where we haven't talked a lot about the unit kind of mix. This isn't some place we would probably be encouraging a lot of families with children. It's probably more of a workforce or empty nester type of environment because the uses that would be located would be on these major corridors, MLK, Grand, um, Burnside. Um, they're not um, locations that you would probably actively pursue to site families with children? Just to say, what would have intrigued me when my kids were little was the proximity to OMSI and STEM, op STEM opportunities. So I actually would have been curious about the ability to live there. I understand why we're saying no housing on OMSI, but if there was enough there there to have housing there, it'd be a great partnership. Thank you, Troy. Appreciate it. Don, thank you. Thank you for your chairman. <laughs> um, next, we have TSB project follow-up, and then after that, if it's okay, can we flip to do residential density to catch Karen? Eric, is that okay? Um, we'll we'll do the um, Park Rose piece of that. Yeah. Um, okay, but we don't want to do the rest of it because we put residential density last because in case we don't get to it, we, okay, it was our lowest priority. Perfect. For, um, so um, just by way of introduction, um, we're transitioning back to the overall comprehensive plan now. Um, and we have three uh, primary topics tonight with the comp plan. There's um, first we're going to um, have a follow-up discussion of the transportation system plan. Um, and that uh, is about a 40, 30 to 45 minute conversation. Um, the second topic, there is time for a break, which we're running behind schedule. So we might have to shorten that a little bit. Um, there's an hour and a half for um, housing and displacement conversation follow-up. Those are some pretty meaty topics mm -hmm. following up um, on the housing report and a variety of memos that we've sent you. Um, the, um, and then the last topic is residential density with, um, and we're gonna focus on the up designation, so we're not getting back tonight to East Moreland yet. Um, this is the, we're gonna shift gears and talk about places that where we're proposing some, some up designation, um, primarily in Sunnyside, Buckman, and Park Rose. Um, and then at the end, I wanna talk a little bit about next steps, because we're getting into that sort of decision-making mode pretty soon, and I wanna just walk through the sequence for the next couple sessions. Um, so again, we're gonna start with transportation system plan. Uh, with me here is Peter Hurley from uh, Bureau of Transportation. Um, and the first subtopic in the TSP is, is a number of you asked for a, a quick update on the green loop. Um, and so I'm gonna have Mark Raggett from our urban design team join me up here. Uh, Mark, are you here? Um, and he's gonna go through a brief series of slides um, to update you on what is the green loop. Um, by way of introduction, I just wanna say that um, Currently, the green loop, uh, the context of your question is currently the green loop is not in the overall citywide transportation system plan because it, it's, it's a proposal that's coming up through the central city plan. And right now, the central city plan is, is seen as the f likely first amendment to the new comp plan, but not within the comp plan. So it will be, it, the green loop will surface and be vetted through that central city planning process. And, and if it, if it, um, makes it through that vetting would then be an amendment to the TSP to add it at that time. So I just wanted to remind you of that sequence, but um, here's Mark to give you a little bit more about what it is. So thanks, Eric. I'm Mark Raggett. I'm in the Urban Design Studio at the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. I know several of you guys here. I think some of you have actually already heard about the Green Loop. This has been at the Planning and Sustainability Commission before, most notably with the Central City 2035 concept plan and most recently with West Quadrant plan. So it's actually been here before. You guys have talked a little bit about it already. 
Um, I did want to say that as far as the comp plan is concerned, the Green Loop is actually maybe could nest within the mothership idea of the city greenways, which again, I think has also been here at the um, uh, Planning Sustainability Commission as well. So, um, and I just, like Eric said, I just have a few slides and the Green Loop again, is it's a big idea concept for the central city. It's about public space, it's about health, and it's about a lot of people kind of who are here in the central city now, who are in the city of Portland today, and sort of a lot of people who are coming to Portland and the central city and how to make the central city a more comfortable place for more people more of the time. So we know that Central City is attractive to lots of, or it's a comfortable place for lots of people to kind of walk, ride, and jog into, but we know that there's a lot of people out there who are not very comfortable, sort of eight to 80 year olds, using the Central City and kind of accessing a sort of wide range of amenities that we're not gonna put in other parts of the city. So how can we make the Central City more attractive to more people more of the time? And again, how can we kind of create a linear, kind of maybe iconic open space, a place, again, li like Central Park even, a place that people would remember when they think about Portland all the time, a linear open space that's kind of fun for everyone just in its own right. We would just go down there just to take a bike ride, take a jog, take a walk, maybe go see a movie, something like that. It's sort of based on, we have pieces of the Green Loop already in a smaller scale around the river already today. We have some riverfront trails. We have a loop that like Green Loop, there's a steel bridge at the top and the Hawthorne to the south. The concept sort of again proposes a cons adding a concentric ring and a series sort of, of safe and clear east-west connections. We know that people don't want to just circulate endlessly around a loop, but we need to kind of connect <laughs> this loop. This loop would be a great north-south sort of connection and sort of build on a lot of amenities and existing pieces of infrastructure, but we know that we need to kind of think about east-west movement and accessing the bridges and accessing both sides of the river. You just heard a lot about the southeast quadrant, and you'll hear more about that in the next couple months. And think about it more, more largely as a way to organize the next generations of central city development. Again, we've had the transit mall has been a big success, and, and again, as far as transit and streetcar go, we've probably put in the sort of major loop components or major pieces of those pieces of infrastructure. And now we're kind of, the time is probably right for thinking about public open space, walking, jogging, and biking in this green loop could be that signature iconic piece of infrastructure. And again, I think you guys have seen this graphic before, those yellow boxes, and don't look too closely at any and all of them, but those yellow boxes basically represent the growth potential for the central city. And that's not a 25 year horizon, that's sort of forever, I'll keep going, but just the, the main message here is there's a long way to grow. The green loop could provide that organizing framework around which to do it. This is just a quick, neat little rendering, an artist rendering uh, that we did just to give you a sense of kind of what some of the key pieces are. And again, what you see to the left, if we go left to right, is a physically separated bike lane that again is comfortable to kind of the 8 to 80 year old pop population. You see some 8 to 80 year olds there in the middle there, comfortable in our pedestrian <laughs> environment. Improved, thank you, Howard. You know, and then again, to the right is maybe, there you go, no, that's not quite Howard. Um, on the right. <laughs> Who is she? Um, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Turn your mic off. So the, um, to the right, again, there's a lot of interest in health. And maybe this is the view looking south of the North Park blocks. But thinking about maybe there's a way to, again, add in a jogging trail or make those parks a little more multifunctional and maybe add some open space where you don't, where you don't have it already. I would say that, again, the caption for this image typically is this. Imagine that this could be like Sunday parkways every day. So not necessarily Sunday parkways. We're not closing all the streets off. There'll still be vehicular access. You can see in the background there, there'll still be access, motor vehicle access, parking, et cetera. But that maybe if we grab some portions of these streets, we could add a lot of that feeling, that character that gets so many people out for the Sunday parkways events every year. Like all good planning projects, urban design projects, we have a lot of good broad objectives. So here, here they are. Health again, how can we make it um, easier to kind of walk, bike, take a jog, improving citywide health objectives. And someone named Laura Lillard had a good quote for me recently, which was, sitting is the new smoking, which I don't, I think is a little <laughs> steep, but you know, I think that's kind of an image we have now, right? That everyone's standing at work and sort of how do we get more people? So just sit and smoke. That's right, yeah. I know, <laughs> it's all over, it's all over, start over. So how can we get out, provide more healthy alternatives more quickly to more, to more people? Parks, you know, I think is self-explanatory. Portland has a long history of some beautiful park systems, connected, connected park systems, most notably the park blocks, the Pearl District Parks, this is the Halpern sequence. Again, how can we connect those more, more deliberately, like we've called to do like for many years, haven't quite done yet. And maybe on the central east side, like you just saw, there may be opportunities to create new ones where we don't have a lot. How can we create more open space opportunities where we don't? Businesses, definitely. How do we support businesses? There's a, there's a, a lot of growing interest in, I think, taking that market that right now is hugging the river, giving them a clear and safe way to get deeper into the central city, which is where we frankly have a lot of our business districts and a lot of the, our big attractions, the art museum, PNCA, PSU, 
some hopeful big future in the, on the United States Postal Service side, on the east side, the convention center, et cetera. How can we connect more people to those attractions and business districts? Definitely is a big idea. We think that this would also work well with the future Portland bike share program, that if we had a, a system around which this, this um, the bike share system network could sort of operate on and offer clear wayfinding for people using the city, I think this would work pretty well to connect those people to destinations throughout the city, the central city. Pathways, again, Portland is known as a signature walking city. This would sort of create an urban trail system that would again tie the central city more directly to Twilliger Parkway, as well as the 40 mile trail loop system. And riding, this is a big one. This would be probably the most notable physical change in, in the sort of streetscape. Um, the orange bar, I don't know if you can see it there, is the so-called interested but concerned group. Portland has been doing a great job and needs to keep doing more on the bicycle commuters. But what we're looking at and targeting, if we wanna reach our Portland plan, 25% work commute mode trips, we need to tap into this, this group that's interested but concerned and looking for a safe, direct, and clear system of riding, especially in the central city. So this, this system is additive. It does not remove and replace the commuter network, but it adds to it and offers people more choices. And then growing green, of course, we're Portland. How can we sort of think about this as an iconic symbol and a living laboratory of sort of low carbon development, commitments to kind of local responsiveness to, and global climate change. Again, also increasing tree canopy throughout it, the alignment and its east-west connections. Think about habitat enhancement and also stormwater management visible on sort of on, maybe on the ground in the streetscape as well as on the sides of buildings and on top of them. This, the, the caption for this slide is basically it's one concept but it takes many forms. You just heard a lot about Central East Side. Central East Side, we are not proposing the park blocks, although we may use the park blocks on the west side of the river. We're not proposing to build a new system of park blocks on the Central East Side. There will have to be a lot of sensitive discussions with those property owners and those businesses over there about how to integrate the system, which we think we can do, frankly, with a lot of busy tr trucking routes, freight routes, and sort of other types of access points and modes using that district. But this is just to say that we have a lot of the system, perhaps, or a lot of the big pieces on the west side of the river, but we know we have a long way to go, and we know that the Central City offers a lot of districts and a lot of different experiences. It's also an opportunity to show off a lot of local character, businesses, techniques, and even street furniture or places to sit or works of art, et cetera, as one moves around the Central City. Feel free, by the way, to chime in. Go ahead. Well, we have, we have rough alignments I could give you on the west side there. What's underneath that colorful little band is the, the park block chain. So Howard, so we're looking, the park blocks are kind of set up pretty well to kind of offer a lot of this amenity already. We've had long standing plans. Uh, no, you know, par the park, park in Ninth Avenue, in, in the park blocks, Howard. Yeah. Point here. This is, this is, yeah, this is PSU down here, Howard. PSU is here. This is, you know, Park and Ninth Avenue through Midtown, which is pretty tight, and then North Park blocks here. Maybe a new connection via the Postal Service site, or maybe we just improve the existing on the Broadway Bridge. This is roughly Clackamas. If you guys will recall the North Northeast Quadrant plan, there was a pedestrian bike bridge called for with the ODOT improvement, right? That would go over. So this is building on that. Through Lloyd, roughly 6th or 7th, we don't know exactly here, Howard. And then tying into a TSP project, this is the, uh, the Banfield, the I-84 pedestrian bike crossing here between Central East Side and Lloyd. So line up, this lines up roughly with 7th, 8th Avenues. And then Central East Side, we're kind of looking at 6th, 6th Avenue, maybe 7th, maybe a little piece of 8th up here. We don't know exactly. And again, the future specific alignment is, will be the subject of future conversations. And this is tying into the Clinton to the River alignment and the new Tillicum crossing here. And this is a, this is, there's a few different ways to move between South Waterfront and PSU campus up there. Springwater's down here. Yeah, here comes Springwater in this way, here. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And a series of east west connections. These are, most of these are designated bike boulevards or neighborhood greenways today. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to get through this so Eric can get to the, the main meat of the conversation. We're not the only city doing this. And frankly, here's a, here's, here are four examples Chicago and Vancouver to the left. Those could be near term, you know, you know, relatively less expensive ways to kind of reclaim some street space. I mean, put this in quickly. In uh, New York City and Indianapolis to the right represent uh, bigger investments. In, and I'll just draw your attention to Indianapolis at the top. The top right there, they have a cultural trail, which again is, we're looking at as sort of our primary precedent for, the, for this type of thing. It's been very successful. It was actually so successful, it was seen as a legacy project and generated almost half of its funding from the private sector. So people sort of, and again, with, with one, one, uh, one family giving uh, $15 million. So um, we think that, again, with Portland, we think we have the potential to consider that as well so that we're not overburdening PBOT or public resources to do the entirety of this loop project. We will need to look to public resources to fund some of this, but we think that if it's a big enough idea, if it's bold enough, that we could get to some alternative funding sources. And here's Kat with a good thought. <laughs> what do you mean by legacy trust? 
Well, I think, you know, like a legacy project. So if it's a big enough, bold enough idea that people find it very compelling, it could last for 100, like, 150 like years. Like a brick and a square? Like planning for a square, right. Something like that. <laughs> Along those lines. Yeah, yeah. So, so that, that ours has a little more grain than Indianapolis. Yes, and, and I knew Mike was going to go there. This is not, Indianapolis has a few more flavors of this trail. This is one that happens to go by some stores and a little That's more hardscape. Like That's right. <laughs> No, yeah. <laughs> That's right. This is, um, and so my, my last slide here is just this rough timeline. I'm going back and forth. I apologize. The timeline is a lot closer to truth as we go more to the left and a lot more ambitious, and I'll just say optimistic <laughs> as we go to the right. So we're, we're in right now, the phase we're in is a, a concept refinement phase. So again, you guys have heard and you will hear more about the Green Loop um, in May, late May, as you get closer to the Southeast Quadrant Plan and you're hearing. We're sort of in a concept refinement phase where we are working with our public agency partners, most notably the Bureau of Transportation, Portland Parks and Recreation, and Bureau of Environmental Services, looking at, the, at our alignments and identifying issues and identifying challenges and things to overcome with those as we kind of try and narrow the alignments down a little bit closer, how we can do that. We have also begun a lot of engagement with the community. We've talked to a wide range of different community groups, Portland uh, PNCA, the Intertwine, the AIA Urban Design Panel, um, a series of landscape architecture firms, city repair and better blocks. We might be able to find a way to tie this into some experimental or temporary types of projects to get people thinking about public space differently and the way streets could be configured or used. Um, and we also have plans to kind of speak to the, the uh, ASLA is interested in having a speak at the conference about the concept and sort of how it might move forward. We also are having some research done. I want to flag by the, uh, the PSU Research Center, uh, the Institute for Sustainable Solutions. They already started work on a cost-benefit analysis, looking at the benefit of a, a facility like this, in, uh, the trade-off being probably on-street parking and travel lanes. So this type of facility to, to really work is not just something we're going to be able to find low-hanging fruit sort of opportunities for. So we are going to have to talk about trade-offs. Portland has lots of narrow streets. But we think we can prioritize some streets for some modes and others for others. And we think this could work pretty well moving ahead. We also have a lot of interest, and I think we're going to get with ISS on a research project that will look at the equity of this. And again, how can making this facility work well, not just how the central city and the neighborhoods just adjacent to it, but also the broader community. So what do we need to think about in terms of its design and its character that will attract people in East Portland, people in North Portland, people in outer Southwest? How can we get them in here and make them feel comfortable in the central city? Um, and I want to say, just in closing, that you will hear more about this pros and cons, but I think a lot of kind of growing excitement, especially in the Central East Side, when that is back at your hearing in late May, later this month. And I will flag that my date is incorrect. Trey, I would definitely defer to Troy's date. I think he said the 26th. Mine says the 28th, so don't look too closely at that. Mike. So yeah, quickly, the last 10 years, we've had what we call the policymakers ride. Chris has been on all of them. I don't know how many other folks have ridden on them, but uh, um, this year, I was just talking to Jonathan Nicholas in Cycle Oregon yesterday, and we decided we, we want to focus the ride on the Green Loop this year and some of the work that uh, that Roger is doing on Broadway or whatever. At any rate, so that's just a heads up. We don't have a date yet, but I just thought it would be really timely. Um, not for the PSC, obviously. We'll have already had our hearing, but perhaps for City Council, given that it's a policymaker's ride, and we might engage a few more folks. So you will be getting invites. Okay. And I've already talked to Sally. Yeah, and she's already talked to me. So okay, thank you. Great. Yeah. So we need uh, to. Yes. Yeah. Yep. I, oh, I need so to go up. You've already probably had discussions with other people who had this big, bright idea. But um, w when we've talked about the Green Loop before in the West Quadrant, yep. um, in my mind, I was just always thinking more bikes than pedestrians. Yet your slide, yep. you know, you talked about it's as much about pedestrians as it is bikes, yep. potentially. Yep. And if so, then my, my head... This is where the light bulb went off. I started thinking about the whole walk in Boston yeah. and just how to make, you know, obviously some tie of whatever it is. Obviously, we're not going to do what Boston did exactly, but just that it makes it more interesting for visitors and pedestrians, not just bikes getting to and from. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I think we also heard, Kat, in that regard was I think the green loop, the big loop is sort of there's a lot of growing interest in that from a lot of different groups. There's also probably a series of mini loops that could be walks or bikes. Mm -hmm. or like already cool. Old Town Chinatown is interested in a little cultural historic loop now uh, of their own. And I know that Mike, in talking to Parks and Mike Abate is also very excited about this. He's interested in some smaller loops around the Pearl District waterfront, Centennial Mills, and new sort of opportunities there and new connections. So I think there's a lot of potential for all that. And we're early, so we have a long way, right. long way to go. Cool. Exciting. Thanks. Yep. Teresa? So you mentioned street furniture. And yep. have you ever heard of the Stadt Lounge in St. Gallen, Switzerland? 
It's uh, the coolest street furniture. It's kind of an art and street furniture anyway. They put a lot of big oversized concrete stuff, but they covered it with this red rubber. And it comes oh. all the way out in the city. It's very iconic and really pedestrian and fun friendly. Huh. Cool. I hadn't heard of that. So uh, just to circle back to the beginning of this, the, the reason we put that little update on the agenda was because it's it's not in the TSP proposal as a project right now, but and so we just want to verify that is the direction we're, we're recommending that you hold off until the Central City Plan to, to really dig into this. Um, so that's, the, that's really the question before you. Um, if there are no other questions on that topic, we'll move into the rest of the Transportation System Plan work. Are we okay with the direction that they're proposing? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Thanks. Um, so the other topics related to transportation system plan, um, on the screen we've highlighted two of them, the follow-up on the streetcar conversation and also responding to the Southwest neighborhood comments on projects. And those were two items we knew we had to follow up on based on testimony and previous discussion. Um, we also sent out a copy of the back and forth that went on between PBOT and DPS on the TSP. It was the planner's comments to transportation, essentially. Um, so you have that. Um, so we'll start by talking about the streetcar and the Southwest projects, but the rest, the, the next half hour or so, we want to cover whatever else you want to cover in questions about the TSP that we haven't yet resolved. Um, and I know that some of you have a couple other things that you'll, you'll bring up. So that, this is the time for that. And I'm going to cede the mic to Peter now. Good afternoon, commissioners. I'm Peter Hurley with the Bureau of Transportation. Uh, today I'll just be talking about a couple of items, a brief update on the uh, streetcar recommendations and uh, what we are evaluating now with regard to Southwest Portland projects. This is in the context of a series of revised recommendations that we'll be sending to you at the end of the month, beginning of May. That's what you would have an opportunity to consider as part of your uh, decision on June 9th. So uh, with these topics, with regard to the uh, streetcar, the Portland Streetcar Inc. Board and Citizens Advisory Committee created a subcommittee. They took a look at the recommended the, uh, potential projects and studies for streetcar. Uh, they sent you a letter, a recommendation back in December. Uh, we had conversations with them during that process and we're supporting those recommendations which uh, boiling them down into their simplest form are recommending a uh, John's Landing project on the constrained, which is the, uh, the constrained list is the one that we think that we can afford in the next 20 years. Uh, we feel that that project not only has had more extensive vetting, there's also been some analysis by the analysis by the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability that would indicate that there is an opportunity, at least a reasonable opportunity for a project like that perhaps to change the type of development along the corridor and therefore further justified support for that type of investment along the corridor. Uh, there are a number of other potential extensions. Uh, most of them have not had the level of analysis that uh, we feel at this point in time uh, would be necessary to turn them into a real project that could be evaluated and determined whether or not to include within the transportation system plan. We do feel though that there are a number of corridors where we are going to need to enhance transit capacity, where it's likely that existing frequent transit service is not going to be sufficient to capture the mode share that we'll need uh, and to, in order to make the streets work and to achieve our targets. So we're proposing to create an enhanced transit capacity plan. We'd be working with the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability and TriMet. This gets back to the letter of intent that you saw at a previous work session. Our intent is to uh, take a look at various corridors that might need additional transit capacity and determine what are the appropriate technologies, what type of uh, modifications would we need to make in those corridors in order to support the level of transit 
that we need there. And we're seeking funding now from the city council for that plan. And it looks like a couple of you might have questions. So I'd be happy to pause now and see if uh, there are questions or comments. Peter, uh, in the Johns Landing situation, how far south would that extend? We'll limit park. Okay, to the park. Thank you. To the park? I don't know exactly where the, uh, the terminus would be in that vicinity. Well, I was just to the north end. Uh, no, I was just revisiting all of the potential impacts on on Willamette Park, on uh, um, Stevens Creek, et cetera, et cetera. And you will remember we had quite a conversation about that. And this commission requested that the mayor convey to, to Metro that they were not giving serious attention to those impacts. So I just throw that out there. It's, it's still out there as an issue. Chris? So obviously I have some history in how we get these things done. Um, it seems to me that to pull off the next project, we have to do a number of things. I think um, McAdam will not stand on its own. It's going to have to link to one of the east side potential corridors, I would say, probably in the set of uh, Sandy, Broadway, or MLK um, to create a full project. Um, we're going to need some new funding mechanisms because we don't really have TIF districts uh, for most of where that would go. Um, and I would think that we would not get anywhere without some kind of uh, value capture mechanism um, that would help pull this off. Uh, and I know that there will be many people around this table who would want to answer the question of, you know, where does the affordable housing come in uh, without TIF set aside to support that? Um, so it seems to me that an effort akin to the one that we had to design the east side streetcar is probably called for to look at, you know, various options and uh, build consensus around a preferred one and, and the mechanisms needed to, to pull it together. I mean, for the east side, we, we help create a whole federal funding category uh, as a part of the project of, of getting that done. So, I mean, the, the motivation and will to pull off a big, you know, big planning exercise and, and community consensus building exercise that probably exists in the community. Um, but it seems like we ought to identify that corridor study as a specific project to pull all that together. Is that a reasonable thing to ask for? It was part of the uh, regional, it is part of the regional transportation plan, and we have identified additional funds for that much deeper analysis. Uh, the intent is to, to look uh, broadly at first mm -hmm. and identify w which are the corridors that are most appropriate for that deeper analysis. Mm -hmm. I guess I would add one other, one other um, piece of history over the last year is, uh, as Chris is aware of this, being on the, the advisory committee, um, but um, Bureau of Planning and Sustainability took on a review of the entire streetcar system plan um, as of last year um, in an attempt to narrow down to what are the most likely candidate corridors for this discussion of, of I hesitate to say near term because in this context near term is 20 years, um, but uh -huh. um, medium term sort of um, what would happen to streetcar after the, the current loop. and. Um, from that analysis, we ended up with a list of, of you know, four to six uh -huh. things that you might want to look deeper on. Um, McAdam being one of them, um, the Conway question came up, um, Sandy, uh, MLK going north. Um, there have been a variety of opinions about Broadway and whether that would work or not. Um, so that was kind of the universe. We also looked at whether, again, at East Portland uh, in terms of gateway and and the 82nd in terms of the, whether that would be viable. We landed on sort of the McAdams, Sandy, MLK being the most likely um, midterm sort of things to look at um, from a land use perspective and from a growth management perspective. Um, so, and then where we are now is talking about what is the, what if anything should be put on the, the financially constrained transportation system plan and what should be listed as a study. Right, and I guess what I'm wondering is, does it make sense to list McAdam on the constraint plan without pairing it with a, with the study to determine which east side component to partner it with? Um, it, it just, it, it seems to me that the projects we're identifying in the TSP and the way they're spread across the funding categories does not map to 
the reality of the planning and consensus building exercise we will have to go through. And I'm wondering how we make that alignment clear. And I'll just add to that comment that, you know, I, I like the enhanced transit capacity plan idea. I think there is a distinct difference between the lines where we want to use transit as an opportunity to change the development pattern, as we typically do with streetcar, versus the ones that are about you know, primarily enhancing the mobility that we're providing in the quarter without the expectation that the development pattern is going to change. And we should acknowledge those two different categories within that. And it's one of the reasons why uh, we felt comfortable with the uh, McAdam Johns Landing project putting that on the constrained list because there, w there were both of those benefits. Uh -huh. uh, without additional study, we're not ready to determine which of those, if, if either of those, would be appropriate for the additional lines. But we agree that uh, we definitely need to take, take a look at some of the east side and northwest extensions, and that would be part of uh, a part of our refinement plan and study list. Right. It just seems odd to me to put that in the, the sooner category by itself, because um, it's not going to be built as nicely a unit. It's going to have to be part of that bigger discussion. Joe? Yeah, I just wanted to um, um, agree with what Chris is saying. Uh, and I hadn't thought of it until you put it in those terms, Chris. Um, it's important. It's based on what we've all been through in this comp plan and in the Portland plan to think about equitable distribution of our major transportation transit investments and responding to our equity agenda. And the way our TSP is structured with a category of studies and a category of projects uh, makes sense, but it doesn't really tie the two together explicitly. Uh, and practically and politically, I think Chris is right that uh, it's hard to believe that um, they uh, would be separated uh, given how you're going to have to fund them. But uh, it would be really uh, heartening to see a more explicit sort of embrace that, yeah, whatever, this one may be, we have some engineering on the McAdam one, but we also have a serious commitment to find another corridor uh, that meets these other objectives too. And it's as high priority as the one that we've already studied and has uh, some low hanging fruit. Um, just today, in a different context, I was talking about uh, with uh, other bureaus about affordable housing and how uh, uh, we deliver that or what our expectations for that should be with our major transit uh, investments uh, and what we learned from interstate and what we didn't. And to a certain extent, this housing piece is like an externality. Like we know the major investment's going to have an impact. And we know that we need to get ahead of it. That was even the plan on interstate. But when it came to funding it, we sort of ran out and didn't get there. So part of uh, walking the walk of the uh, what we've been uh, arguing for here over the last few years, honestly, is to pull that objective, that externality of like doing something in advance to maybe set up uh, affordable housing or to mitigate some of these impacts into the project cost. Uh, um, seems to be a direction that we kind of got to go. I don't know how it plays out in this TSP recommendation, but I'd love to see it more strongly linked. And, and, oh, go ahead. Yeah, Joe, I'm glad you brought up interstate because there was a huge push on the part of the Coalition for Livable Future to have a, it was a displacement racial impact statement. And I brought that up um, when Alan Hippolito was here before us uh, a couple times ago. And I'm, I, it sounds like you do have some data on, on how successful that was or wasn't. Is, do, we, do we know what came out of that process? You know, the, Mike, I, I don't. Uh, um, um, so, but with something we could find out. Um, but yeah. So um, I think Chris has phrased it well, and so has Joe, is there seems to be, to me, a link between Macadam equity and the enhanced transit, there is, you know, it, that streetcar may, may not be the right tool for the development changes that we want in East County, but enhanced transit certainly may be the tool, but we don't, we can't do those two things in a silo and make the investments in a silo because we end up with this dramatically inequitable city in our future, near, and I'm going to say midterm or near-term 20 years. 
And so we have to, I think the TSB somehow has to acknowledge and put together that funding of the study so that we understand what, what the investments are to get that transit enhancement if that's the right tool for what we want to see relative to housing and even commercial development in some of these communities in East Portland and other places and with the change in development along McAdam or somewhere. And understanding those investments at the same time is critical to making, I think, good political decisions um, versus being faced with one decision of McAdam. And so I think the TSP, the letter is, is that starting point, but I think there needs to be more explicit tying to address that equity question as an investment strategy down the road. So it's that study, what Chris talked about, but also the reality of a constrained list. And I think the, uh, the Rick, there is strong recognition within both of the bureaus and TriMet on the importance of not only the investments that we have, the 20-year investments that we've identified that many, many of which are access to transit, safe access to transit, uh, and working with TriMet to take a look at what are the corridors that they're planning as part of their service enhancement plans, are we matching our investments to those? but then laying the foundation through the letter of intent for that next generation of planning that much more closely looks at how are we going to provide the transit service to accommodate the growth and provide the various operational and access to transit improvements that will make it work significantly better. So what, what I'm hearing, Andre, um, just if I can echo back um, and see if I'm saying it right, is that um, I'm hearing at two levels. At the, at the highest level, there is a concern that um, we not proceed with the next streetcar line until we're sure we have certainty of funding for the far east Portland transit improvements that we've discussed. So that's number one. Um, yeah. And, and certainty not of fun, only of funding, but con con new ongoing frequent service mm -hmm. improvements. Um, and then number two is that we need to um, pair the presence of that macadam line on the constrained list with certainty that there will be identification of options for the east side of Portland on that same time frame, that we're not going to go ahead with a, another west side streetcar without knowing what's next on the east side of the river. Well, it's really the study, because that study is going to identify what are the next, what are the next transit improvements and what's the next tool. And right now, the study is a, a lower priority, I guess, than a constrained list. And I'm just saying, you know, we, we not only need to make the investments that we talk about, but if you're looking down the future, what well, we have to study, we just can't study streetcar corridors and say, here's the list and here's the investment list next without studying transit for the rest of the city. So it's combination, doing both at the same time and then making a decision from both those studies. Is, is that accurate, Chris, or is that my, yeah. Does that make sense? It does, and I think that is the intent of the, uh, the partnership between the three, bu the two bureaus and TriMet is to, to look comprehensively and at the range of technologies at the corridors that need significantly enhanced transit capacity, regardless of the mode, through an equity lens, through a climate lens, through a centers and corridors lens. Great. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate it. We're good. Okay. We also wanted to talk about uh, Southwest Portland project issues. Uh, there was extensive both oral testimony and written testimony about Southwest uh, Portland projects. And I'm going to cover uh, First, what are some of the issues? Why, why is this coming back uh, in front of you? What we heard and what type of analysis we're in the midst of doing that will lead to some recommendations at the end of the month, beginning of, of May. So as you're probably aware, there are very high project costs in many parts, not all, but many parts of Southwest. They have to do with the fact that the system itself has many gaps and deficiencies, principally in the bicycle pedestrian 
uh, networks and in crossings. The uh, crossing frequencies are lower there and in East Portland than in other parts of the city. There's also uh, issues with soils and stormwater that drive up the cost of projects. There's both uh, low permeability of the soils and a relative paucity of stormwater infrastructure on the ground. There are also a number of places where there are uh, topographic uh, concerns, either uh, hillsides, streams, uh, other uh, environmental constraints that drive up the cost of, of projects. Add to that uh, the fact that there are uh, fewer centers and less projected growth in Southwest, and it does create for a create a uh, somewhat complex uh, planning picture, transportation and land use planning picture. And in fact, we are proposing one of the studies that's uh, a very near-term study is Southwest in Motion Swim, uh, similar to what we did in East Portland with East Portland in Motion, taking a look at uh, Southwest and identifying how are we going to fill the gaps, uh, how are we going to be able to give people safe, safe access to destinations. Do the residents in the Southwest want fewer centers because centers have more intensity and more density? Is that the, motivi is that the motivating factor here? Um, I wouldn't say that it's, that it's a consistent um, feeling that there should be less density and fewer centers in Southwest. There's different views in different areas. I know that there's um, strong support for the center in Hillsdale Yes. And the areas around that, um, there's been a questioning of the center status in Multnomah. So it's, right. it's not uniform. Okay. Thank you. And there clearly are centers where we've identified a number of projects that we, we want to improve access to the destinations in those centers. So if they're not centers, can they still get the improvements for access? Yes. And certainly, uh, for example, safety is a very high priority Good. for us. And we've identified a number of projects that are in areas where there, there isn't a specific destination, but there's very uh, strong needs for crossings, there's for example. So there's deficiencies uh, safety related. Great, thanks. So one of the things that we heard is uh, very strong support from the uh, community for a connected network of both walking and bicycling routes, uh, trails and on-street facilities. Uh, we also heard from a number of people that uh, several of the projects are too expensive to be competitive, a conclusion that we had come to as well, uh, competitive for grants. Uh, and that at least in some cases, that interim improvements, partial improvements may be appropriate if it's a choice between a project that's too expensive to be competitive for funding and, for example, placing a sidewalk on one side or creating enhanced shoulders there's a preference among some people, and I'd say that this is not universal, uh, but we did hear from a number of uh, uh, folks, both verbally and in writing, that there was support for those types of interim improvements. And I'll show you an example of one of those that's already in place. And also uh, prioritizing those connections from neighborhoods to those destinations, whether those are commercial centers, parks, schools, other types of destinations. So we're in the midst of evaluating uh, several different approaches, one of which is segmenting, uh, another of which is rescoping. I'll talk a bit about a proposed new program, the Alternative Street Design Citywide Program, and also in a couple of cases we've identified potential new projects to add to the transportation system plan. In some cases, yes. Those were suggestions. We received specific suggestions uh, from Southwest Trails and from other individuals for where those types of facilities may be appropriate. Is it adequate or is it better than existing conditions? <laughs> I think what, uh, what we'd certainly want to do is, a, and part of the reason that uh, uh, we're going through this process is to evaluate where such treatments are appropriate and actually would create safer uh, safer conditions that give people better access to destinations. Seems to me a good example would be Terwilliger, where there's a coexistence of walkers and bikers, and it works pretty well on the uphill go. 
Also, is Twilliger part of the green loop? No, no it's outside no. that. Twilliger going up to Oasis? It connects in. Oh. But it connects into the loop. Yeah. yeah. But the core complaint in Southwest that I think I understand is that the solutions to the problems that have been mapped out so far are, are so expensive, they will only happen in you know the distant future, and they're looking for less expensive, practical ways to make improvements now. Is that correct? It is, and uh, this is it's not not just in Southwest, but Southwest there's a higher density of these types of issues. There are also issues in Southeast, Northeast, North Portland, elsewhere that we will we intend to address in similar ways. So segmenting, here's an example. You heard uh, fairly significant testimony from uh, a number of people about Southwest Hamilton and about uh, Southwest Shattuck. One of the things we're looking at, uh, we're not ready to propose this at this point in time, but we're taking a close look at, would it make sense to segment that project? As, as a whole project, it is very expensive and probably not, uh, competitive, not uh, particularly competitive for grant funding. If we were to segment it and look at which of the segments might serve more people, might reduce uh, the likelihood of fatalities and sin serious injuries, is that a strategy which could make the improvements more likely to occur in the next five, 10, hopefully five or 10 years, not 20 years? So segmenting is one of those strategies that we're taking a look at for a number of projects. Another one is rescoping, and you can see this is an example where you have a uphill bike lane, uh, climbing lane, and a sidewalk uh, on the, the right side of the, uh, the image there. Uh, where might that be appropriate? Where might it not be appropriate? It's, not, it's very much context sensitive. A third approach and something that we are proposing citywide is to, take a, to create a new citywide program, a tent citywide program called Alternative Street Design. We would take a, take a look at where is it appropriate for enhanced shoulders, creating a space that uh, could be safer both for pedestrians and bicyclists. Uh, where could we work with the Bureau of Environmental Services to make improvements both to the transportation system and the stormwater system in a relatively cost-effective way? That's been one of the barriers. And you heard from a BES representative at one of your work sessions about how uh, PBOT and BES are working together to identify these types of improvements that are likely to at least give people greater mobility in the short term. And then the, uh, the fourth category that we're looking at are where might there be new projects that uh, might be more appropriate. This is, for example, uh, Southwest Hume, Southwest 30th and 31st. Uh, there were suggestions that this might be a more appropriate connection to destinations than the project that we had in the TSP, which connected to Barber, but really didn't connect destinations very well. So this may be one where we would recommend substituting this project for an existing project on the TSP. So those are the four types of evaluations we're doing. We are looking forward to both sending you revised recommendations and meeting with uh, the Southwest community and uh, giving them an opportunity to give us feedback on some potential some draft recommendations. Questions? No, I think we'll do this. So we're doing the, uh, we'll be sending you revised recommendations uh, by the end of the month. Uh, there will be extensive ongoing work because there's only a certain amount of evaluation you can do in a few weeks, but enough to be able to say, here are the projects that we feel are appropriate for rescoping, for segmenting, for perhaps substituting one for another. We're also likely to identify others which are going to require more work that are appropriate for that Southwestern Motion study that, uh, that I mentioned previously, the SWIM study. So some of this we'll see in this project list and some of it we'll see in the 2018? Correct. Update. Yeah, you start out uh, discussing constraints, environmental constraints and so forth, and one of the ways some folks advocate for less expensive trails, um, recreational facilities is to uh, 
basically not worry about the environmental impacts that they might have. So I'm assuming on all these projects, you've got BES and parks and folks with some ecological expertise providing input into uh, how those trails may become less expensive to do without sacrificing the stormwater, the, the habitat issues. For a variety of reasons, we're working much more closely with our uh, sister bureaus than I've experienced before, and the, the uh, conversations are uh, very project specific, and the ones I've seen thus far have been very productive. Because we've, we've had some very limited, but some testimony suggesting trails should be taken away from parks and everything ought to be in within PBOT because they are transportation facilities when we know that they serve uh, multiple functions, including recreation, that may not necessarily be related to transportation. So I'm, I'm very pleased to hear um, that that level of cooperation and integration between the bureaus is going on. Other comments? Very good. good, thank you. Um, well, uh, is this the appropriate time to ask about stuff in this memo? Yeah, any, this is the time for that we, we're running behind schedule, but th now is the time to talk about anything else TSP related that you still have on your mind so that, you know, beyond today, Peter's gonna go back and reappear with a proposed updated list. So this is the time. Okay. So, I'm, so I'm gonna go back to my obsession with the CRC. Um, so if I understood the memo, the, the concern about um, arterial access to the island is that you really can't untangle that from the Marine Drive interchange. Is that right? Not quickly and easily. Okay. Not, so, in the, not in the time frame for the TSP revised project list. So I appreciate that, but you know I would be much happier with a Marine Drive interchange island access placeholder project in the TSP than I would be with the whole CRC in the TSP. Is that, you know, is that a viable path? I think there are a number of projects that uh, we're interested in uh, evaluating more closely, including uh, some type of uh, arterial access, transit, there are uh, bicycle and pedestrian, and freight access right. uh, components that we want to take a, uh, take a closer look at. Right. But you know, ODOT, at one point in the CRC process had a pretty elegant design for what they called, I think, off-island access from the Marine Drive interchange. You know, If you wanted to take that off the shelf and put it as a placeholder, I think that's better than having the whole bridge in there. Um, I think it's, it, it, as we, well, we're very interested in being able to evaluate components of the CRC, uh -huh. which makes sense going forward. Uh, because it is a state and regional project that uh, it's important for us to work with our state and regional partners and in part also because of the cost of attempting to deconstruct those projects. Our intent very much is to work with those partners to identify how we might cost and scope the component projects rather than the the full uh -huh. project that uh, currently is in the regional transportation plan. Uh -huh. So putting together uh, a plan that will allow us to do that in a productive way that will, will lead to uh, several smaller projects and support uh, at support from a, a number of other agencies is something we're interested in bringing forth to you. You find very diplomatic ways to say no, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to belabor CRC here, so uh, I, I, I think we get the point. <laughs> uh, Can I make a, just a quick, just quick comment on just CRC? Just real quick, and, and I completely appreciate Chris's opinion on that, but I, I can say for myself I'm not sure I'm supportive of that, so I think it's a discussion, obviously, at some point we're going to have to have as a group, and you probably need to be aware of that. Teresa. Okay, question on a different area. Um, West Hayden Island, you're proposing removal, ports asked for it to stay. What is the process for resolution on that? We're meeting with the port tomorrow afternoon. We'll be talking about uh, various projects in the TSP. Uh, that's likely to be, Hayden Island broadly is uh, one of the topics that we'll be talking about. Uh, ultimately, you'll have to make a determination as to uh, which 
which projects best support the land use that you're going to be recommending to city council. And, and really, your next specific conversation on all of West Hidden Island is um, on April 28th, we're having a, a hearing on the Employment Opportunities Analysis Report. And then on May 12th, there's a work session, which will include a significant component of that work session being trying to close up the, the economic policy mm -hmm. discussion, which includes you know, verifying your direction on Hayden Island again. And so you know, it is really in your court to answer the land use question because the transportation has to serve it. So um, it's, you know, Peter's being diplomatic in terms of, you know, they well meet with the port, <laughs> but it's your decision as to what's in the TSP. So the West Hayden Island, <laughs> West Hayden Island, Columbia River, and, and the transportation plan are all linked, I guess is the bottom line. And so as we make that decision, we start kind of cascading down to make all the other decisions um, from that standpoint. So we'll, 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 it appears, make all those decisions May 12th. Well, you'll, I think that's the, <laughs> that's what I'll talk about at the end of today. There's probably a series of meetings where those yeah. decisions get taken care of and, and starting on May 12th and then into May 26th. So okay. we'll, I'll talk about that later today. Okay, great. Any other? Oh, Mike. Well, yeah, I know, <clears throat> know that you're meeting with the, the port, and it makes sense because they've expressed some concern. I'm just wondering if you're meeting with other stakeholders that may have an interest, interest in it as well. Has anybody else requested? Th they're meeting with the sponsors of the projects, which in this situation, the port and ODOT and TriMet are co-agencies that we're, we're required to coordinate the lists with. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we're meeting with them. Are we good? Great, thank you. Thank you. So um, is, I'm just looking around. Did we lose? Uh, Carol, no, you're still, still here. here. There you so are. We're gonna um, jump so to we'll the... jump to Park Rose design Park question. <laughs> 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 we're, we're not going to take a break, and so we're just going to keep going, and we're going to jump to um, residential density, and we're just going to pick up park rows for Karen, and then we're going to jump back to housing displacement. Okay. Are you ready? So... Um, well, so <laughs> this is one of the um, proposed up designations that we actually included in the consent agenda. So that's that long table we sent to you. Right. But because this is a request from Commissioner Gray, um, I quickly pulled together <laughs> a handout for you so I could talk about it really briefly and isolate this particular request for an up designation. Then following in the agenda later on, you're going to hear a presentation about additional up designations that are all focused in inner southeast. But this is something that um, I did a quick improvised handout for you. I'm sorry, I don't have any slides. But just to remind you, Commissioner Gray had asked us to consider some properties that would be, um, she thought, had potential for some residential densities above what's allowed today. Um, the idea would be uh, to provide more opportunities within Park Rose School District to allow families to remain stable and decrease mobility, which hurts children's education. That's part of the request. So we took a look at three areas that Commissioner Gray asked us to look at, and these are all uh, between 141st and 143rd, and the three locations, kind of the nodes, were at uh, Stark, Burnside, and Gleason. So staff did look at all three of those areas, and we have a recommendation for you to up-designate, as Commissioner Gray requested, from R2 to R1 for one of those areas totaling three and a half acres. So if you look at the <laughs> hand-drawn uh, diagram here, <laughs> if you look at the, the properties in blue, we thought that these properties had the best potential to be up-designated to R1 to allow for some more family-sized housing at a higher density. And the characteristics of that area were that they are all within a half mile radius of the MAC station, the light rail station at 148th and Burnside. Um, and there is a pedestrian crossing for MAX at 141st. 
Um, with development, curbs and sidewalks would be built close to the max pedestrian crossing at 141st, so that's good access for, for any residents in that location. And we did find that in that blue segment, the parcels were predominantly underutilized, so it had the best potential to be redeveloped at a higher density. Um, um, and, and Commissioner Gray had pointed out some development that she thought that you thought was, was the kind of thing you'd like to see here by a particular developer, and we did see that these parcels had the best opportunity to be developed in that way. Um, we did take a look at the other two um, uh, nodes, the one at Gleason and the one at Stark. Stark is to the bottom of your map in the, <laughs> this, sorry, this is so hasty, but the oval got cut off there, but that's the, the note at um, Stark. And what we found in that particular location that made it less suitable for the up designation, some of the parcels that I colored in in the sort of that brownish color with the dots, that's newly proposed mixed use um, to address some non-conforming situations. So conceivably that could be redeveloped for housing based on the mixed use zoning. And the white parcels um, to the east of 142nd that are in that oval have a lot of apartments already built. So what we didn't want to do is redesignate and in turn prompt any displacement of tenants who are already there. And similarly in the northern um, oval up around Gleason, we thought that area was also less suitable for the redevelopment at the R1 because it was outside of the half mile radius of walking radius of the MAC station and um, also had some apartments um, built, but it just because it was a little bit further from transit, we didn't think that R1 was the right designation for that area. So, so in short, our recommendation is to say yes to the redesignation of the blue parcels, totaling three and a half acres, and that would add to the housing supply. Any questions? Karen? Uh, well, first of all, I want to thank you, Deborah, uh, for uh, taking my request seriously. Oh, sure. <laughs> and um, we had seen some great uh, progress being made for affordable housing that was beautifully done um, by, a, um, by the PHB and just mm -hmm. done a, a, a wonderful job. And I, I noticed that they got some more contract money and I'm delighted about that because I think they have the right attitude. And we saw about 27 units come in and right. um, about 30 kids from Somalia um, joined the school district and it was just awesome. And we're, we're super happy to have these newcomers to the United States in our school district. So we have a couple of other areas, uh, including the Park Rose Little League that is looking to sell their Little League spot on Burnside and develop that into affordable housing. Oh, okay. And I think it's in the area you have marked here on Burnside. So I'm just super happy. Great. And so it looks like a, a connection of the stars to be able to uh, do something great for some families uh, for stability and to... <coughs> Stop having them be so mobile. Yeah, great. Glad to hear that. So are we good with the recommendation that's before us? Okay. Yep. Okay. So great. we're going to move on to another agenda item, and then we'll come back with some more up designations. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Karen. So we're going to transition, um, that's actually a good segue into our housing topics, um, and I'm going to invite Tom Armstrong um, up to the table, and um, Joe Zender will also join us on some of the specific topics. Um, so to reorient you, there's a couple different reports that we're going to be touching on over the next hour or so. Um, you should have um, our two most recent memos. There was a memo on setting housing targets as well as a displacement coalition response memo. Both of those went out, I believe, on um, Friday to you. Um, you also should have um, a copy of our February 25th uh, housing staff report because we're gonna be, um, if you recall from February 25th, I know it was a few months ago, um, we're going to be returning to some of the unfinished business from that work session um, and going through a couple sections of that report. So, and I, we're not using a PowerPoint just to avoid confusion. I'll shut this off. Um, we're going to um, use the, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to turn this off here. 
Yeah, I want to minimize it so the screen isn't right. Um, okay, so we're going to use the staff report from February 25th as the main way we're going through it. And yeah, and I'm going to start with the two items that um, Joe is going to address, um, starting with the um, housing targets memo from Friday. Um, and then we will also, um, Joe will also touch on, give you an update on the single family um, development um, zoning project as part of this. Okay. So what I'm going to be um, talking uh, from is this memo uh, titled Targets and Tracking Regulated Affordable Housing. Uh, and the point of this memo was to address the question of the affordable housing target that we want to set in the comprehensive plan. What should that target be? What sort of uh, housing are we talking about, both regulated, you know, housing that's affordable through public subsidy or, and market rate housing, and how should we go about setting that, that target? Uh, currently, in the draft plan, um, the uh, target is for 15% of the city's ho housing stock to be affordable in 2035. Uh, we took that target from the Portland plan. Um, when we adopted the Portland plan, it's interesting uh, I was, uh, that... 10% of the city's housing stock then was uh, affordable uh, from the zero to 80% medium family income level. Um, since that time, we've had a bit of a housing uptick, and so we're down to 7.5% or so of the total housing stock being affordable. So what we're proposing in the comp plan is doubling that proportion. So is that a reasonable, uh, is that a reasonable target to set? Is that attainable target to set? Those are the kind of questions that you all were raising when you first discussed this. Uh, and um, what we like to, what we presented in the memo was some background on what level of housing, affordable housing production we have experienced as a city, uh, which is uh, about 480 units a year over the last decade. Um, what level of affordable housing production would be needed? for us to actually meet over, a over 20 years our 15% our, uh, goal, and that would be approximately 1,000 units per year. So the goal that we're setting, or the target that we're setting, is ambitious in terms of what we've seen the actual production to be. Um, from our population forecast, you may have remembered this from Uma's presentation uh, or, 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 or Tom's uh, when we were talking about housing. We exp the forecast is for about 18% of the households uh, by 2035 to be in this 80% medium. So, so we can see even at a 15% goal, we're not counting on housing, providing housing for that whole cohort, but that's even the way it works today. There's some level of uh, housing that folks are finding in the, pr in the market rate, the private market, uh, that have no uh, housing uh, subsidies attached to them. And the upshot of that is either it's a low-priced unit uh, because of some characteristic of the unit or the location, or people are paying more uh, than uh, they, well, you know, our, our goal would have them pay of their income for housing. So um, the goal we've set is ambitious given our production and resources, not ambitious sort of uh, in, a, in a reasonable ballpark given um, the expected growth in households uh, by income that we expect to see in 2035. And the tack that staff is recommending in this memo is that we use this comprehensive plan to put us on a path that starts to think of housing production and how we're going to track it and uh, set our goals for it uh, the same way we just got done talking about the TSP, which is, you know, our transportation system plan is based on transportation projects and the objectives that, that Peter described we're trying to accomplish uh, between now and 2035, and it has a fiscally constrained list and a list that's not. What we don't have now for our housing programs and the way we think about it is really a, a real solid, we, we, we do a, a consolidated plan uh, um, periodically uh, required by federal agencies for housing uh, that takes it housing, look at housing demand, but um, uh, we don't really have a good uh, understanding of the supply uh, other than supply that's in programs we know about, but the other parts of the supply we don't. Um, and one of the more bedeviling things, and you heard this from the Housing Bureau when they've been here before, uh, that they face is the uncertainty about 
a funding strategy to get anywhere near the goals we're talking about. Um, that 480 units a year that I was saying was what we've been producing over the last 10 years uh, from those uh, housing bureau programs, it's a combination of federal money, uh, eight to 10 million, I believe, and then TIF. And so, so what the Housing Bureau is telling us and PDC is telling us is that there's this steep decline over the next decade in TIF resources and you know that's gonna be felt across the board but really felt in housing. So this idea of, of setting a goal and building back a fiscal plan or a financial plan to try to get us to uh, something approximating that goal seems to be really the path we need to be on and seems to be a reasonable way to use the comprehensive plan to set that. So what we're recommending is having taken, and, and, and today, based on our understanding of a financial forecast or for housing production or uh, really a good underst a nuanced understanding of the private market supply and where it falls in terms of rents and, and income levels, we need to beef up both of those parts of our understanding to be able to have a credible, constrained housing production list like we have at TSB. So we'd like to keep the 15% goal. We'd like to build in a policy direction in the comprehensive plan to shift over our housing forecasts and our housing goal setting to be uh, like the TSP and that that, that uh, becomes part of the comprehensive plan and something that the city is charged to update, you know, um, uh, we could set a period of time, but update over, you know, the next few years. Comments? Howard? Don. Well, I think it's great, Joe. How are we going to hold people to this? We can set goals, but then we come across funding issues or political issues that, or even residential discom discomforts that move things around. How are we going to put in the comp plan and the Portland plan the kind of, I guess, teeth that require other parts of the city or other institutions to make priorities around that 15% goal? Um, I, the teeth, uh, it's a little elusive. Uh, on the housing, you know, the teeth comes from the TSP because of its mandates from uh, the federal level and the state level. We don't really have that same sort of set of mandates here for housing, so we're inventing this one locally for ourselves. Uh, uh, how to give that teeth uh, is, uh, I'm open to anyone who has ideas about that, but I think setting it out in the comp plan like this, I think it's perfectly reasonable, especially as we advocate for this through city council, to set the expectations that this kind of housing strategy and assessment and the use of the comp plan for this would be done uh, is our best shot at that. Well, and another way of saying what Joe just said is the teeth in the transportation system plan comes from the fact that there is federal money being spent. Um, we need, as a step one, I think what Joe is saying is we need a financial plan and the motivation to do a financial plan built into the comp plan so that we can get those teeth. But Eric, might that financial plan include priorities for affordable housing over other projects in the budget? In other words, uh, you might make a case that this should take priority over other money. Um. <laughs> yeah, I think. Oh, now that, you're gonna get Mike on that. Well, I, I think to, to a certain extent, oh, Susan, are you? I was just gonna say that. Um, with limited TIF dollars, um, one of the things we're seeing is more and more needs for the same dollars and trade-offs between housing and other development. And so I think if that's what you're getting at, you do have an opportunity, I think, as part of the comprehensive plan to provide some direction around that. Yeah, it's not unique to housing. I mean, every other area of the city that doesn't have federal money attached to it or some a gun to our head or whatever you want to put it is in the same place. Don, Gary. Uh, just to follow on to, to, to uh, uh, the other questions, I think, um, you know, I agree with having this lo a loftier goal here that, that's somewhat aspirational. And my question moving forward is, does that set us up for creating good ways to motivate the private sector to step up and provide a lot of this housing? Uh, you know, what, what, what's in it for them? What kind of programs can they aspire to apply to their development projects to increase the volume, 
and give us a, a, a step up towards a 15% goal? Um, the, um, uh, I think the, this goal and sort of bring this notion of the um, constrained uh, project list or this kind of financial plan tied to a housing goal is going to create a little pressure at the regional level as well as shine, uh, give us all, part of what, uh, part of what we're seeing in the forecast is that part of the demand for housing in the city is gonna be households who can only pay this much. So either the market's providing that housing some way, or uh, you know we're building um, permanently affordable subsidized units. So uh, there is sort of a market incentive, I guess at least, that this, I mean it is a market opportunity to the extent that you have a piece of property where you can afford to do that. That's typically without subsidy, not a new construction piece of property. And it may really be tur turn out that what's really happening is that households are just paying an, un an untenable amount of, having to pay an untenable amount of their household income to stay in the city. But as a region, um, um, that is a co that's an economic or an income cohort that's growing, and, and we have to provide for, uh, for our own economic success. So I, I think it's a key thing, because uh, the more we can emphasize public-private partnerships, in these these uh, uh, ag aggressive goals, the better. So, thanks. So, do we um, on the unregulated uh, private market side? Do we have any sense for what the performance of the private sector is at present, or we don't really? That that's part of what I was trying to say is we we don't really have that. We ha we we don't have a, uh, a a picture of our housing market. Uh, supply that's useful for the answer that question. It's something that both the Housing Bureau and all of our housing discussions seem to come back around to, a bet, wanting a better understanding of that. But in a, in a general sense, you know, if it's not subsidized and still affordable, it's potentially smaller than average and therefore affordable for that reason, or it's older than average and, and affordable, or um, it is got some other characteristics that leads it to be less popular, or in some cases, it's just time. It could be affordable to the person who owns it now because they paid their mortgage off 20 years ago, but when it turns over, it's not going to be affordable. So there's, there's all those dimensions, and we don't have a way to untangle all that yet. So general comment in terms of funding. I know the FTA funding for capital transit improvement projects supports transit-oriented development. And that part of the way you sell it to the feds is you say that this project is going to increase ridership. And I know the draft climate action plan talks about lower income people use transit more. And I would assume that when you go through the environmental impact um, process, part of what you're going to see is the displacement stuff we've been hearing about. So it sounds like you could craft something where when you're getting these transit capital improvement pro programs coming through, you build into it part of the affordable housing, just being part of it going through the budget, and the feds are contributing dollars to it effectively. Yeah, that, that's actually uh, the focus of a lot of discussion right now. Um, the PAL, B Bus Rapid Transit Project, how do you get ahead of and do some house, affordable housing preservation, although with Bus Rapid Transit, we don't, it's new. We don't know what kind of impacts. Barber Corridor, Southwest Corridor, you know, the good news on that one is we have a little bit of time uh, because it's a bigger project, but getting, getting ahead of the game through land banking or some means to uh, have the ability to um, have a supply of affordable housing um, before land values go up along the corridor uh, so that those households also get the benefit of a transit-rich location. That really is the thinking these days. Um, the dollars haven't you know, how to finance it hasn't materialized, but that's the thinking, and that's a little bit what I was saying earlier about we may be entering an era where if you're gonna go out and finance a big train, uh, we're also financing some housing. Right, so well, I think- It's an externality that gets brought along with the project, but we haven't got there yet, but that's the direction that that's pointing I us. think the way it's set up right now, TriMet can sell the property at a lower cost. And so that's how they save money. And just a general comment on how people deal with affordability. I think a lot of young people, you just put more people 
you don't rent an apartment, you rent a house, and then you just have more people in the bedrooms. And I don't know how that gets figured into what we're talking about, how much people are paying and how much affordable stock there is. I think that's why the focus is on find the percentage that you're going to try to build into permanently affordable housing, because that you know is you know what it is, and you know the households that you're, you're whose needs you're meeting, and the rest is out there, but uh, we don't really know. Well, I like the approach. I like the approach, and you know, in the park arena, Parks Vision 2020, the the regional master plan, they're all they're all aspirational. We know damn well. We are not going to get there. The trail, the regional trail plan, bi-state regional trail plan, at the current rate of investment, we're looking at 190 years. But it's still there. We've got it. Um, it inspires people to try to figure out how the hell we're going to fund it. And I think that's just as important for housing. And we need to be aspirational and recognize there are, there are funding realities out there we're going to have to deal with. Well, the concept of land banking is interesting, and you need money to do that. And I'm wondering about other institutions, uh, the housing, uh, Home Forward comes to mind, uh, who do have money, are probably interested in land banking, and operate within the perimeter of the city. Are you in contact, contact with them? Well, within the housing community, this notion of land banking is really a big idea right now, Howard. So I know the Housing Bureau and Home Forward and even PDC related to its NPIs are all looking at this. The, C the community development corporations are too. And just like you said, the big hurdle is the capital to start the bank. And so, um, but uh, the desire to get there uh, because of the ability to buy land early for when you know the value is gonna increase because of the investment you're making is, a, uh, is something they're actively working on. Yeah, I like the fact that you've got, you referenced Metro here back in 94, as we all know, we made a run during 2040 planning to get mandatory inclusionary zoning. Um, and what Metro did was say no, but we'll, we'll form a regional um, committee that will keep an eye on affordable housing over, over time and come back and look what we need to do. And I'm just curious whether they in fact have been tracking this data, which, really. which seems pretty fundamental, pretty basic. So I like the fact you've got Metro in here and we need to hold their feet to the fire to, to make good on that promise they did back in 1994. Karen. I thought it was on. I'm not sure if in today's presentation you're gonna be talking about um, inclusion of anti-displacement tools. That's in the, one of the next topics. That we'll is that the next? So I, 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 I really like this. I like the idea of a financial plan. Um, we have another part of the financial plan looking at new tools in the central city in terms of bonuses and things, but to look at those new tools as part of the financial plan because um, as we develop a constrained list, if that's what you want to call it, the idea of new tools and new tools that embrace kind of that public-private partnership to get us um, there. The other part is, I agree with Mike, um, Metro has a critical role in the regional strategy of affordable housing. And, and my kind of rationale is if you don't do it here, and they, if they can't afford Portland, they're going somewhere else in the region if there's a job. And so they're going to the other cities and counties and um, it becomes their problem but if we can get a regional strategy that we can hold them here, potentially other cities don't have to face as much of a hurdle. And so as a regional, there should be a regional financial strategy to affordable housing that maybe, I, I know Metro's probably reluctant to, to bite, but it also gets to land. I mean, it seems it's part of the UGV as part of uh, of affordable housing strategy of can we house them in Portland or closer into their jobs. So I think we're in agreement. I, I haven't heard anybody. Okay, um, we're gonna shift to the next topic then, which, and I, this is a broader shift because we wanted to do both of Joe's topics in a sequence, but uh, he's gonna give you an update on the 
single dwelling project because we got a, a lot of testimony about what are we doing about residential size and and new houses that that folks believe are out of character with with their neighborhoods and so quick update on that so um, in the uh, next year's uh, budget the bureau has proposed to undertake a project to examine the development standards for single dwelling properties um, single family houses and uh, looking at a, a set of issues one is um, setbacks and dimensional requirements, height, height requirements that uh, and any uh, tweaks that m changes that may be needed to those to better ensure that infill, new infill development uh, is at a, a, a acceptable uh, scale for its existing context. Uh, we see approximately 300 demos a year um, plus uh, another up to 300 uh, of the uh, major renovation uh, all but demos, and um, the city has, that's been a, a great deal of concern uh, amongst the, the neighborhoods uh, and the Bureau of Development Services and the planning uh, and, and have all stepped up to do some interim actions around uh, demolition notice uh, and uh, around tightening up how the interpretation of the rules about the major renovation permits. Um, but this particular project is taking a look at the development standards to once again renegotiate the agreement across our neighborhoods of accepting infill development and reinvestment in our single family neighborhoods because it's an important part of meeting our 2035 goals. Uh, and to do that in a way that's predictable uh, and um, um, but, but more um, the pr preventing um, the uh, the worst sort of or the uh, the unacceptable uh, sort of manifestations of it that the community believes it's seen. So, looking at those single family house development standards, setbacks and heights, rear yard requirements, that kind of thing, uh, for mostly your R five and R seven zone, the residential zones. Looking at uh, the rules about skinny lot development and lot seg because really we believe that uh, a lot of what is being identified as a, a problem relates to that as much as it does to the volume or the setbacks and the size of the houses. Uh, and to do all this on the basis of some data where we really know what's going on in the neighborhood and how it might vary across the face, face of the city uh, and all those neighborhoods. Um, so that project, and when you think about what we've proposed to undertake, what we're undertaking now is rewriting our mixed use zones. So you all are gonna see that in a few months. And our institutional zones, because those two rose to the top because 80% of our new households, right, are going in the mixed use development type. And for our goal nine purposes, for our jobs purposes, we needed the institutional type. So those two rose to the top. In the coming year, we're proposing through a Metro grant to relook at how uh, the development standards for our mixed, our, our multi-unit projects, so those big apartment buildings or bigger apartment buildings, a lot of which you see out in East Portland or in uh, Brentwood, Darlington, um, improving the design of those, and we're taking a look at the single family as well. Um, and uh, uh, with that, we hope to have uh, sort of settled the dust on what uh, people can expect in terms of change and infill in their neighborhoods over the next 20 years. Mike? Yeah, and what's the nexus with the tree code, and and how how is that going to how is the tree code going to uh, uh, play into this infill question? Well, the, the tree code's kind of a given, right? So the tree yeah, code's a right. tree code. So we're designing around that as part of, you know, okay, what what's there? Because we're uh, losing a lot of uh, canopy as infill occurs. We've got an example on Twenty Fourth and Quimby. So it sounds to me like what we're talking about doing in the next year is looking at whether or not the existing zoning code provisions are consistent with the existing environment and deciding whether or not to change the development standards so that going forward, things are more compatible. Yes. Okay. And then to take a look at how skinny lot development and how lots can be reconfigured plays into that as well. So does this address many of the concerns, including East Moreland neighborhoods that are coming forward around kind of the McMansion 
redevelopments in, in their neighborhoods that are kind of seen as not compatible, I guess? We believe that especially the work on the, the lot segregation, the skinny lot piece of this, can actually go a long way to addressing some of the um, infill development that's provoking that concern. Um, uh, but I don't want to say that's the only thing, but we think, yeah. we think that this could make a big difference to that one and a lot of especially those southeast neighborhoods. Is this a design standard also? It's a. It would be in the base code if it turns out the way we're t thinking of it, Andre. It's a, you know, front yard setback, rear yard setback. How you set the height of the house. We're trying to keep it down to. Um, it's not discretionary. It's not design review. Okay. I mean, we haven't started the project yet, but the the. Uh, <laughs> uh, right. We don't have the money. It's not funded yet. But the premise is this: is is can we figure out which parts of those basic kind of requirements seem to be going wrong and which situations it's causing all the, uh, you know, the d belief in impacts and find a solution that, like I said, renegotiates that understanding and lets the market get back on its way. Okay. Thank you. Other discussion? Thanks. Okay, so um, I'm working our way down the list of housing related issues. So uh, the next one was to look at our response to the displacement, the anti-displacement coalition recommendations that you had. So that's a memo that's dated April 10th from uh, Friday. Um, and I'll go through the different elements of that. Um, so you, you remember that on the, I think this actually happened with the transportation system plan hearing. We had quite a bit of testimony about displacement. And you got a letter from a co large coalition of um, of organizations that had um, collectively written a letter on uh, suggesting a number of strategies for, for combating displacement. And so um, we have since that, we've looked at that memo, um, met with our city attorney a few times, also met with the coalition that, uh, that wrote the letter, um, and then put our thoughts together in this memo back to you. And so um, really there's uh, a couple different parts to the memo. The first piece is just acknowledging that they had a number of good ideas that, that could lead to different policies. And we've itemized that. Um, I'll just briefly go through that. Um, we agree with the notion of adding um, a more explicit mention of affordability in the guiding principles at the beginning of the plan. We have um, recommendations around equity, but, but it didn't explicitly mm -hmm elevate affordability to one of those top tier principles and we agree that that's warranted given the amount of testimony we received about that topic. Um, the second one is uh, a number of suggestions about chapter two and effective public involvement and particularly uh, highlighting public involvement for those who might be adversely affected by a decision. And that clarity was not as crystal clear in, in our initial draft, and we agree that that could be made clearer. Um, there are also a number of um, suggestions in chapters three and five. In chapter um, three, um, there is a suggestion to, to add the notion of um, identifying and mitigating impacts as a general development principle. Um, in Chapter 5, um, there are a couple specific mention of tools. We, there are a number of policies in the housing chapter that's, that, that include within them a list of potential tools, and, and there were some good suggestions for additions to those policies. Um, we've already mentioned the um, addition of a policy to add a, um, a target. Um, we also agree that... Uh, in policy in Chapter 5, we are kind of dancing around the inclusionary zoning question by having policies that you know, could be used to support it, but we never went and directly said that, that some kind of affordability mandate may be appropriate in the future if it were legal, and we may want to be a little more direct with that policy statement. Uh, we agree with that critique of our last draft. Um, so that's the a whirlwind tour of some of the policy direction that we took from that memo and are planning on incorporating. Uh, the second part of um, this memo goes into some questions about the scale and applicability of some of the tools that were suggested. Um, and so there are a couple 
there are really a couple parts to that question. One is um, when we talk about impact analysis and and, um, and and other tools and community benefit agreements, there's a scale of project where that makes sense, and there's a scale of project where that that hurdle may be too great or, or large enough to really um, stifle the actual good thing that might have been we might have been trying to do. So an example of that is, you know. It would never come to this, but if, if one had to do an impact analysis and a community benefit agreement in order to put an ADA curb ramp on a corner, there just wouldn't be any ADA curb ramps built because of that hurdle would be too great. And so we want a threshold where, where this doesn't hinder the good things that are in the TSP or in our infrastructure plans um, or hinder the, the market rate production of affordable housing. So we've said that, 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 that these kind of tools like uh, community benefit agreements and, and impact analysis are appropriate for larger scale planning decisions like, you know, if we were doing a new community plan or a new plan for a whole center like a new Hollywood plan or a new St. John's plan or, you know, we've mentioned already things like uh, future streetcars or future Southwest Corridor major transit investments. Um, we want policy that points towards that kind of equity and and um, displacement analysis, um, but we want to be careful about not implying that those policies would apply to every single new housing unit that you'd have to do some kind of new impact analysis. And um, so that's where we're recommending that there is a scale that matters. Um, the second piece of this is about what is the nature of the comp plan, and this is a question that you, I think you're beginning to appreciate that we've revisited in a couple um, other topics as well. Is that there are some things that are good policy ideas for the city to have that aren't necessarily within what a comp plan is empowered to, to uh, regulate. Um, and we've pointed out a few things from this. Um, an example is you, um, there have been a number of ideas about how we might use tax policy to, um, to generate money to go towards good things. Um, the comp plan has almost zero authority over tax policy. Um, so that's, that's an example where the, the policy might need to be somewhere else. Um, another example is, um, is you heard a lot of very legitimate testimony about tenant, tenant rights. Um, the comp plan may not be your best tool to have tenant rights um, policy because inherently zoning and comprehensive plans are all the process around them are designed to protect property owners and to some extent property rights and you may want to think about renters rights in a different policy context than in zoning it may be a more effective tool to think about those kind of things outside the comp plan still very legitimate public policy objectives but the comp plan may not be the best tool and so um, we wanted to raise those questions just in a very thematical way because they, they cut across a number of suggestions we've heard related to displacement and gentrification. Um, Eric, a quick question. Does the comp plan in any way relate to the Portland plan? Yes, <laughs> we hope so. <laughs> because it seems to me there's a lot of what you're worried about in here in the Portland plan. Yeah, the Portland plan, um, and I know not all of you were on the commission when we, when we adopted the Portland plan, but. The Portland plan was that broader plan that can go beyond land use into a whole variety of topics and of interest to the city and its partner agencies. Um, so there is stuff in the Portland plan about some of these broader topics and we were comfortable with that. Um, as we move into the land use and infrastructure plan, we're starting to run across these boundary issues in terms of what the plan actually can address. Yeah, and, and so there's a couple avenues. I think uh, Commissioner Smith has mentioned this in a previous meeting, uh, um, that as you adopt the comp plan, you may want to simultaneously you know, develop some parallel recommendations for either that circle back to the Portland plan or circle just back to council for broader policy that's outside the comp plan. And I know that you know, there's a number of topics where we've had the same discussion, so I think it's worth um, continuing to talk about that and collect those items together into a bundle. Um, so so I, I have to leave, so I'm gonna make a couple of comments before I have to go, um, before you move on. So um, 
I get your point about it maybe not being the best avenue for some of these issues, um, but where it is appropriate, I would hope it would be included. I think that a lot of people spend a lot of time, including the Cully Coalition and the East Portland Action Coalition, to creating these lists. Um, I took a picture of the list that was on the board there, um, up on the wall in our own meeting that was entitled Anti-Displacement CBO Coalition. I think we've spelled it wrong a couple of times, making it look like collation, but it's actually coalition. Um, and the 10 that were listed there are excellent and they mirror very carefully and closely to the um, mitigation uh, for, uh, displacement tools that the, that the East Portland Action Plan also came up with. So I think communication about this to the community is very important if some of this ends up not ending up in the comp plan. The, the communication will look like we studied this, met, told you, you had a list and you dropped it. So my suggestion along the lines of communication is that if you don't think this is the right venue and you don't in plan to include anti-displacement tools, uh, you better communicate about that to the public because they'll think you just dropped it. And I'm very concerned about that. So to me, my opinion, that's what I'm sitting here for, is wherever you can put it in and you feel it's the right venue, put it in. And if we have to make reference back to the Portland plan to do it, that's fine too. But some of these are fine tools. They, they really are fine tools, especially in combination. I think of them like amino acids. On their own, they're meh. But if you stick them all together, they can be really powerful and help in digestion. So I think this is kind of, I'm, I'm making a little levity, but I do think that the, the, the tools together mean a lot to a lot of people in our more disadvantaged areas. And we've done a great deal of thinking and reading and studying about inclusionary zoning, about land banking, about tenant protections. I just hope it goes somewhere. That's what I'm hoping. So I, I should mention just broadly that this memo is intended to kind of give you a snapshot of one point in time within a larger conversation because um, to your point about ongoing communication, um, our intent is an ongoing dialogue w with the coalition that, that set these comments in. Be and the next section of, of our memo was um, can really... I just, can I just add something real quick? Because yeah. I think one of the things that... Um, he's alluded to here is that there will be many topics, whether it's environment, jobs, housing, land use, that didn't fit in the plan, but we really wanted to do it. And it might've been about tax law, it might've been about labor, it might've been about something else that didn't actually fit in the land use plan. We can, when, when you all actually do this final vote on the adoption of the comp plan, just like a lot of the other things you vote on, you often will have a letter that goes along with. And I think in that letter we could um, list out here are other topics of great concern that we uncovered during this several year process and we want to make sure that those are listened to and are adopted somewhere else. And I think that could go far in terms of addressing that we did listen, that we collected these ideas, that we put them together and the ones that you all really feel strongly about, you are able to um, still recommend those to council without it being a land use recommendation. So the, um, the ongoing dialogue, one of the things that we agreed um, to do is, is take on some additional legal research because some of these suggestions, we don't yet have a legal answer as to whether they could work or not. And so we developed a follow-up legal research agenda um, in consultation um, with stakeholders. And so that's the next section of this memo is identifying some legal questions that we want to work jointly with them on um, as we move forward. Um, section one was about what can we incorporate immediately into the policies. Um, but many of the items in the memo were really implementation tools that would come into play in the codes beyond, the, beyond your just initial adoption of the policy document. And so between now and when we have to finish the implementation tools, we have some time to dig through some of these legal questions and figure out whether those tools can be implemented. And back to Karen's point, um, 
that you know, I think we agree with is where we can do it, we want to do that. Um, and this is part of our process of figuring out what are some of the legal limitations um, on some of those tools that are um, just inherent, but also some that are unique to Oregon that we need to, to work through. Um, so I'm not going to go through all the legal language here, but uh, you can read that. And um, if you have follow-up questions on um, or initial questions now, you're welcome to, to ask them. Um, the final section of the memo is about the zoning tools that we are pursuing right now. Um, and I just wanted to briefly mention those. Um, with the Central City 2035 plan, we're continuing to do um, uh, very significant research on retooling the bonus structure for uh, bonus floor area ratio and bonus height um, and retooling those bonus provisions to include a stronger, much stronger affordable housing bonus. Um, and that work is underway and will be um, start to be daylighted with a report to council, I believe, in May, um, and which will eventually find its way to you in the form of the central city codes. Um, we're also doing, in parallel with that effort, studying the, um, through the mixed use zoning, also studying bonus provision overhauls and looking at how can we make affordable housing one of the primary bonuses that are available outside the central city as well and figuring out whether how that would financially work um, and how to calibrate that. Um, and that will be appearing, a draft of that will be appearing with the um, mixed use concept plan that, that is, is almost done. So I wanted you to be aware of those two specific things that are where we are actively moving into code um, and the rest then being continuing the legal research to figure out whether we can or not. So that's that's a whirlwind tour of that memo. Are there are there questions, um, comments? Quick Catherine? question. Oh, oh. You have a quick question. Go ahead. Um, does our code allow tiny houses? Allow tiny houses? Yeah. So what could you clarify what you mean by that? So houses that aren't on the formal foundation. You know, when we talk, people talk about these tiny houses as an ability to have housing security. That you have something that isn't necessarily permanently attached right. to the um, land. There have been, um, there are tiny houses that are legally occupied, yes, that, that are legal and there are opportunities to, um, the bigger issue is um, in order to be considered permanent housing, you do have to have them on the ground. So the, the ones that are literally on wheels, those are regulated differently as more as like trailers and there's a whole different legal framework about those. Um, the ones that are permanently on a site, um, most of the legal issues are around utilities and, and construction style, but you know, we have figured out how to legalize, for example, Dignity Village and, and as an example, and there are other tiny houses that are legally built. Um, so the, there isn't a fundamental legal barrier to them, but there are a lot of little code details that could be improved. And as part of the single family project, we're looking at are there opportunities to look for having a cottage sort of, you know, an R5 lot but having three cottages on it? Or is there a way to look at a larger house that's currently, um, you know, an existing home that you want to split into three or four apartments? And how would you go about doing that? And we do some of that now, um, but we want to make it easier, I think, would be part of it. And so looking at how do you do that to allow more density without actually having to um, change structures. The, another related element is the, the micro apartment trend and how our codes handle that. And there are, similar to the micro houses, um, micro apartments, there are some code details that could be improved to make it easier and clearer to, to know what's allowed. So the, um, the bonus structure that you're taking to council, um, have we seen any of that yet? This is a report to council based on their request that we research some options and report into them. Um, you will see it before it comes back through the legislative process, but they ask for a, a re they ask for a research and a report back to them. Is it possible to get a courtesy copy when it goes? Absolutely. <laughs> we, we will be briefing you too. It's just perfect. Thanks. Howard, did you? No. Oh, 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 okay. Mike. Well, just uh, your. Discussion of scale makes a lot of sense. The way you, the way you've written and described it, is there makes a, a lot more sense to have a project that's large enough that could actually generate 
some opportunities to address some of the mitigation that we're concerned about. Other comments? Great. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Tom now. And he's going to, um, do you want to start with the opportunity area policy? Or the homeless. Um, okay. So now I'm going off of the February 25th um, staff report memo. And um, the first, we're going to go back and get some of the policy topics that we weren't able to cover on February 25th. And the first one has to do with um, some homelessness policies on page six and seven, and primarily on, on page seven. And, and this relates to just um, a little bit to Commissioner Rudd's comment about tiny houses. And um, at the top of page seven, we have a, our, our primary policy, which talks about a housing continuum and providing a range of different shelter types and supportive services for the homeless. Um, and we got some comments on wanting to sort of push that policy a little bit further and be more explicit about um, safe, legal, sanitary, but creatively different housing options. Um, <laughs> And if you look at the bottom of page seven, uh, the, the, the real policy question in front of you that we're looking for feedback is, do we want to be more explicit about um, this idea of, I don't know, um, creative or innovative housing types that meet the life safety um, building codes, but maybe not all of the new construction building and zoning codes um, that provide a little bit more creative license um, or, and, and sort of our um, staff recommendation is, the language in policy 539 is broad enough and covers enough options and includes the magic phrase, including but not limited to, um, and provides enough uh, of a policy framework that allows us to explore these options anyway without having to sort of work out in detail, well, what do we mean? Like which life safety requirements are included and which ones are not? And um, getting into the specificity of that sort of policy type. And so we're looking for just a sense from you as to which direction should we go? Do we need more? policy on this in terms of encouraging innovative types or what we have there is perfectly fine and provides us enough room working forward. But when you talk about keeping life safety but waiving some of the other requirements for new construction, give me examples of a requirement that might be waived. I'm not sure about, do you know, Eric, about what they're after? No. No. Certainly, their comments weren't specific about what they want to waive. I think the idea is that there's a pared down, simplified code for micro housing and small often, transitional. Often, the the conversation um, gets around to sort of what we require under our maintenance code for existing older stock housing that isn't up to current building codes, but you have to maintain a minimum level in terms of, you know, walls and floors and electrical. Um, but when, you, when you're making some repair or some change, you don't have to bring everything up to the full code. You know, example, I guess, to, in thinking about an example might be there are codes that say you have to have a receptacle every so often so that you can plug lots of computers in that may not be necessary for a, a homeless housing. And, and so there's... There's details in the code that are beyond just basic life and safety that get to typical needs of a, of a more um, middle class or, or a different income bracket. Well, and on so micro, micro housing, they have, um, you can only go so small. Uh, and certain, you have to have a certain number of fixtures and things and how you count bathrooms or kitchens or whatever to qualify for different types of housing within the code. So maybe it makes sense to relook at that or not, but it's up to study. Michelle? 
I don't have the policy in front of me, but I would just say in terms of the including but not limited to, there is an argument that that's limited to things that are the same type mm -hmm. as the things you actually call out. So mm -hmm. I would just look at what you've called out, and as long as they're generally broad enough to capture the type of thing you want, then I would be happy with the included but not limited to. Gary? Um, yeah, I, I think it's important to to note basic life safety. I'm a little conflicted about the level of detail because I think we need to recognize that homelessness itself is a dangerous situation. And if you're creating barriers to viable, you know, viable housing options, you're actually ramping up the danger or you're ignoring, you're neglecting to take care of the danger of being homeless itself. So I think um, I, I'm just cautious about too much mm -hmm. detail. Right, I think that's the basic premise of the recommendation is that we've created a gap between homelessness and the lowest cost housing you can make because of the things we've, how we've defined what's the minimum standard. And there may, be, I think the suggestion is to be more explicit about, um, about acknowledging that. So this is really transitional housing. This is not what I would consider permanent housing. This is for homeless or um, maybe people that are looking for a transitional home that have no income and, and just need a place to sit so you can stabilize and then move to a different house. This is not bringing a housing, I would I consider permanent apartment type. Right. Okay. Other questions? So, so is the sense that we want another I, I, policy in here along this, or what we have is I think is what okay. you have is appropriate given the okay. comments, yeah. Okay. So the next issue is on page 10 and 11 of the memo. And um, this just is a sort of revisit, recap um, notion of, of the, the, the policy direction around our, our housing location policies, which are on page 11, is really around and focused on what we call opportunity areas or complete neighborhoods, the healthy connected city strategy from the Portland plan, and wanting to encourage a range of housing, affordable housing in those areas that have high opportunity, high levels of completeness. And that this is a, um, a little bit of a shift from in, in terms of the language from where we are in, in the 1980 current comp plan, which is on page 10, which really was more explicit about wanting to have mixed income neighborhoods um, reflect the diversity of the income range of the region. Um, and, and so while I think it achieves the same goal, in terms of wanting, it, it's a little bit more explicit but about where we want to focus our affordable housing efforts, and that being the, the complete neighborhoods, the high opportunity neighborhoods, which is the direction that the Housing Bureau has gone with many of their programs and incentives. Um, but we, we just had a, a, a few um, comments about the, the sort of concern about losing that mixed income or balanced language there um, versus the, uh, the more focus on location and what's available to that affordable low income household and how they live and how they function. And so the, the, again, another question, do we need to bring back, and, and I would say there is, you know, at the bottom of page 11, you know, we do ha talk about more about the income diversity in our centers and corridors. Um, so we do speak to a bit of a, a little bit, but it's not explicit. And, and so the question before you is, do we need to be more explicit about that income diversity and mixed income, not just in the centers and corridors, um, but in all neighborhoods across the city? My, my response to that is yes, and I was gonna actually ask the question if you take each of these policies, is it conceivable that you would in fact be concentrating um, 
folks, low-income folks in particular areas, if you follow through these. You get my gist. I yeah, I don't. Part of the issue really is that in the past we had this big broad statement that said in all parts of the city we're going to ha have a reflection of all incomes in all parts right, of the right. city, and you actually want to be able to have people who have a need for transit to be more located near right. centers of corridors, and it was actually hurting <clears throat> what we were trying to get to at right. in our goals. And so, I think the the overall ideal is still not that different but that there's a real goal here to make it more explicit that if you just say, yeah, everybody should be able to live everywhere in the city and it should be evenly distributed, you're not actually going to get to your goals in terms of being able to have better access right. for lower income families. Which, yeah. which pulls you into the central city, which already has a high concentration of low income, high right. need households, but there's also access to lots of services. And so what do you do there versus say other neighborhoods um, that don't have as many services, but in the name of a mix of income or diversity of income, we're going to want to push our programs and our incentives to those neighborhoods that may not function as well for those household types. Right. I completely support the concept, but I do, there's that little piece in the back of my head that has me worried that we're also setting up a dynamic that basically creates um, segregation, potentially. And segregation is a strong <laughs> word, but I mean, you're encouraging people to congregate in a certain area for very good reasons and the right reasons. But then does it also use, let a neighborhood, unfortunately, use that to say, well, it's, you know, we shouldn't have affordable housing here because it's not next to transit for the wrong reasons. And um, right, I guess yeah. that worries me a little bit. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I think Catherine kind of nailed it. Um, it's not that... I, I think you're, we're against it, not putting it in. It's the unintended consequence of how leaving, it out. leaving yeah. it out. And w how could you use that as a neighborhood to say, not in my neighborhood? Right. Don? Yeah. Andre and, and Catherine, I, I, I support this notion because the last thing we want to do is stigmatize uh, any level of housing. Uh, and the more we can blend it into the neighborhoods where there are appropriate services that are necessary for everybody, the better. That this, the, the home run in affordable housing is if you can't tell it's affordable housing. Yep. One thread to tie these two um, things together may be that um, you want to create, and I'm sort of thinking out loud so I might get it wrong, but you want to be able to create choice for those who are seeking affordable housing, yes. and you want there to be choices in accessible, close-in locations because the market is not necessarily going to automatically create that. And you also don't want neighborhoods to create barriers to choice outside of those central locations mm -hmm. either. So there's sort of the flip side of that. Yep. Teresa? So, um, Maybe it's just as simple as removing the word all neighborhoods and just kind of softening that so it, it is pointing us towards integration amongst neighborhoods, but it's not necessarily every neighborhood has to reflect it. The other comment I'd make is um, on page 10, the bullet um, around the um, dual investment strategy, and this gets back to the conversation we had with TSP, um, we kind of touch it on um, 5.26, but it, it's, it really is more explicit in the bullet to me mm -hmm. about the dual investment strategy. On your word, yeah. um, on page second, second, bullet. Bullet. second bullet. And it talks about a dual investment strategy and I, I think it's just more explicit. We've talked about it in the TSP. Okay. Yep. Yep. <coughs> okay. Okay. Anything else? All right. Okay. Um, we're going to now move to um, the topic of demolition, which you briefly touched on earlier, but um, this is on page. 21. 21, thank you. Um, All right. 
2021. Um, we included this section in the report because we did get a lot of testimony on the comp plan about what are you doing with residential demolition. And it's related to what Joe talked about earlier of infill development in neighborhoods. Um, so in- four is the policies. Yeah. Um, in this section of the report, we tried to give you a little bit of a flavor of what the character, what's really going on with demolitions. Um, and we, re, we gave a summary of what council has been doing on that topic. There has been, you know, code changes in the works to extend demolition delay. Um, and that, that has been going through. So that is one response. Um, in the, in the statistics, we looked at the snapshot of 2013 just to help understand what was going on. And a few points I guess I'd make in looking at this. Um, we heard a lot about demolition being a, a growth related issue, but the fact is that the majority, a little over 50% of the demolitions were not involved with any new housing production. It was simply a one-to-one -one replacement with a bigger house or not even a new house. It was just a demolition because maybe the house was unsafe or something. So. Um, from a growth management perspective, um, to us that looks like it's, you know, it, they were increasing in size, so it could have to do with just socio-demographic changes in a neighborhood more than it does growth. Um, we also noted that um, if you look at where there were new developments or new housing units created, there were very few demolitions that resulted in the large, the largest majority of the new housing units. So only 25 demolitions in 2013 created 407 new housing units, which was the majority of the new housing units related to demolitions. And so um, another way of saying that is that most new development is occurring in the mixed use and multifamily zones, and not that many houses are being torn down relative to the new units that are being produced. Um, so that just is by way of understanding the different dynamics about what's causing demolition. Some of it is, some of it is growth related where there's a second house or a, a, a splitting of the lot, but a lot of it is that just one for one replacement. Do we have a hypothesis for why it concentrates in R5? The R5 is the most common zone in the city by far. So if you did, that's probably equivalent to the geographic distribution of lots in the city. Right. Just because most lots in the city are in R5. Eric, um, speaking, I'm sorry. No, speaking of demolition, I brought up a question I have. Does the city have a list of uh, properties that we own that are either scheduled to demolition or that, that should be demolished? Is there an inventory of uh, properties the city owns? I will have to get back to you on that. I don't know. All housing, yeah. They, you know, people abandon houses and stuff. Where's the know. list of that? There probably is a list. I know there's a list of what the city owns. Whether we have a list of properties that we own with housing on it, I don't know. I'll have to get back to you. Well, it just seems to me there's a... I'd like to know about it. There's a tie in what we could do with some of that. Yeah. Um, so with regard to comp plan policy, the, the report listed some of the existing demolition policies in the draft. Um, we did see one opportunity to um, improve the policy, and that was that um, right now there's a policy in Chapter 4 about discouraging demolition and, and having a preference for save, reusing existing houses. But it's, it's uh, I don't want to say buried because it's an important topic in its own right, but it's in the energy and sustainability section, not the affordability or neighborhood compatibility section. And we thought that given that the vast majority of comments about demolition was about compatibility and affordability, that we ought to move that policy over to that section. It still is a good sustainability policy, but we didn't get as much concern about its location from that constituency. So um, that's the one change we um, wanted to discuss with you is just uh, reemphasizing the location of that policy and tying it more explicitly to um, preservation of existing affordable housing and and maintenance of neighborhood character, which one could infer, but it isn't as clear because of where we put the policy. So related to that, the, the scale and pattern policy, um, do we actually have an opportunity to turn that into code that has teeth that would influence this? I mean, it's a nice aspiration, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, 4.13, yeah. 
I mean, that's what the neighbors are complaining about, right? As stuff gets replaced with stuff that, that's not similar. Um, yeah, and that's the core of the project Joe referenced is we're going to audit our existing codes and see really whether that's true. Um, you know, that policy in, in, includes, um, there are other sections of that same policy section that says, um, you know, like the, um, make sure there are options for, for residential infill is in that same policy. So we gotta balance that with all the other policies in the residential section, but that, that's the core of what, what that project is about. Teresa? So regarding your comment about moving it from the sustainability section, I think it's important that whenever we can integrate a policy from the sustainability section by itself into the actual area where the practice should be followed is a good idea because it that's the way to actually make it sustainable is to make it part of the normal conversation about that thing. Second. Okay, are we ready to move on to the next topic? Yeah, I, well, I just have a, a question you have on the commission direction, a knowledge that the proposed comprehensive plan policies sufficiently address concerns over de demolition. It, it seems that it, they don't because we've got this follow-on plan that Joe's doing, and so I'm concerned about the word sufficiently. Well, to be clear, Joe's project is not going to change necessarily the codes about demolition. It's focused on what happens after demolition on the on the uh, size of the new housing. So, um, discourage the yeah discourage. The, yeah the the there's a limit to you know in terms of what the city can do. Um, the city has recently taken action to add additional delay to demolition in response to that concern. So, um, you know, the, that's kind of the question is, are there other things that we could be doing? Um, we have not found them yet. Um, okay. or, or does it become part of the city's state legislative agenda to, to get us more authority or get that authority yeah. back yeah. to do more. It's like inclusionary zoning a little bit is that there are, there's state regulation of, of the limits of our powers with regard to historic preservation and, and, and so it, you know, it, it isn't currently legal for us to just have absolute authority over demolition and, and say that somebody can't dem demo unless it's on the, the, hist the uh, national landmark or something like that. Yeah, unless they're, they're historic, Eric, I don't see a clear path forward for the city to exert you know, power over demolitions. It seems like the improvements they've made so far is improving the notification process and getting neighbors involved. But has the city really been able to put forth any compatibility criteria, decision criteria on these projects? And can we really expect to do that? I think with regard to what happens after demolition, we're going to be focused on the prescriptive standards of the base zone in terms of okay. fairly mundane so we'll things like, base zone. yeah, like height okay. and setbacks yeah. is the language that this project is going to be dealing with. Um, we're yeah, not, height specifically at the, at the setbacks themselves, you know, the perimeter of lots, it's the height at those points that are really critical. Yeah, well, so if we can influence that through the zoning code, and that'd be great. But what, what we may not, what we, you know, to be fully upfront, we are not going to, at this point, we do not see a path where we can get to having um, absolute control over demolition at the yes, no phase. No, I don't see where we would. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused by the language that says that policies sufficiently address concerns because the concerns are out there, they're legitimate. Um, and I, what I hear you saying, I think, is as with the d displacement policies, there are some things that are appropriate to have in a comprehensive plan, and there are other things that, as you suggested, we may want to go to the state to allow the city to do it in other ways, to address that issue in other ways. Is that basically? Yeah, the, I mean, the, what we're proposing is a comp plan policy that says we're wanting to discourage a, a necessary demolition of good and ha affordable housing stock. So that's a clear policy. The tool about what exactly our demolition codes are is really where this question lies. Right. And that's where there's some state legislation needed. And this could be one of those ones where we're adding that to the list of 
additional recommendations to council that aren't a part of the zoning code yeah, because yeah. there's also um, financial um, incentives or disincentives that we could set out. You know, we could say that if you are going to demo a house, you have to put $25,000 into an affordable housing fund. You could, mm -hmm. you could set up a whole slew of other kinds of ways to incent or disincent um, demos. Um, and we might want to look at some of those things, but not as a part um, of the zoning code, I don't think. But I do think it's a good thing for us as a, or you all as a commission to provide that input to council. Right. Michelle? Um, so just to throw this out here, I know normally you hear the term McMansion and everybody has sort of the common, that's a horrible thing sort of reaction. And I was just thinking about a guy that my husband worked for at Intel that lived in a multi-generational house. He had his brother and his brother's family and his parents living with him. So I just want to have some element of being aware of that when we're looking at how we're changing these things. And I understand wanting to be sensitive to the area, but if you can design in a way that's sensitive and still allows you to live the way you want to live within the boundaries of the house, I'd like to see us do that. I got Don over here and then Captain. Yeah, quick one. Uh, you know, I've never asked this question, Eric, but if you buy a house in Portland and you tear it down to the ground, you remove the foundation, you scrape the whole thing, and you want to build another house, do you pay system development charges or do you get credit from the house that was there? You get credit within a certain time period. At, at some point, you start to lose that. Then it becomes vacant and then you're building. Yeah, if it's new. vacant long enough, but currently, the, most of the SDC rules allow some credit for that, provided it's been a recent. There's a time period, and that's a credit that, or that's a, a fee that's being scrutinized right now by Parks. Yeah, and I don't know if anybody else, but it's always a fee. It's never gone down. Yeah, and, and the, know, the, I've noticed. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm on top of these things. It the core of that down. is that it's an impact <laughs> fee, and there's all sorts of constitutional law about what you can do with an impact fee, and you can't do an impact fee if there isn't an impact. And so the logic is that. If there was a house there and there's a new house there, I you know. can't justify an impact. No, I've, I've done <laughs> projects where we've used that as a pool of resources, actually, yeah. to do infrastructure. OK. Catherine. Oh, well, I'm just going to, I guess, piggyback on the caution in that I have concerns about, um, well, for exactly the reasons you're saying, about the demolition code. I know there's a lot of support for kind of re-looking at it, but, but throughout time, if you look in many of our neighborhoods there's houses from all different periods they're all different sizes and then they also change in the way they're used in that larger homes maybe even older stock get then reused and become multiple apartments and so i think there there needs to be with with what we're doing a recognition that personally i guess i think that's okay and i think it's okay to have our, our neighborhoods have variety they shouldn't be all one and the same and that um I guess I'm a, I, time will tell with, with Joe's project and what comes out of that, but I'd, I'd hate to see that we ended up putting something in place that creates all the same little boxes in every single lot. Right. Got one more comment. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I gotta say it. it make, to me, it makes sense just to acknowledge, the acknowledgement would be that the comprehensive plan policies alone are not sufficient to address all the concerns that have been expressed about demolition. To me, that makes more sense. Does that work for you? Because I have the same kind of concern there too, and I think it, and yeah, okay. that that sounds that sounds logical. Okay. Great. Um, so that covers. I think that covers our housing related. Um, yep. Oh no, there's one other commercial displacement, which was a little bit of a field from housing, but it was a leftover item from the mixed use discussion that we never got to. Um, and since it relates to displacement, we put it in tonight's agenda. So um, the last item, and this is actually from a different staff report, and I ran upstairs and if you want to pass that around. Um, it was question E from the mixed use project, or sorry, from the from the centers and corridors report. Um, and um, similar to the um, Displ housing displacement question. Um, this section of the report identifies um, some um, policies that relate to commercial displacement um, and then give, um, gives you an opportunity to weigh in if you've thought of other ideas. Um, 
So we do have a policy that addresses commercial displacement in Chapter 6, um, Policy 6.65. Um, and so it, it um, talks about limiting and, 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 um, and addressing the um, preservation of affordable neighborhood commercial space um, as redevelopment occurs. Um, and similar to our earlier discussion, the specific tools is where the action is here. But we wanted you to know that we do have this larger umbrella policy uh, in Chapter 6. Um, the second page, and actually it's page 28 of that report, lists some other policies related to, to commercial displacement. Um, and then we listed some of the existing tools that are already in play as well as um, some additional tools that um, we've been discussing. Um, and I want to highlight uh, a few things. Um, one is that um, you know some of PDC's activities do do relate to this in terms of loans and, and urban renewal areas. There are programs related to to um, business investment, and some of those programs have and can be used to um, help support businesses that otherwise may, may get relocated. Um, second thing to mention is that we are exploring as part of the mixed use zoning code a bonus provision for affordable commercial space. And the idea there is that um, you would be able to win some additional floor area if you are um, putting the, doing a long-term lease with some sort of um, affordable um, broker, uh, some kind of community organization that would be the holder, uh, a little bit like a land trust, but it's a commercial space. Um, that would um, hold for the long term affordable commercial spaces on the ground floor of new buildings um, and, and be responsible for the leasing arrangements and make sure that there are um, businesses that are in there that are, are appropriate. And, and um, by creating that entity, um, you kind of, you know, the, the issue with this kind of a bonus is it's a, it's a monitoring issue. You don't necessarily want to put BDS, the building permit agency, in charge of monitoring leases and affordability, but, but if we can get a third-party nonprofit into that role, there may be an opportunity uh, for um, new development to take advantage of that. And in many cases, the ground floor commercial, as, as it's happening right now, is being left vacant because there's more of it being built than there is demand for. So we think that that kind of a bonus might actually get used a little bit and could be a, a mechanism to um, provide some amount of more affordable commercial space to the community. Um, some other things um, that other communities have done on this, um, there are um, land trusts, again, um, that have addressed this kind of issue as well. Um, some cities actually get directly involved in owning retail space for this purpose. Um, and, and some CDCs in other cities are more commercially oriented, so that's another potential tool. So that's, the, that's sort of an overview of that staff report section. Do you have any questions or, or further suggestions? Uh, 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 go ahead, Howard. Go ahead. Uh, I, it really is rent control, isn't it, what you're proposing in a way? It's, uh, it's um, proposing a bonus in exchange for price um, commitments <laughs> <laughs> and, a, and a mechanism to <laughs> same answer well done. using well a community done. organization as the enforcement mechanism over time because <laughs> the city doesn't necessarily want to be directly in that business so oh go ahead Gary um, ah sorry I I couldn't no locate my notes from our previous discussion here um, but mm -hmm. yeah. the, the gist of what's in my mind is it, it seemed like, the, well, first of all, a question. Do we think we really understand the reasons for low income and minority uh, displacement and, and gentrification? Do we really understand the dynamics of why that happens and whether, whether it can be intervened with successfully in our community? One of the things we're consistently hearing um, from community organizations that are working in places like Albina are, is that there is a 
feeling that it is hard for them to break in and, and be part of the conversation about who ends up being tenants in new, new mixed-use buildings. Um, and uh, so they're, they're interested in that transaction and how zoning relates to that transaction and whether there's anything zoning can do to, to um, I'm, I'm not sure what the right verb is, but uh, be a part of that transaction so that there's a, you know, in some cases it might just be that the community isn't on the Rolodex of the leasing company. And so what can we do to raise awareness of that possibility of leasing to a community tenant? And does that apply primarily to new businesses then? No, it could be an existing business that's, um, that's relocating because they are a tenant in a building that's being torn down and being replaced by a mixed-use building, um, or it could be um, it could be a new business as well. But it, 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 in many cases, it's how can you create space so that the existing long-time community establishments have a place to go as the neighborhood changes around them. If you look at what hap what happened on Williams or what's hap continues to happen on MLK or or Mississippi Avenue, how do you how do you provide a path for existing businesses to, to figure out if they can get a place that's affordable to them and as buildings are torn down and replaced by bigger buildings? And my other, my other recollection is that, and, and I'm not, I haven't had a chance to really look at these carefully, but the feeling I had in looking at the previous set of recommendations is it was very kind of pilot project oriented. Let, let's try a little of this and a little of that. And um, that, that didn't seem like an aggressive enough approach. And um, I haven't really had a chance to digest the stuff that you just handed out here. And d does this carry over a lot from the previous material? This, this is a copy of the previous material on this okay. topic, yeah. So um, the, 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 the only place tonight where we introduced new material was the um, target memo that Joe described and my um, memo responding to the um, dis the anti-displacement coalition that was new material, but this commercial displacement piece was something we ha we prepared for January. So it it still has a feel a bit of we're exploring this and we're considering that and it, it's not it's not feeling assertive enough. Um, if, that, if that makes sense. I think, I mean, these were just, we were looking for some direction from you or, and highlighting the direction in the, in the uh, proposed plan and in some cases confirming or do we want to go further or different direction and where based on these conversations, what you will see in the draft recommended plan in May will be that assertiveness that you're looking for and that'll be sort of your opportunity to say, yeah, or you know, we need to change this policy and that policy. Okay, great, thank you. Teresa? So I have a question. Do you think that this also relates to our food cart industry? Because as those sites are redeveloped, then they're not available for little food carts. This kind of reads brick and mortar to me. The next policy in that policy talks about temporary spaces, which really gets at the food carts and the pop-up shops and, and trying to use some of those transitional spaces um, to provide those opportunities. Yeah, I mean, luckily we have a pretty large supply of parking lots in the city, so. Um, <laughs> used car lots. Even, even with our, our um, what some would say is aggressive housing targets of 100, 120,000 new households, there's, there's still gonna be quite a few parking lots available for food carts over the next 20 years. <laughs> There, there, there was just a, a new building on Milwaukee Avenue in Westmoreland where they actually, it's a dental office, they, they just are doing a one-story building with a parking lot, and the parking lot is going to be designed to have two food cart pot pads in it, integrated into it. Um, so, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think this is a great strategy. It seems that it's part of our economic analysis and, and prosperity strategy for Portland um, to preserve those businesses or give them opportunity, especially for some of the um, minority immigrant communities as a opportunity to, they're not part of the development community. 
And so to how, you described how do they become integrated into that community to, to know where that next space is coming from and, and how is it going to be affordable for them and eventually to become part of that development community so they can develop their own space. But it, this seems like the roadmap, at least, to get to that um, stage, to get them involved and, and have them have a voice in their, their potential next use. And it just makes sense if you're doing housing, why not do commercial development? Because that really is the prosperity component to um, allowing someone to potentially transition in a neighborhood as it transitions. There's no reason that they can't transition also, but not if it's not, they're not given an opportunity to do that. Yes. Um, just one quick point. Um, so as you're looking at this policy and all of the other ones, as we're wrapping this up over the next couple months, look at the verbs again. So in this one, for example, it says encourage the preservation and creation of affordable neighborhood commercial space. Um, we've had a lot of discussion in the past about having words like mandate and require around environmental issues, for example. Um, Mike's not here anymore, but it was, um, you know, some people have pushed for different, very strong words around different areas of the plan. So I just want you all to go back in, take one more look as you're, as you're going through to make sure that um, the things that are really important to you, that those don't have soft verbs, that they do have a stronger verb. Because when they have the stronger ones, I think that does give more direction to council that, for example, displacement of commercial businesses might become um, the specific um, sort of purview of a certain department or requirement that that department work on that issue. And if it just says things like encourage broadly, um, it's less likely to get uh, to that level of, of uh, implementation and then resources to do those things. So Gary, does that um, start to address, get from encourage to require or get rid of working on to just creating a zoning bonus? Yeah, I think I mean, it, it, that's that's kind of what established that feeling. Things, yeah, yeah. And and the other the other question that just occurred to me is, um, has there was there discussion with stakeholders around just the fact that neighborhoods transition, populations transition, and new people have different needs than the people who were there before? Um, different needs, different desires, and, and it, was there any, and if yes, was there discussion about assistance to business owners in modifying their business so that it stays in the neighborhood and serves the transitioning population? There was, um, as we've been having community meetings around the mixed use project, for example, there has been an acknowledgement that different as communities transition, the, the market changes or the, the business climate changes and different things are emphasized. There definitely was conversation about that. Um, there wasn't specific discussion about what you just mentioned about you know, what the toolbox of helping people at that stage is, mm -hmm. um, but that's, that's a good idea. So can we um, add some establish and require or do you want, can you, I mean, I guess, what I'm hearing is people are more interested in being more aggressive with this, so get to more establish, require. Yeah, I just wrote down, look at the verb here. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not going to commit to a verb on the spot, but I'll look <laughs> yeah. at that. Okay. Uh, just to in inject a little optimism that we're not the only ones working on this, the inclusionary zoning bill passed the Oregon House this afternoon. Oh, cool. Really? Yep. Out of the Senate. Uh, I'm sorry, Chris, which bill? One, not to, not to throw too much cold water on that, but one, <laughs> one, <laughs> one caution about that is that, um, as we understand it currently, the bill is focused on single family inclusionary zoning and doesn't uh, no, entirely. It's, it's focused on for, for, sale, sale, yeah. for sale and not rent, rental. Right. So there, there's a whole separate piece of Oregon statute that deals with rent control. And so how we deal with inclusionary housing, it, if that bill passes, we have more tools on buildings that are proposed for sale and condos and single family homes and projects. Um, but if it's a rental project, we still have our state restrictions in place. Yeah, great. 
Because that's rent control, not inclusionary zoning. So, and there's, yeah. a, there's a legal distinction, legal apparently. Distinction. Yes. So. <laughs> so I think we're good. OK, so um, now we're going to transition um, back to Deborah on some of the residential pieces. And then um, if you can save me 10 minutes at the end to yes. update you on next steps. We're going to refer to a memo called Residential Densities Up Designations, April 14th. So it's one of the new memos you received uh, last week. And Marty Stockton is going to give this presentation. So are, are, we, are we ready? <laughs> yep. I know that you've been powering through this afternoon. So um, good afternoon. My name is Marty Stockton, and I'm the Southeast District Liaison. And I'm going to be um, giving the presentation on Residential Densities Part 3. Oops. So. Um, with this, through the comprehensive plan mapping process, um, the question we are trying to answer in collaboration with the committee or the community is what's the appropriate residential density um, considering each area? And then we have this list. And there's a few things that I would like to focus on this that describes the methodology that staff undertook to look at up designations. And just to clarify, this particular presentation is on up designations. So some of the things that we looked at, so the first bullet, um, land use patterns and density, we did look um, specifically at uh, the existing density within um, a particular area. We also looked at land use patterns, and specifically we were looking at areas that had a clustering of lots that were under 3,000 square feet. Um, the af housing affordability is a piece that I've heard a lot about today, and I would like to focus on kind of what we looked at within our methodology related to housing affordability, um, specifically in collaboration with contacts at Reach Community Development in Home Forward, as well as looking at um, the uh, Portland Community Reinvestment Initiative. Thank you. Um, we did do um, kind of like a fine combed look for those particular properties. And I was very, very excited to find that within inner Southeast Portland, um, REACH Community Development does have 60 scattered sites, which is pretty phenomenal. And as far as all the, the, the conversation around land baking um, today, I, I, I think it's pretty phenomenal that we do have a community um, development group that does have, they have land banked 60 scattered sites in inner southeast. So that was one thing that we um, discovered through this process. Um, regarding the historic and cultural resources, um, specifically we did identify the um, local historic landmarks as well as um, properties that were on the historic resource inventory. I think it was just really important to understand where those properties were located, as well as regarding kind of the historic, um, just the history of the area, um, whether the history was incorporated within the neighborhood plans or through conversations with longtime um, residents within the area. And then, of course, um, related to kind of our policy direction around sustainability and resilience criteria, access to transit. And so again, today you talked um, quite a lot about um, opportunity rich areas and so that is one of the reasons why we're focusing on inner southeast and, and access to services so in today's agenda you know we are focusing on um, up designations and to be clear this is the non-conforming um, focus of our residential densities so um, we did focus on non-conforming um, uses within um, commercial properties. And we spent a you know, 
several work sessions talking about that. Um, today we are talking about non-conforming residential density and non-conforming residential development. So um, essentially what is built today. Um, and then I do want to respond um, to the testimony that we received. So why focus on inner Southeast Portland? Um, so again, I think uh, you know, some of that is what I've touched upon earlier. Um, but we do have um, quite a bit of clustering of the, the non-conforming residential densities and development in inner Southeast. Um, in Buckman, for example, um, you know, Buckman is a neighborhood that has a number of duplexes, triplexes, and apartment complexes that I would say work really well with um, the existing single dwelling development. And so there really is kind of a rich mix within Buckman as well as Kearns and Sunnyside and a bit in Hosford Abernathy. Um, to give a little bit of kind of historical context, a decision was made in the 1980 um, comp plan to actually apply R5, which is a single dwelling zone, to kind of a broad swath within um, Buckman and in and, and, and Sunnyside neighborhoods as well. And that was really a response to um, a lot of the development that occurred in the 1960s and 70s. Um, a lot of inner Southeast was zoned at the time A1 and A2, which is kind of an apartment one and apartment two zoning that we no longer have. And in 1980, there was, I would say, kind of a, a swing um, back to kind of counter um, some of the frustrations with that development that occurred in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, I, th I think another point to raise, just talking about kind of the history, is that once the 1980 comp plan occurred, um, the Planning Bureau um, proceeded to do a series of community um, area plans. So for example, the Albina Community Plan, the Outer Southeast Community Plan, the Southwest Community Plan. Um, starting in the 90s, um, Inner Southeast was getting ready to have its Eastern or East Portland Community Plan, which never occurred. Um, these neighborhoods did receive neighborhood plans, but that the, all those neighborhood plans were supposed to go into and inform a, a East um, Portland community plan, which did not happen. Did not happen, and um, I don't know if you want to speak to some of that history, Deborah. But I guess my understanding of it was it was um, somewhat tied to some budget cuts um, related to ballot measure forty seven. Um, a, a property tax limitation. So um, that's a little bit of the history. I also know that um, there were definitely some political wins and um, at play as well. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> okay. And I would just add that as a result, it's the one that's the largest part of the city that has not undergone any comprehensive planning where we've taken a new look at the zoning and land use. So while we had revisited zoning pretty much elsewhere, m most other portions of the city, this is the one place where there's been no either cleaning up of old residual zoning patterns or you know updating it to reflect current conditions. Mm -hmm. So I think. <laughs> so I'd like to spend a little bit of time reiterating what you've heard regarding um, the inner ring neighborhoods concept that. Um, Eric Engstrom has um, discussed within this centers and quarters growth strategy. And this is something that I have to say that I'm, I'm pretty darn excited about. Um, so the inner ring districts are... <laughs> did, did Marty just use the word darn? Yeah. Yeah, all right, Marty, yeah, there you go. Um, so again, these are areas, as you can see, and I'm going to try to use the... So Commissioner Hansen, I don't want to get you with the pointer here. So these are um, you know, high, high opportunity areas um, per our proposed housing policy. Um, growth in these areas supports reduced vehicle miles traveled um, due to proximity to the central city um, and to local services. This area is, these areas, excuse me, are cr incredibly well served by transit, commercial services, 
within a quarter mile walk for most people and a three mile easy biking distance to the central city. Um, and these areas you know, do um, kind of encompass the Elliott area, um, Irvington, Kearns, Buckman, South Portland, Goose Hollow, et cetera. Um, there's a, a wonderful diversity of existing housing, historic homes and apartment buildings intermixed. I think this is a positive thing. Um, high concentration of historic resources and districts, for example, Lair Hill, the Alphabet District, Irvington, Laz Edition, et cetera. And then a history of, um, as well of, of demolition and post-war war era, so freeway development, urban renewal, surface parking lots, which interrupted or created gaps in the urban historic form in street grid. So we definitely have that history within, um, within planning as well. So I'm gonna um, now kind of transition where I'm talking about the specific areas um, that were discussed in the staff report. And um, I'd like to start with Buckman, um, and there's actually uh, three um, areas in Buckman, but this is the area that did receive um, the most testimony in, I would say, concern or in opposition, as well as balanced with testimony that was so favorable that they wanted to be added to the proposed um, the proposed map change area. So this is an area where um, you, know, it, you can see the existing zoning is R5, which is, uh, again, a single dwelling residential zone. The proposal is a very conservative proposal. And it's a proposal to go to R2.5, which is also a single dwelling zone. And I really want to emphasize that. This area could easily be proposed to be R2, which is a multi-dwelling zone. But I do feel like the changes that we propose have to be temporal, tem temporal and they have to be sensitive. And so again, this is a very, very conservative approach. Um, so within the revised proposal, so the initial proposal in July was these two half blocks, this block, this block, and this block. And my proposal is to include this block, this block, and then one, two, three, four additional properties. And this is based on testimony and support to be included in the R2.5. Um, so within the revised proposal, um, I want to um, just elaborate that 80% of the non-conforming properties would become conforming. Another 20% of the multi-dwelling housing that um, exists in this area would be closer to conformance. And the area proposed for the R2.5, so again, that's the yellow on the map, um, there are 60 lots. 27 of them are under the minimum lot size for R5. They are not R5 lots, they are R2.5 lots. 13 lots have duplexes. This is an allowed density in the R2.5 zone. It is not an allowed density in the R5 zone. Nine of the lots have multi-dwellings. The remaining 15, so I want to emphasize that, 15 lots within the 60 are R5. The remaining 15, many of them are on corner lots. So what that means is corner lots under the R5 zone can already be, um, they have the, um, the density provision where they can become duplexes and they can be divided to have attached housing. So about half of the 15 are on corner lots. So some other things to consider are that there, um, one lot is a historic landmark, four lots are on the historic resource inventory, and three lots are owned by REACH Community Development. I'm gonna point those out. So it's, sorry, I'm really shaky hand because I'm nervous. So, <laughs> so. Yes, I'm trying. <laughs> so, so let me, so Alder in 19th on the half block that's proposed to go to R2.5, the two interior lots are REACH community development lots. And so those are lots that one, or both of them are um, built with lovely um, Victorian housing stock. And if they go to the R2.5, they could be converted into duplexes Plus, they could also build accessory dwelling units. So what a wonderful opportunity to create housing. 
Um, so just to emphasize that. So this blue area on the map uh, <laughs> is proposed to go to R1. And it, again, the existing zoning is R5. So this is an area that is proposed to go to multi-dwelling. It um, has a 10-plex at the, um, right there along Stark in 19th, that is owned by Home Forward. So again, a 10-plex in an R5 zone owned by Home Forward, non-conforming. The, um, the middle lot is a duplex. And then the, the lot that is on the corner is a fourplex. The fourplex happens to be on the historic resource inventory. All of these lots um, are R1 properties. So, but they are um, currently zoned R5. So that is the proposal. Um, I do want to emphasize um, the testimony that we did here. Um, the Buckman Community Association did not um, make a formal statement. They did not vote on this particular um, proposal, but they did hear um, a bit of concern from property owners. And I do want to um, just read a little bit of that testimony from the co-chair um, that was submitted and that you may have read as well. The R5 designation was hard fought in the years of massive demolitions and open turn of the century homes buildings allowed in the area for development of track apartments in the 60s and 70s, which I referred to earlier. Um, there's an, a desire to maintain options for families for home ownership in a neighborhood with over 80% um, rentals is, cr is critical to supporting the schools, the parks, and stabilizing the community. Um, she goes on to say that, you know, much of residential Buckman is already zoned R2.5 and R1, um, and that uh, just there is a request to, for the planning staff to, you know, really relook at the proposals um, because of this historical and cultural reasons. So I just, I do want to emphasize um, that the testimony that was shared. Um, one property owner, um, was very concerned about this proposal. Um, she has a historic resource inventory property um, there at, at 19th and Alder um, on the corner. And she was concerned that this proposal would force a, um, a subdivision of her property. Um, and that's where I think some education would be really helpful because a corner lot could be subdivided under an R5 zone already. So. Um, and then, again, uh, also, I, I would say, and conversely, another property owner that has a historic res resource inventory property wanted to be included in the proposal. And um, she uh, spent time actually canvassing the neighborhood and, and provided a hand-drawn map of what she felt the, um, the, the zoning should be um, and, and uh, I would say that the yellow and the blue colored the map. And I, again, she wanted um, more flexibility to have units within her property. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the next one. Yeah. Do you think if it, if it goes R2.5, Marty, does it still foster home ownership type housing opportunities? Absolutely. Um, R2.5 is a wonderful, um, uh, um, it's a single dwelling residential zone. It allows attached and detached homes. I think my concern is if this stays R5, regardless, regardless if we change the zoning or not, demolitions can occur. Yeah. And so do we want to encourage and maintain and preserve density that is there today? Or do we want this area to transition to less dense um, in, in a very opportunity rich area? Oh, I sorry, I really have to talk about these photos really quickly. So this right here is the Home Forward property, the Templex. These two properties right here are on the historic resource inventory. They are duplexes. Both of these properties are on lots under 3,000 square feet, which is just remarkable. And then these properties right here 
are all on lots that are under 2,000 square feet. And they are, they are right there. So you can see them in the lotting pattern. So really wonderful mix in this area, special area. Okay, so moving on, um, we're, we're actually heading east, still in Buckman. Um, we are along the um, Ankeny Ash Corridor. Remember, Ankeny is one of our very popular bikeways in the city. And we are focusing on the intersections of 22nd, 24th, and 26th. All of these areas um, were not on the July proposal, but were requested through testimony that we consider some map changes. Um, on the bottom photo right here, um, we have properties that are proposed to go to R1 um, through, you know, based um, in response to the testimony. Um, this right here is a property that is owned by PCRI. So again, you know, in my scans of um, we're, we're doing map changes, I feel like these are just gifts when I come across these properties. So um, again, this particular is right here on 22nd. So the zoning is R2.5. Again, that's a single dwelling zone. And so the proposal is to go to R1 to match the um, existing um, development and density type. So those are like eight or 12 bucks a piece of real estate? Uh, this is like 15. Oh, wow. Um, this picture right here is a lovely courtyard apartment, which is located right here on 24th. And then there is a lovely property that has um, kind of a, it, frankly, it's a, it's a, um, a 1940s one of, uh, and I, I'm probably pronouncing that incorrectly, but it's, it's really wonderful. Um, and then this property right here is, um, this is a Weston property, Joe Weston, um, and it actually spans this whole half block right here. Um, I'm sorry, right here, along 26. So again, these are all properties that came in through, um, th through testimony, and we are responding to the testimony. So this one, it, no, this is a Weston property, no. Joe Weston. So this was another area that we spent quite a bit of time focusing on. This was in the July proposal as well. Um, and the July proposal was, I would say, very conservative and very delicate. And initially it was proposing an area that has existing zoning. And let me just orientate you here. So this is Stark Street right here. And then Belmont is here. This is the Loam First Cemetery. Um, this is 26th and this is 30th, okay? Um, uh, let's see, Starkey's is right there for those folks that know where Starkey's is. Um, so this is an area that we had proposed, you know, it's the zoning as R2.5, R5, and R2.5. And we had proposed for, um, you know, much of this area to go to R2 um, and then some tweaks um, after receiving the testimony and doing quite a bit of analysis, we're revising the proposal. Um, I'm gonna kind of go back to the testimony. The testimony um, we received was primarily from property owners of the 10 apartment complexes that have anywhere from 18 to over 30 units in this area. And so we do have 10 very large um, apartment complexes that are non-conforming. And so, you know, very, very thoughtful testimony included in the staff report, um, excerpt in the staff report, but just a desire to be acknowledged in, in especially in such an opportunity rich area. Um, so the proposal is for the dark blue to go to the R1 multi-dwelling zone here and then here. And then the area in the lighter blue is proposed to go to R2. So again, we are shifting significantly from a single dwelling, R2.5 and R5, to a multi-dwelling, R2 and R1. And this is based on 
not only the testimony, but also a very, very detailed unit count. Um, interestingly enough, um, uh, the, we do have um, some, um, we do have, I think, one um, REACH community development scattered site in this area, and then we do have a historic landmark that I'm pointing to right there, quite a, a lovely property, and they have that property in this property. Um, so they, they do have the preserve, um, I would say the protection under the historic landmark status. Um, and really quickly, to, um, to be able to take a property off a, in a, a, the local historic landmark, you would have to go through what's called a, um, a basically, a, a, I'm forgetting the term, but it's a, a level four land use review which means that you're paying about eight to nine thousand dollars, and you have to go directly to city council to request that you can have that property removed from the local landmark list to to do a, a demo or whatever. So um, it's a very very high threshold. So good level of protection there. So that's the distinction between being on the inventory and being on the landmark. Because yeah, inventory, it's a, you can just ask to be taken off. It's, it's a, a very very important delisting. That the term? I don't, I don't know what the term is. I, I just yeah. made it up. <laughs> you too? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've been delisted. Yeah. Have you? Yeah. <laughs> so this is just the, and it's actually that property right there, which is the historic landmark. Just, again, just a lovely property as you're going down the hill. Um, these are examples. This is a 24 unit. This is a five unit. Um, this right here is an 18 unit. This is called um, the dog, it's D-A-W-G. And anyway, it's a place for um, communal living with people with dogs. It's really wonderful. <laughs> could, you, could you repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> it's a what? Uh, it's, it's, uh, you, can, uh, you can kind of see the title. It's dog, and I, I, I don't know if it's dog so plaza. It's a dog or thing. It's a dog, love yeah. dogs go here? It's really here? wonderful, yeah. Okay, great. So we're moving um, into Richmond now. So um, this area is along um, Cesaria Chavez right here. And then this is Woodward, and this is Brooklyn. And so the proposal, we have an existing zoning of R5, um, and the proposal is to go to R2.5. So again, a very delicate um, up zoning. We do have, this is a garden apartment right here, and then there's another garden apartment over here. Um, so there could be some rationale to have this area go to an R2 multi-dwelling zone. I think an R2.5 is a, is a nice, gentle approach. There are a series of, this is probably one of the most concentrated areas of duplexes I've seen. These are really, really lovely examples of duplexes. This is on the, um, the northeast corner of Brooklyn and Chavez, right here. There's, you know, the two um, doors right there. This is on. This is right across the street. This is a duplex. This is a duplex. This is a duplex. Really, really wonderful examples of what a quality R2.5 can look like. Okay, still in Richmond. Uh, just heading south of down Chavez, just north of Powell. Excuse me. So this is um, an example of this particular site right here. Um, this is uh, also something that came to our attention in testimony. It's a split zoned site, so it's R1 with an R2.5 comp plan and R5 zone. This property right ha here has 31 units. We have a house that's right on the corner that you can see. You're probably very familiar with it when you drive up Chavez. And then from the aerial photo, so that's the house, you'll see one, two, three. Each one of those apartment buildings contains 10 units. So this is a perfect R1 um, proposal. Okay, now we're moving, we're, we're headed back north to Sunnyside area. So this is a, another um, example of um, testimony that we received in, in our response to it. 
So the testimony requested that this area be looked at for an up designation um, to reflect the existing development. Um, I think the testimony was actually proposing, um, I believe, an RH zone. And this is where I would say that this is where I put my equity hat on, is that I don't want to um, promote speculation and redevelopment. And that I think that you know, having a zone that matches the development is really important, um, but I, I don't want to encourage um, redevelopment or displacement. So Peacock Lane, this is a sixplex that's right on the corner, lovely Mediterranean. This right here is um, our proposal is to go to R1 along Belmont. So let, I'm sorry, let me, re let, let me orient you. Chavez, Chavez is over here. This is Stark, this is Belmont, Peacock Lane, and then we're looking at the area kind of between, you know, roughly about 40th to 42nd in here. So the CN1 is where the piano shop is? It is. Okay. Oh, yeah. So the proposal is for this, these two parcels to go to R1, so it matches the zoning across the street on Belmont. Um, What's really interesting about the existing density in here is that it actually exceeds the R2, and the lighter blue is the R2 that's proposed, but it's, it's well under the R1 density that's allowed. And the reason for that is that this is just an incredibly large site, and so the, the, the difference between an R2 and an R1 on a large site is, is pretty significant, but my rationale for the R2 here is that you could achieve the existing density if you did amenity bonuses. And so that is my delicate way of, of doing an R2 proposal and then the R1 um, along Belmont. And again, this is the, the, the product that is uh, the homes that are along uh, Belmont. And then this Piece. This is another um, Weston property, and this is the the you know the appearance of it. Really, um, you know, nice courtyard, and I, I just think this is so appropriate for Sunnyside. Okay. <laughs> okay. So this is another proposal that came in through testimony. So again, still on Chavez. Um, this is Fred Meyer right here. Up here, this is um, where the Belmont Library is, and that's an, an, another item that's on your consent list for uh, non-conforming commercial use for the a community service um, use for the library. So this parcel right here is the June Manor. So this was um, uh, was an apartment building that had recently, within the past ten years, has converted into condos, and then um, and then we have some kind of garden apartments right here. So this is just um, acknowledging um, this development on one of our civic corridors. Um, a, a question that kind of came up in staff's conversation is why not um, just have us all go to R1? And that's not the intent of these map proposals. Um, I, I do feel that the intent is really to match what's on the ground if we were going to do really more R1 proposal, that would require a lot of community conversation and uh, discussion around displacement as well. Okay, so these are ones that we had on the July proposal that we didn't receive testimony on, but I just, I just feel so compelled to share them with you. So, this property right here, which is in the Creston Kenilworth neighborhood, this is Powell Boulevard right here. Um, this is the property from an aerial photo. Um, the reason why it came to my attention is that in 2006, there was a public registry where the property owner um, wanted to, um, through a non-conforming situation review, he wanted to acknowledge the, the units um, on the site. And through building records, we could, we could only acknowledge that there were 33 units um, that were documented on the site. 
we know through our investigation that there's about double the amount of units on the site. Um, also through just code compliance review, we have a lot of housing compliance and code compliance. This is an opportunity where just to, to have the existing development match the zoning as a way to address some of those life safety building code issues that can't be addressed right now. Um, this. <laughs> How did they double the, the unit count? Did it just happen? This, this product. Was there a counter? You know, I don't know. This, this development was probably built in the, the 50s. Okay, could have happened. So, um, especially on the east side. <laughs> um, just to understand, getting them in compliance, or get, making a zone change will allow BDS to do compliance better with life and safety. Is that? So, I don't want to speak for a sister bureaus. That's okay. <laughs> I don't think it would trip them. I, I mean, it, it helps them. I, I just want to understand mm -hmm. that. What you're saying is that there's a, because of the non-conforming use today. So non-conforming means legal. It means yeah. documented. So when you have undocumented units, essentially what the city could do is they could say, take those units out. And so you're, you're essentially displacing 30 families, 30 households on the site. The city doesn't make the habit of doing that. Um, well, plus, this, do you collect taxes for 66 units or 33? Probably 66. But it's appraised. <laughs> so it, it's going to help them. The status also could be an impediment to getting Probably any 66. financing to invest further to do improvements. So okay. it becomes a, a you know, impediment to doing okay. any kind of um, upgrades because oh, yeah. if you can't yeah, finance it, you let it just be substandard so, and remain substandard. Mm -hmm. I kind of interrupted you. Is your intent to bring the underlying zoning in compliance with the number of units? Okay, great. Okay. Sorry. Right. Okay. And, there's, and there's also... There's also a rationale too. I mean, this is the you know the Powell, Powell Boulevard. You know, there currently is um, a um, transit and development project. So really, this is with understanding that there potentially is going to be further map changes once the station areas are identified. But this is just to acknowledge um, whether or not this falls in a station area or not that these, these homes and these families do live here and, and they have a right to live in a, a safe um, structure. Um, this property right here is, this is Holgate, this is Chavez. It's kind of around 36th Place and Mall. And it's, again, um, this right here is zoned R2.5. So again, single family detached. The proposal in the July proposal is to, for it to go to R1 to acknowledge the density on site. And this was a lovely, um, just a Google Maps um, kind of snapshot into um, children playing within the, within the apartment complex. Okay. So to wrap up and move into um, discussion, uh, you know, I, I guess, the question you know that we have is that do you um, support staff's general approach to up designation to match the existing density in um, non-conforming residential development? Um, you know, no noting that there has been concern um, in the testimony, specifically testimony um, from Buckman uh, Buckman residents. Um, do you have any modifications and? Um, do you have a, a need to hold any of these over for further discussion? Comments, questions? Don? Uh, you know, I know all these sites. I know that, that neighborhood really well. I think what you've done, Marty, is really a good sensitive approach to zoning that matches that good housing stock on the east side, diverse housing stock. And I'm in favor of what you're proposing. Do you have to check those boxes or you know, <laughs> just say that? Okay. I second that. Yeah, good on the details specific, too. Specifically, your project that you proposed.
Other comments? Yeah, I think, oh, go ahead, yes. Michelle. I am supportive, but I am curious about how fixing this is gonna fix the, six, the mystery 66 mm -hmm. units. Mm -hmm. So I'd just like to hear back about. Yeah, I wonder, you know, it's interesting. I wonder how many electrical meters they have out there. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of wires. <laughs> oh, they're doubled up? Yeah. I want to know when you took this photo. They were all blue. It was one like <laughs> one photo where there was these sort of clouds. And it was like, yeah, it was blue. Yeah. Was like, well, I have to thank technology and Google Maps. <laughs> Google. Google Maps. Google yeah. Yeah. I, go ahead, Howard. Um, I support it as well. And I just want to add uh, my personal uh, 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 joy, I guess the word. <laughs> My personal uh, approval of the fact that you reached out to the community and made a real effort to make the people know what's going on and heard their comments one way or the other. So it's well done. Chris, Teresa? So I can't, uh, can't fault the logic. You've obviously been, been very, very considered in making this recommendation. I guess I want to up-level it and ask the, the question that we raised a little bit with Eastmoreland. You know, we're down zoning in some areas and we're up zoning in others. I, I understand that the general intent is to match the actual lot pattern. Uh, I'm still curious if we are, um, if you look at the demographics of the areas that we're affecting, are we, could anybody find a, a pattern where we're favoring one socioeconomic group and putting a burden on another socioeconomic group? Have we looked at that across all these projects to make sure that we're being equitable about this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have been taking that into account. I think it's very important to us. Every time we look at a situation, we always ask ourselves, where is the situation occurring elsewhere and what are the common mm -hmm. factors and what, what's different? So we are trying to, to keep that in mind throughout. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah Chris, I'm glad you brought that up and I agree with the, the, the sentiment. I think this one's a good model that, that we have looked at it. In our prior discussion about East Moreland, we haven't looked at it. And, and I, I, I was thinking of design character more than anything when I said, hey, let's, let's zone it differently. Uh, but after hearing the comments from my fellow commissioners, I want to reconsider that in further conversations. I just wanted to oops, compliment you on the work because it's nice that you took a look at the sites and made some decisions that were site specific. And so that one size doesn't fit all rule, I think worked very well here. So good job. I would say good job. Um, I, I mean, it was excellent um, to take, just mimic what everybody said. Um, the background work was evident as your comments about, you know, consideration of the surrounding neighborhood, of affordability, of the residents that are there and future residents and the neighborhood. So thank you. I, I think we're in agreement. <laughs> well, we're darned excited about it. <laughs> looks good, Marty. Yeah. Looks good. Yeah, it's good work. Yeah. Work. I, I didn't mean to be kind of glib there, but um, something we've done year after year is propose to council that we need to have our district planners. And this is an example of when the district planners really make a difference. They understand the neighborhood, they know the people there, they go to the neighborhood meetings, they know the land use chairs. There's enough rapport there that they can really have a conversation because it's not their first conversation they've ever had with them. And I think that makes a huge difference. So um, yeah. we're seeing the payoff, I think, oh, yeah. in, in the comp plan by having those people on the ground. It's a very constructive approach. Yep. I also want to um, acknowledge that um, inner southeast in particular, I think this was described at the beginning, Deborah, that um, it's a whole quadrant of town that skipped over the community planning process. And, and so it's, it, you know, Marty could have kept going with this kind of analysis for another 20 months and uncovered a lot more. We picked the low-hanging fruit in terms of, of identifying the, the biggest areas where there's this disconnect between zoning and the existing character. Um, there's a lot more ongoing work, in particularly in inner southeast, to just yeah. slowly improve the accuracy of the zoning 
map and 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 you know Marty did not take on larger conversations about what should it be in the future, which is still mm -hmm. remains to be uh, we still have to have that discussion in in inner southeast as well we've you know we've we've proposed some broader policies about um, encouraging development in opportunity rich areas and that conversation needs to continue to happen in southeast portland um, in particular um, because again it, it skipped that community planning mm -hmm. process right. of the last few decades and just to add to that there is a paragraph in the staff report that notes or that answers the question why didn't we go further and look for other opportunities to up designate not to just match what's there but to actually create new housing opportunity in opportunity rich areas and we do say here that we think there are some, some additional opportunities, but to do that well, we would really need to do a more focused area plan where we can have more kind of localized community engagement, and really look at, at who's involved, who's potentially affected, and it's a level of engagement that we weren't able to do while working on a citywide comp plan. So we're not overlooking those opportunities, but we wanna save those for where we can kind of zoom in and look at at it more detail area by area. And the th kinds of things we would wanna do in concert with any upzoning beyond what's on the ground would be to look at um, you know, the potential for tenant displacement, which was something Marty was looking at, um, and any approaches for, for affordability to make sure that by, by increasing the capacity, we aren't um, creating unintended consequences of displacement or, or other effects on affordability. So. We'd like to have those tools available and that ability to look more closely. Yeah, somewhat buried in this memorandum on page four, it says staff recommends that residential den density be considered through area specific planning projects with localized and inclusive mm -hmm. community engagement. I would say that's the focus of this whole thing and mm -hmm. bring that up and, and make it a very important part of the memo, I think. <laughs> so uh, we're are we ready to transition into the next steps then? Um, so this is not the last. One uh, question before we do that. Are we talking about the consent list at all? or um, That's what I'll get into oh, okay. now. Um, so this is not the last um, work session. We still have um, a little bit more to go. There's um, immediately before you is um, the uh, EOA hearing on the 28th. Um, and that will inform... Uh, wrapping up some of the economic discussions. Um, we recently released um, one consent um, list which was focused on map topics. We're working on uh, one remaining consent list that is primarily policy-based that is um, uh, another collection of miscellaneous policy amendments that, that is a result of us reading the last few weeks of testimony before the record closed. Um, so things that came in after our previous staff reports, but with the final round of comments. Um, and so we'll be getting at least one more list to you in the next few weeks. No, and another map consent list like the one you have here, because... Hopefully smaller, though. It's smaller <laughs> than this. <laughs> um, what we... Yeah, um, I think it... I'm thinking it has something like 25 additional map changes. <laughs> so it's not as long as this. And we also will give you just, um, remember when we went through the non-conforming uses and we said we'd run all of the cases we had in front of us through that decision framework and show you the results of that. And we said we'd bring that back for you as well, just as kind of an FYI. So you'll be getting that as, yeah. as part of the next um, package. There's also, um, you know, we're keeping a running list of those things we that individual commissioners wanted more information on and we still have a dozen or so specific topics that um, we're going to address either through bringing it up in the last work session or through just a memo to you saying we discussed this with commissioner whoever and this is the resolution we came with and then that's sort of treated as a consent memo. Um, so what we're gonna do on um, May 12th is um, package, we'll probably give an update on the annotated agenda for that day soon but There'll be um, discussion of a number of different topics on that day, um, like today. Um, May 26th is currently scheduled for the um, scenario report hearing, which would be um, following up on our metrics that we set for ourselves in the Portland plan, whether or not this plan is, is um, helping us with greenhouse gas emissions or helping move mode split in the right direction or 
um, where do we stand with tree canopy or access to parks, um, variety of, of those measures. Um, so that will be um, kind of a big picture look. Um, the final vote um, provided that through that sequence we address and, and, and deal with things. Um, you asked earlier whether when we're going to talk about the consent items. And um, May 12th will be the first opportunity to um, identify those. And we'll have some portion of that agenda for that. Um, depending on what's left over, that may be carried on to some portion of May 26th in addition to the scenario report. Um, your final vote sequence, we're thinking of it in two stages. Um, one would be a, a um, cataloging of your individual additional amendments. And by that time, you'll also have the draft the language in front of you. So we will be um, sometime around May 13th, give or take a few days, we will publish um, for your benefit. It's not going to be a wide publication to the whole world with press releases and things, but it's it's a strike through and underline of the actual policy language that responds to all the direction you gave us from all these work sessions. Um, so you'll have some reading material in, in late May. Um, then we will go into um, an opportunity for you to make um, motions for your, your additional amendments, if you have any at that point. Um, and then, um, so there'll be one session that's focused on getting the amendments on the table mm -hmm. and resolving your individual unresolved issues. Um, and then there'll be the second overall vote in terms of whether you can accept the as amended plan. Um, and we'll go from there. And um, I'm being a little bit vague about the dates of the votes because it's going to depend on whether we need one or two or three additional work sessions to get through all the remaining small miscellaneous things and the consent list. If you know, if you look at the consent list and it all is really sensible to you and you have no questions, then it'll happen faster. If, if you need a session to work through that, those remaining consent lists, then, then it'll take longer. So that's, that's where we're at with kind of the, the wrap up. So the consent lists are really that. I mean, like this, if we have issues, we should probably get those to you before we, because the consent list is, I'm hoping we can say, we're all in favor except for item X, and we will pull that up. So we're only discussing the ones that people want to pull off, not the Yeah, board. so on May 12th, we'll give you an opportunity both for the one that we already just sent out and the additional one that we're going yeah. to send out, or the additional two, it sounds like, one map and one policy. But So on May 12th, you'll have probably three consent lists in front of you, and there'll be a, an opportunity for you mm -hmm. to identify um, things you need to talk about. And, and we may do through email, just let you know, uh, ask you to identify those things a few days before so that we can build a list and, and have a ordered discussion of it. I would hope we get those items to the staff before we get here, because I'd like to the yeah. consent list just on the 12th. Um, yeah, before the 12th. Before the 12th uh, the right. consent so, list is just that. So the remaining so. lists from us should be to you within before the end of, it, of April. And then so okay. the, ideally, the, the week before, the Friday before your May 12th meeting, you could have finished telling us of the, anything you want to talk about. I'm also wondering if you have questions where you think maybe you don't agree, but you'd like to know more, because this is very abbreviated. I recognize <laughs> this is such shorthand. So if, you wanted to, if we wanted to set up another one of those staff work sessions where you can come in and we can show you slides, you know, you're not seeing the visuals here, you're not yeah, seeing yeah. the context. So I'd love to schedule, uh, based on your um, interest, whatever sessions you need to get into the map details in more depth, because that might help um, you determine whether you agree with staff's position or not. So those are turn. those would be informational sessions where we no can't quorum. have a yeah. quorum because it's yeah. not a decision making. Um, My concern I, is a little bit the opposite that, you know, other than a few places where I may have some specific knowledge, I don't really have the capacity to, to evaluate the consent list very well. And you know, if testimony hadn't closed, I'd be relying on the public to you know, put in a letter saying, no, you got that one wrong, but we don't have that opportunity anymore. So yeah. I guess for the public, the opportunity to do that now is at city council, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So all of you public folks listening out there, keep your lists and bring them to council with you. Oh, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Um, I also realized, and I'm sorry about this, there's no numbering. I thought there was a column on this consent list so you could refer to numbers. So sorry about that. We'll make sure next consent list has a numbering system so you can refer. 
We might be able to retroactively put numbers on that one. Yeah. So the consent lists will be, all the consent lists will be here after April 28th or before? On or about April 28th, you should have all the remaining consent lists from us. Okay. And then it's, at that point, it's just identifying what you want to talk about and us closing any other loops that we may have, uh, that you may have already identified. I know, um, two, just off the top of my head, I know that um, Commissioner Smith is still interested in a response from us on the open data and broadband. And um, there we didn't get to the topic of um, full block zoning that was brought mm -hmm. up. I can't remember if that was Commissioner Rudd or Schultz, but um, we do have um, information on that too. That we, so we're, we're still gonna be bringing back smaller memos and bits addressing those things. I vote that we vote on May 26th. You vote that way or you won't? We, we, I know we won't, but I'm just saying that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm gonna be gone for two weeks, in, like the first two weeks of June. So I'd say I'd let you know. I can Skype in. You can I'll Skype in. Very well. From the coast of Turkey. We have experience now. I know, I know, that's what I'm afraid of. <laughs> Brazil. No, gonna, that's where I'm gonna <laughs> Eric? So I think that's it, unless you have other questions of us. No, other questions? Yeah, that, um, and actually online, I'll mention just on that note, um, usually what happens along the same times as when you send something off to council is the CIC joins you again and makes some observations about um, how well the process went. So we are gonna be, at some point, around the time of your vote, there'll be another opportunity for the CIC to comment back on how we are with the process, and, I, and we'll talk offline about that. And, and yeah, we have um, Sarah Wright. Sarah Wright's in, gonna step in and really take on what Marty was doing. Yeah, and she's got a report that you'll be getting probably tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Last questions? No? All right, we're adjourned. Great. Thank Thanks. you. Good job. So, Susan. Eric, I have a policy question for you. Uh, I remember.